Hello. Hello and good morning. Uh, bonjour, everyone. Very warm welcome to Architects Council of Europe and European Association for Architectural Education joint conference, New European Bauhaus, Upskilling, Education and Practice. My name is uh, Dubravko Bacic. I am a member of the executive board of the Architects Council of Europe and I will be today's uh, Master of Ceremonies, the so-called Master of Ceremonies. Um, this conference has been co-organized by our two associations, uh, the ACE and EAA, with the financial support of the Creative Europe program and VELEX. We are here in, today in this beautiful lecture hall, the Victor Bourgeois Auditorium at the ULB Le Cambre Horta Faculty of Architecture at Place Flaget in Brussels, thanks to the kind support of the Belgian Order of Architects and the very warm hospitality offered to our two associations, our speakers and the audience by the Le Cambre Horta School of Architecture and its Dean, Professor Marcel Rabinovitz and her team. Also, I would like to use this opportunity to thank on behalf of both of our associations, the small but very effective ACE and EAA conference team which has worked tirelessly in order to prepare this conference. And they are Professors uh, Rachel Armstrong and Doug Botsen from Catholic University Leuven, Julie Deutschmann and Pierre Ob Obaitek from A Secretariat, and Celine Monbayou from the EAA Secretariat. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, there is approximately, I don't know, 70, 80 of us um, here today in the Torium. ACE delegates, uh, distinguished deans and representatives of European architecture schools, and also students and professors of the La Cambre Horta Faculty of Architecture. Other participants and, of course, our dear speakers. This is a public and uh, open access conference, so we are followed via live feed from the ACE website and via our YouTube channel. And I also welcome our online audience and we hope you will stay with us online throughout the entire day. We have a busy schedule ahead of us, so let me just give you a very brief introduction before I invite our first speaker. As you have seen from the program, we have invited a number of very distinguished speakers to discuss the topic of our conference, New European Bauhaus, Upskilling Education Profession. So what should we teach the students today? What should they learn in architecture schools? Which skills are relevant for architecture to contribute to sustainable, inclusive and beautiful environment? Not Everything can be learned in schools. Young and mid-career professionals will keep on growing and developing professionally through a lifelong learning process. Traditionally offered for the most part, again, by educational institutions and professional associations, research projects, dissemination, conferences, and of course in practice. So these are the questions we hope to address today. And I believe that there are no two more appropriate, more relevant associations than the ACE and EAAE to be asking these questions. But I'll stop here and our two presidents will explain why later. And now I invite our dear host, Professor Marcel Rabinovitz, um, Dean of the School, to address the audience. Thank you, Dubravko. Well, welcome to everyone. And I'm happy to see this wide audience here for this great conference. And I hope you're going to have a great day. And what better place is there than a school to talk about, you know, education and practice? What better place is there to make the link between all those various education practices and how they can relate in the real life. So I'm happy to welcome all the students that are here, all the deans and their representatives, and all the representatives of the board of the architects from the various countries that are here. And I hope you're gonna have a great day of exchange and that we're gonna be able to weave links and exchange about our practices to make this world better. Thank you so much.
Uh, thank you, Marcel. Um, and now I would like to invite our two presidents. Ruth first. Here you go. So first of all, also a warm welcome um, from my side to this uh, conference on upskilling education and practice. Uh, before I start, I know thanks have been already uh, distributed by uh, Dubravko, but uh, nevertheless, I also want to thank uh, the University Libre de Bruxelles, um, Marcel, thank you for having us here again. I think we are developing a quite nice relationship. We have been here with the European project, and tomorrow we will also be here with our General Assembly. So thank you for being uh, such a great host and having us in your house. I also want to thank the European Association of Architectural um, Education for this really perfect organization and contribution to this uh, conference. Oya, Doug, thank you for working so closely together uh, with the Architects' Council of Europe. And last, not, and last but not least, funding is also important. And at this point, I want to thank the European Commission throughout their Creative Europe um, program. We are co-funding uh, here uh, this event. Yes, thank you for that. And thank you also for the whole team. 2023 has been declared the European Years of Skills. With this year, the European Union aims to promote a mindset of reskilling and upskilling in order to boost the competitiveness of European companies and help them to release the full potential of the digital and green transition. This year complements and fits very well with the new European Bauhaus, a beautiful, sustainable, inclusive living environment can only be the result of the work of highly skilled architects and professionals in the construction sector. But we should also not forget our civil servants and policy makers who have the ability to articulate a vision of the desired quality for the outcomes of any giving planning and construction process. A generation of professionals, citizens, decision makers that adheres to new European Bauhaus values and is capable of achieving its ambitions have to be trained. As recently acknowledged by the Council of the European Union, architects, play a significant role in achieving a high-quality built environment and thereby contribute to the public interest and the common good. Architects provide intellectual services based on specific professional knowledge, skills and competence gained throughout a demanding initial academic training and enhance thereafter through continuous practical development. Life learn, lifelong learning is firmly ingrained in the architect's professional deontology, and continuing professional development is strongly encouraged by professional bodies. The issue that we will be addressing today are therefore highly topical and of utmost importance, both from a political point of view, but also for the profession itself. And therefore, I thank all the speakers who will present today. I thank Dubravko Bacic for being our master of ceremony. You will lead us through the day and through the agenda. And um, I wish everyone all the best for this conference. Thank you for your participation and thank you for your contribution. Lots of enjoyment and knowledge today. Thank you.
Thank you, Ruth, and now the president of our uh, European Association for Architectural Education, Professor Oya Atalai Frank. Oya, please. Well, also, on behalf of EAAE, warm welcome, and also a lot of heartfelt thanks to our host, um, to the organization committee, Ruth, our guest speakers, well, esteemed guests, dear colleagues, good morning also online. It's not easy to bring associations together, not ever the members. So I think this is a unique moment. It's the first time that ACE and EAE is organizing in this scale um, a joint venture. And I really hope that we will continue on this. It's not about having ambiguity, it's not about, um, you know, claiming certain fronts, education and professional practice always hang together. We know this. And I think it's very important that we talk about the issues we have on both sides, but also the chances and how we can act and react together. So European Association of Architectural Education is um, almost half century old. And the main purpose is to advance the quality of architectural education and research, and thus of the architecture in general and the culture of the built environment. Easily said, not easily made. We know this. So how to contribute to a meaningful way of education and empowerment of future generations of architects, designers, planners, as responsible and culturally engaged creative citizens is our agenda. It is our main goal purpose. Conventionally, architectural education is associated with universities and EAE stands for these institutions, but we know that education takes many shapes and happens in multitude of places and not all of them are institutional. We all experience throughout our engagement in professional career that there's no end to learning. We learn each day on the job. And each day we acquire information, process it, categorize it, reutilize it, store it for future knowledge usage. But educating ourselves is not only formal, informal, it's sometimes really accidental. So through the assimilation and absorption, it's not always a conscious act. When we talk about lifelong learning and continuing professional development, we found ourselves in a different territory. This is a planned, it's a targeted action. And I think it's very important under the conditions that we are going through and the speed of problems that we are facing that we really care about this. Upskilling education and practice, this is what we are going to discuss today. I assume in a very intense way. We will hear about best practices, we will get some inspiration and insights, and this is all for the sake of a better future for all of us. Well, with this in mind, I wish you all in a very interesting, very inspiring day, and we will look forward to continue our dialogue in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, oh yeah. Um, okay, uh, next on our agenda is a video message from Ms. Temis Christofido, uh, Director General for Education, Youth and Sports of the European Commission. Unfortunately, uh, Mrs. Christofido was not able to join us here today in person due to her heavy schedule. But we are very grateful to her and her team for preparing a video message for us to officially open the conference. So let's hear the message. Dear participants, I could not be there with you today, but I wanted to send my strongest support for your work and for this conference. As Walter Gropius wrote in the Bauhaus Manifesto, art itself cannot be taught, but craftsmanship can. 
and it is precisely the development of this craftsmanship that links the new European Bauhaus, the European Year of Skills, and the renewal of the built environment around us. Architects express themselves by designing and building livable spaces. Their creation is not complete until it is experienced. A town square is not complete without a community gathering around it. A school is not a learning space without learners. And so the measure of an architect's success, bringing people together, making people feel connected, sharing their lives, is also the measure of their craftsmanship in all its dimensions, a measure of their skill, building something welcoming, beautiful, and of course, fit for purpose. Naturally, architecture is one of the cornerstones of the European Commission's approach to sustainability. If we want to change the way we live, then we need to change the way we build. And that means changing, or better yet, broadening the skills we need. If, in 1919, Gropius wanted to bring monumental and decorative art together, today we want to add to your practice sustainability skills and the ability to cater not just to the physical, but also to the psychological needs of our communities. The European Year of Skills put this continuous work on developing one's craft center stage. It promotes a mindset of reskilling and upskilling and focuses on making sure there are plenty of examples from which we can all learn. Architecture is no exception. For example, the 2023 edition of the new European Bauhaus Prizes will include a specific strand on education and learning. We need to seek more sustainable, beautiful and inclusive ways of life through knowledge sharing and education. And we need to make sure these good examples feed into our practice, be it the architects or the civil servants practice. This is yet another step to support your craft, but by no means is it the first step. For over 20 years, we have supported the EU Prize for Contemporary Architecture the Means van der Rohe Award, to celebrate excellence in architectural works built across Europe. Since 2016, we have added to it the Young Talent Architecture Award to recognize promise as well as excellence. You will have a chance to see the award ceremony this year in La Biennale in Venice. Another important aspect of developing one's craft is of course, learning through mobility being exposed to different ways of life, different ways of organizing space. I'm proud to draw your attention to Creative Europe's new mobility action, Culture Moves Europe. Imagine doing a residency in an organization across our continent, learning from practitioners there and bringing that knowledge to your daily practice back home. I can only encourage you to participate. Rolling calls for individual mobility are open until the 31st of May, and the first call for residency hosts is open until the 15th of June. I have covered knowledge sharing, recognizing good examples and mobility, but these paths to a broader skill set could not be complete without community. And so I come back to this conference and to you all. The Architects Council of Europe and the European Association for Architectural Education are very important in this regard. Conferences like this one bring this community together and help steer our eyes to the future we must build. Not to mention the fact that your insight helps us in the European Commission to give you as much support as possible. We are very proud to support your activities, including today's conference under the Creative Euro program, our flagship program for the culture and creative sectors. Thank you for your commitment to a craft that brings us all together and to continuously improving it and thus improving the way we live. I wish you a very successful conference. Thank you. Thanks uh, to Mrs. Christophe Doe. Um, and now I would like to invite uh, Mrs. Ruth Reichstein, uh, Deputy Head of the IDEA. That stand, you will hear a lot of acronyms today. That stands for Inspire, Debate, Engage, and Accelerate Action. 
Um, she is an advisory board of the President of the European Commission, and Ruth will present the initiative on developing the NEB Academy. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would be very happy to have my slides on the screen as well, if possible. That would be... Yeah. Uh, good morning. I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, you will have a second speaker of the European Commission. I will not make it long that you can really get into your discussions, but uh, you also have a 3D presence then of uh, our institution. Um, I have been speaking already at quite some of your events and it's very nice as well to see some of you, as I just said, in 3D and not only in 2D on the screens, which is uh, our new normal life. And um, first of all, I also want to convey the greetings of the president um, who was invited to this conference, who could unfortunately not join because uh, uh, of uh, other traveling arrangements that he, she, um, she had already made. Um, but uh, she uh, really supports uh, this initiative, obviously, and um, because it fits so well into two of uh, her, the projects that are very dear to her heart. On the one hand, the European Bauhaus that, as you know, she launched personally, and at the same time, the European Year of Skills um, that has now also been formally confirmed and uh, can really kick off. So this conference is really a perfect combination, let's say. And I just want to give a very short talk, um, not in general on the new European Bauhaus, but uh, on uh, our new kit on the block, the new European Bauhaus Academy that is about to be shaped. Um, just because I would hope that then maybe during all your discussions that you are having today, you might also develop the one or the other um, ideas still <coughs> for our work on the academy that, um, that then um, hopefully uh, Ruth and colleagues can channel back to us. That would be really uh, super helpful. So <coughs> I just want to explain very briefly what this academy is and why we are looking into it. It has been launched um, at an event uh, last year in November when uh, we uh, were with the president in Helsinki as, uh, at the Wood into the Bauhaus conference um, together with uh, Finland, Sweden and um, Estonia. And, um, and uh, well, one, one reason in a way <laughs> that uh, we were thinking about this academy, you can see it on the picture in the background, it's that um, for the new European Bauhaus initiative from the start, it was important to also look into alternative building materials, not only wood, I mean in the Nordics you know that they are very much into this, but also other bio-based and nature-based materials. And there is still a lot of lack of knowledge and skills, but also uh, quite some um, prejudices that people you know, might think that these materials are less uh, like reliable, less stable, more fire, da endangered whatsoever. So that was um, one of the reasons. <laughs> and here you have the more, let's say, uh, structural reasons. And you know a lot of this, but um, when we started the new European Bauhaus, uh, and uh, you might remember that we had this co-design phase where we really invited everybody to participate and where also your organizations participated, it became very clear that the lack of skills is one of the main reasons that the transformation of the construction ecosystem um, might be a bit slower than uh, we would like to see it. And that is why this question of skills and education was one of the main topics of the new European Bauhaus. It's always a bit tricky for us on European level because, as you know, we have less direct competences there. And that's why we are now very happy that we can finally very concretely work on it in the NAP Academy. So as I said, we are really at the start of this initiative, uh, so is there is still room for input and ideas. Um, the idea is that we will have on and offline trainings um, to um, train mainly really people in the construction ecosystem. So actually architects, for example, are not our first target groups, where we obviously know that they are also still quite some work to do to promote the values and the principles of the new European Bauhaus. But we think that we should start, you know, rather directly in the sector where on the one hand, the people really need to implement the changes, so really the workers on the ground, let's say, but also 
at the same time the decision makers. So developers, be it public or private, so those people who do actually the procurement, who really do the tenders and who decide in the end if they want to, do, to build with concrete or with wood, if they want to involve um, the community in the building process or not. So these are, in a way, the two first target groups that we have identified. So this is not so much about academic learning, but it's really more about trainings for the people that are already working in the different areas of the sector. And um, also, as you see here, with a focus on SMEs um, as they are so um, represented or so dominant in the, in the construction sector. So, um, at the moment, <coughs> I'm sorry, I still, uh, with this weather, I'm struggling with a cold since weeks. Um, at the moment, we are about uh, to shape this academy, which is um, very much relying on the community again. Um, so we are actually having the commitment of the Nordic Bauhaus, which is one of our European Bauhaus lab projects, uh, to contribute massively to the academy. So um, this is, again, um, uh, carried by the three countries that were also in the conference. So they are actually at the moment looking into what they can do. They are to, they, they, on the one hand, they will develop a learning material. On the other hand, they are also um, looking into the opportunities to um, organize summer schools. So, for example, Estonia is very much into organizing a summer school already this year in the framework of the MAP Academy. And we have also um, one first university, the University of Primorska in Slovenia, who actually decided to already build with their own uh, resources a first hub of the European House Academy. And um, they are now busy with setting up the structures there um, and uh, hopefully will already start first trainings um, in um, autumn. At the same time, we are obviously working more on the fundamental structures. Um, we will have a very soon a survey to find out where actually the real problems are. So obviously we know already a lot, um, but we really want to have an additional reach out um, and also in different languages for the different member states, you know, that we really can say, okay, I don't know, in Malta, you know, to take uh, uh, um, one example, these are really the, the, the things that we should look at uh, in this country. And in Portugal it's different, and in Romania as well. So um, this is something that will be happening very soon. At the moment we already have a call open, which is more a kind of survey as well. Um, and this you can see here on the slide, so we really want to know what is out there already when it comes to materials and also uh, probable structures that we could integrate in the NAP Academy. So if um, you have either, you know, uh, online learning material on something that you think uh, would fit in the scope of the NAP Academy, or um, if you have an institution that you think would be a great hub um, as well, uh, to uh, host parts of the NAP Academy, then this is the call that you um, should participate in. Um, that uh, we know what is out there and that we can uh, then integrate. Uh, and as you can see, it's still open until next week somewhere. Uh, there was an info session earlier this week that can be watched back uh, on our website if needed. And at the same time, obviously, we are also looking into how we can support this academy financially. Money is uh, getting a more and more difficult issue also in the European budget, so it was not easy to find resources. But we have secured for now two million um, for the first phase of the academy. Um, uh, there is also, there will be also another call under Horizon Europe in the joint undertaking on bio-based materials, but that will come later this year. For now, there is a live call that is open um, since the day before yesterday. <laughs> um, and, um, and there it's really not only to tell us what is out there, but also to see um, uh, if people uh, are motivated to really set up parts of the NAP Academy. So um, also here um, you can uh, go back to the uh, website of the New European Bauhaus to get more details. Voilà, so that was a, a very short introduction. Um, I hope that I can stay until the coffee break, that uh, if you have questions, comments, uh, uh, or that you want to have a short chat, um, I can uh, still do that. And otherwise, obviously, I wish you a very, very 
good successful um, day and very good discussions and as I said very happy if you develop also the one or the other idea for our academy and then happy to get your feedback afterwards. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ruth. Okay, um, now it's uh, my great honor and uh, privilege to announce our first keynote speaker this morning, uh, Professor Ashraf Salama. Um, Ashraf is an academic, scholar, and uh, chair in architecture. He's professor of architecture and urbanism, urbanism and head of the Department of Architecture and the Built Environment at the University of Northumbria, Newcastle. He's also co-director of the UNESCO UIA Validation Council for Architectural Education. He has chaired and led three schools of architecture over the past 25 years. He has held numerous tenured and visiting teaching positions in Egypt, Germany, Italy, Malaysia, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Switzerland, and United Kingdom. He has published over 200 articles and chapters in international publications, including authoring and editing 17 books. If I go on, I might spend all of his speaking time, so I'll just stop here. But not before I, I also mention that Professor Salama is the UIA 2017 recipient of the Jean Shumi Prize for Excellence in Architectural Education and Criticism. Once again, Ashraf, uh, thank you very much for accepting our call, and please, the stage is yours. Uh, I'm just going to have to wait a second to open the, um, my laptop. Um, so uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you to the uh, Architects Council of Europe, uh, European Association of Architecture Education. Uh, it's really a great honor to be part of the conference. Um, and um, basically, I'm going to talk about architectural education, but I have a specific, uh, I would say, position in terms of how we look at architecture education in relation to practice. Um, just a second. Very good. Um, so the most important point is that this um, talk or presentation is centered on the idea that it's not about skills, it's about knowledge and skills. We always have this duality when we talk about architecture education uh, with a focus on skills. Uh, so the idea here is to look at architecture education in terms of integration of different types of knowledge and the associated skills that uh, we need to look at. Um, so the, the presentation is adopting this position. Um, and I will try to relate to a number of issues, but I will start with a very important statement made by um, one of the education consultant to the British government, uh, Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson. Uh, Ken Robinson, uh, I can see it here. Excellent. Okay, uh, Ken, Ken Robinson uh, argued that every country on earth is trying to reform education. And he was trying the overall education system, whether uh, pre-university or in university. Uh, and that's for two reasons. The first reason is economic, trying to educate future generations to deal with the economic circumstances of the 21st century. Uh, and the second, this cultural, trying to educate future generations to have a sense of cultural identity in the process of um, globalization. But where is the problem here? There, there is a challenge. Most education institutions and governments are trying to address future challenges by doing what they have done in the past. So that's the key. Uh, issue or the key uh, point to emphasize. Um, when we look at 
the, the current education uh, or the current university system, it was conceived and structured in the intellectual culture of the Enlightenment. So the university that we see today was established 250 years ago. Uh, whatever that is, in terms of structures, in terms of uh, um, uh, knowledge typologies and all of these issues, uh, or in the economic circumstances of the Industrial Revolution, uh, which uh, was another generation of universities uh, that took place at the beginning of the 20th century. So these problems or these challenges uh, tell us that we will not be in a position to solve or address the challenges of climate change and, and all, of, all kinds of problems or challenges that we encounter with what we have done in the past. Coupled with that, uh, to contextualize where we are at the moment, uh, at a global scale, we can see that there is a number of challenges uh, and there is a range globally um, transformations in the structure of contemporary societies, the rising needs of women, children, disabled, um, um, continuous crisis of housing and squatter settlements, affordable housing issues, uh, sustainable housing, the emergence of new building typologies that accommodate new types of users, the emergen, uh, uh, emergence of new types of clients, the global condition and the loss of, loss of identity, all of these are challenges that we are uh, witnessing. And one would wonder what is the role of the architects? Where, where are architects here and what they are doing exactly? And how uh, architectural education is preparing them to address these challenges? Displacement of communities as a result of natural disasters or wars or civic conflicts needs of post-industrial cities and how economic diversity and how they are looking for economic base post-industrial paradigm. All of these are problems and, and challenges and when we look also at the European scale, uh, there are many challenges facing uh, the built environments and all types of natural uh, and human induced uh, disasters ranging from floods, earthquakes, heat waves, technical and industrial risks, volcanic eruptions, and all of this was uh, consumed by the COVID condition. All of these are challenges. Uh, where are we as architects? Uh, and, and there are many examples of cities that were trying to overcome these challenges and were resilient enough to uh, work with these challenges. The question that one would raise at this point is these challenges tell us that there are many knowledge typologies that architects need and that architectural education needs to prepare them to address. So architects will not be in a position to address these challenges if the education is not preparing them to address them. And you can look at this diagram and you see the number of knowledge typologies trying to react to these challenges. But this diagram also is not exclusive. It's inclusive. We can keep adding knowledge typologies to the diagram based on the number of challenges and the contextual circumstances that we encounter. But these challenges also represent a hybrid condition. And a hybrid condition requires um, hybrid moods of thinking, hybrid moods uh, of acting, hybrid approaches of dealing with problems, which is basically transdisciplinary thinking. I'm not going to get into uh, the, the overall um, discussion about monodisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, and interdisciplinarity, but I would say that uh, architects cannot do it alone cannot do it in isolation from what is happening in other fields of inquiry or education or practice. Um, the key point I would relate to here in this uh, context is the COVID condition. When we look at the COVID condition and the implications of the condition, we see that the role of the architect was very, very little compared to roles of other disciplines. 
So we will not be able to solve these kind of problems in isolation from um, working and collaborating with other disciplines. Uh, we can see, for example, if we want to talk about urban dynamics, distancing measures, uh, emerging uh, living and working patterns, all of these require working with people from other disciplines, experts from other disciplines. So these are very uh, uh, critical uh, and as an example. Coupled with these challenges, and of course all of us talk about paradigmatic shifts and how we think about the built environment, um, and, and here I'm presenting two uh, paradigmatic shifts uh, about things versus relation between things, uh, the dynamics of the whole, how they can be understood based on the properties of the parts and all of this uh, discussion. But taking this as an example, when we look in the 60s, 70s and 80s, housing was treated in terms of uh, quantifiable attributes, size of dwellings, family needs, uh, number of people in the family only. These were the measures to address and discuss housing issues. Now we are discussing housing in terms of sustainability, in terms of affordability, uh, uh, in terms of relation, the relationship between people, process, and product. Uh, the second paradigm shift is about techno development versus uh, eco development, and this is really very important. The entire 20th century was centered on techno development. Technology was the driver. Now we are talking about eco development. So the same technology that has been used to conquer and subdue nature needs to be employed now for the benefit of nature. Um, as they relate to architecture education, these uh, um, uh, paradigm shifts, we can see also a third shift at the level of education, uh, which is basically a shift from the uh, systemic, uh, or sorry, uh, mechanistic pedagogy or mechanistic education to systemic education or pedagogy, um, where in the uh, mechanistic pedagogy, education is not treated as a whole, is not treated as part of a process, much of which takes place within society. It relies on showing mo uh, and telling modes of communication. Uh, it doesn't adopt interdisciplinary thinking. All of these aspects show that we really need to move forward with the systemic pedagogy. Um, which, all of these raise the question of what is the role of the architect and how architectural education can enhance emerging models and roles of architects. Uh, when we look at these uh, five roles, and maybe there are many more, but here we can look at the egoist, the pragmatist, the facilitator, the technical assistant giver, and the advocate. Uh, all of these are roles architects should be able to play, but the entire system over the past 200 years was focusing on the egoist, the pragmatist, and the technical assistant giver, but not focusing on the facilitator and the advocate. And look at these, uh, the attitudes that are uh, 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 embedded in these uh, role models. I give the people what I want, I give the people what they want, uh, and then I give the people what I can. This has been the case over the past 200 years. Now we really uh, want to go beyond that and look at the architect as facilitator to create a process that enable people to solve their own problems. Now everybody talks about co-design as if it's a new trend. Yes, it's a new trend. But we also need to know that started in the 60s, um, but has not evolved enough to be integrated as part of professional practice. Uh, the advocate, again, another role for the architect, where the role is to emphasize the interests of a specific group over the broader public interests. So architecture really keep uh, appropriating itself, trying to move between different knowledge typologies, but it's struggling, really. Uh, architecture as a discipline 
and the profession is struggling. Why? Because it involves many types of knowledge. We're not like physics. We're not like chemistry. So uh, where, where, where other disciplines these deal with specific types of knowledge. Here, we have a bit of art. We have a social uh, behavioral sciences. We have humanities and natural sciences and engineering. So we try to appropriate what we are doing. But the problem is, it gives us room also to escape. So when we encounter a problem, we keep saying, oh, no, no, we don't do this. Uh, another problem, no, we're, we're doing it from an art perspective. Uh, and all of these issues really uh, need to be looked at. We need to be able to integrate all of these knowledge typologies. We are currently operate, operating in architecture education based on three inherited models. Uh, all of us know them, the Beaux-Arts, the Bauhaus, uh, which were very well known uh, and documented in the history of architecture, the history of architecture education. But also there was another school in, in Eastern Europe, in Russia, Vikutimus, which was very similar to Bauhaus, but was less known uh, or publicized. So the three schools have really many issues despite the fact that for a hundred years they were so successful in addressing specific condition. Now, uh, the question is, are they equipped to meet the challenges that we were discussing? So uh, this is an invitation really to think about new models and new ideas uh, that promote um, um, a response uh, or an effective response to the challenges. Um, so when we look here, those schools, despite their achievements, uh, now they are not ready to meet the challenges that were presented earlier uh, in the presentation. Um, there has been a significant criticism to following the variations and the, the branches of these three schools that were adopted and adapted in different parts of the world. And of course, uh, some contextual elements were introduced to them depending on where they are, and they ended up with other models. Now, the, the, the question is, th there was heavy criticism against following uh, exclusively the schools, uh, which focus um, mainly on the talented and gifted architect, uh, seeing the architect as an individual maker of buildings, seeing the process of education as a form of experience transfer. That's it. So these were working historically. They uh, won't work with the nature of the challenges that we are currently seeing. Um, of course, we can talk forever about the criticism, and it's documented in books that started from the mid-60s, maybe to late 90s, um, and the, the classification of the criticism of following inherited models of architecture education is really very rich and can be classified in terms of teaching style, process, and content, and how these uh, don't work anymore. And of course, I can go through a list of, um, of critical statements made by important authors or made by uh, um, academics. Uh, an important element also is that as a result of following inherited models, uh, this is a new survey that, uh, not very new, a few years ago, that was conducted by a website called YouGov, uh, basically trying to see how the public perceive architecture and architects. Uh, the result is that the British public doesn't know what architects do, the majority, 60-70%, in different areas, and we can look uh, uh, at the list but as a result, we could say that society places low value on architects. Now, do we blame society or blame uh, professional organizations or blame architecture education? So it's the responsibility, I would say, is in the three areas uh, and requires some work, really. Uh, if 
Um, I just want to give an example, and I'm just improvising a little bit. I'll give an example. When we go to a dentist or a doctor, we never bargain with them as clients, do we? You never ask the dentist to reduce the cost of dentistry. Okay, but when you go and work with an architect, immediately you start to say, no, can I pay less as a client? Uh, and this is because architect, uh, the public doesn't understand actually what architects do and the value of what they do. Why? Because they don't see the process. They see the output. The public sees the output. They don't see the process. Now, I think it is about time that part of the design practice and part of the design discussion, yes, of course, the product will remain critical and important, but still, we need to start to look at the process and how to demonstrate it to the public using very simple and very um, public terms, not architecture terms. Uh, because once you talk with the public, with a lay person in the street about rhythm and harmony and all of this and using our hands to try to describe an idea and a concept, they end up collapsing. They avoid discussing that with architects. Why? Because we need to be able to speak their language. And speaking their, their language requires training. So it's part of the uh, uh, education of architects. Um, despite this, or in response to this criticism, there was loads of uh, academics and committed educators who were trying to uh, introduce new ideas, promote new ideals uh, of architecture education, trying to depart from the three inherited models, uh, whether through modes of communications or collaborative pedagogies or what we call in, in uh, um, uh, our writing, I would say, uh, resistant pedagogical typologies, trying to resist the dominant models. Um, and this was reflected and translated into many areas and many schools of architecture are now experiencing one or more of these forms, whether uh, design build, live build, community design projects, all of these are becoming part of the, gradually, collective psyche of architecture education and architecture educators. Uh, and these are some examples from studio projects from around the world. The integration of technology, the integration of VR, and how we can mix between the two uh, is really very uh, important. Um, forgot to move the slides. Uh, is really very important. Uh, Process-based pedagogy and how we try to emphasize the process, how, how we show uh, more level of detail, not just uh, limiting the design experience to concept formation. Okay, we need to go beyond this to prepare architects to really uh, be able to deal with the practical realities of the profession. Using collaborative learning, um, uh, design gaming as form of simulating what goes on in uh, practice. Active learning, which is another important area uh, that one uh, w would, would be keen to promote uh, to basically address the fact that the, um, the attention span of the average adult is eight minutes only. So, and, and we keep lecturing in, in lecture halls two hours. So we can imagine that after eight minutes from any lecture we deliver in a school of architecture, everybody is sleeping. So that's a very uh, uh, important thing to, to consider. Um, so how do we promote active learning in classrooms and in studios is really important. And this is not necessarily by delivering knowledge, but also by processing knowledge, allowing students to engage with experiences through instructional films, through real life experiences. We have tried to really address some of these uh, challenges and problems in um, a number of books and publications, all of them were trying to look at how do we 
go beyond those inherited models? How do we introduce new forms of, and seek new forms of pedagogy that enable us to meet the challenges? Uh, I would refer here just very, very quickly to three contributions, and they were trying to really look at the idea of uh, critical pedagogy, the idea of uh, design activism, the idea of uh, transformative pedagogy, and how these would really enable future architects to deal as intellectuals and as professionals uh, to deal with the realities of uh, the profession. Uh, I don't know where is my time. Okay. Uh, now, we have an opportunity, really. Uh, and that opportunity is that what got us here, which is the old powerhouse, uh, and got us here in many ways successfully, is not capable of taking us forward in terms of tools, ideologies, principles, and all of these uh, uh, aspects. So I, I would see that the new uh, European Bauhaus is an opportunity to integrate all these kinds of learning, whether uh, at a degree level or at um, um, continued professional development. Um, so the, the opportunity is there, given that the amount of challenges facing education, facing the built environment, and facing architectural education and the profession are endless. And these, are, these lists are based on discussions being undertaken at uh, the UIA, uh, some commissions within the UIA, uh, CAA, uh, Commonwealth of uh, Institute of Association of Architects. Architects. Uh, all of these are really uh, very important. And we can see in the list from climate change to affordable housing to corruption to urban sprawl, everything. Uh, so. Uh, uh, a whole range of ideas and that we need to be able to uh, deal with. So the opportunity is really to try to look at these uh, elements of pedagogy that enable us to unlearn what we have learned, okay, and try to look for new modes of learning. Learning, unlearning, and relearning are really important concepts that constitute that we're not stuck with what we've learned in the past. We can move forward with new tools and new knowledge and uh, new ideologies. Uh, through different modes that range from authentic learning to active learning, collaborative learning, all of these elements, which aim to contribute to the knowledge construction and knowledge production rather than knowledge consumption, relying on books and precedents. There are, of course, tools and techniques uh, that we uh, can relate to, uh, engaging with architecture education, creative, and sorry, architecture and engineering, and construction, and creative industries. And there are different forms. So what we are looking at now is a new form of an apprenticeship model. So if if the Bauhaus generated the apprenticeship model, the original apprenticeship model and about 100 years ago, 120 years ago. Now, we really need to look at new forms of apprenticeship models in the economic circumstances of the 21st century. And there are different uh, tools and techniques. Some schools are adopting these, establishing learning centers, engaging with practitioners, uh, um, uh, having practitioners as part of the uh, academic cohort and, and many other modes, but ultimately this will contribute to a better integration of education and uh, practice. Um, we will need to address this uh, in, in terms of generating an alternative system of architectural education that look at knowledge integration and transdisciplinarity or uh, cross-disciplinarity, both in thinking and in acting. Uh, these are very important. Uh, the reason we try to differentiate between thinking and acting, because we can learn that in school, transdisciplinary thinking is important, and read a book about anthropology or physics. 
Okay, but how this translates into an actual design process is really very important. So thinking and acting are really very important. The opportunity is there through the new European Bauhaus. Um, and all of these can be accommodated at different levels, whether integrating different types of knowledge in the classroom or in the studio, or um, uh, integrating these kind of uh, um, concepts and ideas at a degree level or at a knowledge delivery level. The purpose is basically to avoid the continuous split that takes place between academia and practice, between the intellectual and the vocational, between the um, theoretical and practical and so on. So these are really very important um, paradigms of thinking that we uh, hope to look at as we move forward. And this can be enabled by different modes of thinking, by different uh, or addressing different psychological types and modes of understanding as they relate to design. Uh, one of the most important things is that enabling architects and future uh, architecture educators to um, ask the right questions, uh, the right questions about achieving design goals, about uh, um, establishing uh, uh, and setting objectives, and creating better environments, and better for whom and why they are better. All of these critical questions are really important through these forms of pedagogy. One way of integrating this thinking is trying to look at how sustainable development goals can be integrated into uh, uh, a number of student assignments, how students can interrogate different aspects of the sustain, um, uh, 17 sustainable development goals in classes, look at the awarded projects and why they were awarded using the lens of sustainable development goals. And there are many examples that I can show and that uh, uh, I personally use in my classes trying to look at how projects can be analyzed addressing sustainable development goals. And these are some recent experiences. Um, the latest part, I just want to go very quickly uh, through the one of the recent efforts that try to translate this thinking uh, uh, into some form of activity and promotion uh, of these ideals as the UIA Award for Innovation in Architecture Education, uh, which tries to promote two uh, types of excellence, excellence in pedagogical practices and excellence in shaping sustainable futures. And uh, we give to participants, actually, different mechanisms to enable them to demonstrate excellence, how to demonstrate excellence, uh, what areas you need to focus on, and all of this. Uh, the award started in 2019. Uh, right now, we are in the second cycle. Uh, the first cycle was announced in Rio conference. The second cycle, uh, the, we have completed the jury, actually, of the second cycle last week. And the award relies heavily on two documents, the UNESCO Charter, UNESCO UIA Charter for Architecture Education, and the associated document of the validation manual. The um, documents generated by the um, Sustainable Development Goals Commission of the UIA, which basically trying to use this as uh, inspiration that participants can aspire to achieve by looking at these examples, giving the wealth of knowledge and the number of projects covering the entire world. Uh, the jury, really, uh, we try to select committed academics, committed educators to pedagogy, and at the same time to sustainable development goals. Um, and they engage with the assessment individually and then as part of a, a discussion. And these are some of the examples of projects. Um, this, this is one, for example, from um, Royal Danish Academy of Arts School of Architecture, designing an extreme environment, engaging effectively with the sustainable development goals. Uh, another example, trying to look at adaptations for forgotten and old uh, construction techniques and materials. 
uh, another one trying to look at sustainable development goals and rural communities and rural development in China, and then looking at sustainable development goals in terms of a structure, an entire structure of a curriculum, also from Tsinghua, China. The themes that were generated currently by the new um, uh, award include design activism, beyond sustainability, include designing with earth, include uh, sustainable community, include designing with nature and equality. And uh, I don't have the permission to use the projects as examples of the second cycle, so I did not include them, but I included the themes, so I can use them in a future presentation. I'll end with this slide. Trying to understand where we are at the moment cannot take place without knowing and interrogating what happened over the past 100 years and why we are here in terms of challenges, in terms of practices, in terms of split between education and academia uh, um, in one hand and professional practice in the other. So we really need to look at the scope of what happened over the past 100 years and the scope of opportunities that are created and that generated new thinking using the COVID-19 condition as uh, a, trigger, um, a triggering point to address these uh, problems, including transdisciplinarity, meeting the challenges, and so on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ashraf. Thank you very much. Um, well, let me just check my mail. Okay. We now proceed to the uh, first um, group session this morning. Uh, we started with the we start with the most uh, tedious group, the, the professional associations, <laughs> and our first uh, speaker is Doug Bautzen, the council member from the. Uh, European Association for Architectural Education. Doug. Where do I push? Yeah. Oh, on this, huh? Uh, on this. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. Hi, hi, everybody. Um, EAE is doing a lot of things. Uh, the last years, we're really doing a lot of things. Uh, if you check our website, um, you will see that we are organizing quite a number of uh, meetings, gatherings, conferences. Um, uh, it's about research, about education, and uh, networking. Now, what do we share with the A's? Is this letter E uh, of Europe? Um, we are talking about young people, students in the case of EAE, but actually the survey and figures of ACE show that uh, most of the architects uh, in Europe are actually very young people. So uh, when we have been uh, discussing the last years together, ACE and EAE, uh, we had a nice uh, workshop in Paris um, in June last year, we talked a little bit about these things and it came back then in Madrid and so Dubarfko asked me, okay, let's get a little kind of overview and uh, uh, of uh, how come that we are working together here on the thematics that we are talking about. And I want to state and stipulate a little bit some little things, bigger things, problems actually that I think uh, the EAE and the ACE together should work on uh, further. Um, if we talk about interconnected Europe, um, there is this tendency, and we talked about it in uh, uh, the General Assembly meeting conference in Madrid last year, in the end of the summer, that there are some attractive regions to go and work or to go and study in Europe. And that actually uh, they are linked to uh, new tendencies, to winning prizes, etc. There are, little, there are a lot of reasons why people choose uh, to go 
to another country, but uh, it's an important thing to know that there has never been so much movement around Europe and also the world by young people, young architects, trainees and students of architecture. Um, the statement that will be discussed or uh, presented uh, in the end of this day stipulates that um, the ACE and the EAE uh, are, want to appropriate access to international markets. I just want to point out that there is really a lot of work to go. Um, countries like Belgium, which are not very well organized, if you ask me, uh, attract uh, more and more international students. We're not the only ones. Scandinavian countries, uh, uh, um, Switzerland, um, Germany, you name it. And like Belgium, you see there 115 files from third nas country nationals, which means outside Europe, have been submitted to stay and work, and do some traineeship or work in an architectural office after studying here. You don't know you don't want to know what a mess it is for non-European people to be able to work for a little while over here. And on the left you see this uh, chain of uh, all kind of documents that need to be um, tackled with. Um, this, I am also part of the Belgium Order of Architects. Recently we had this complaint against the French state uh, because France didn't recognize the Belgium diplomas. It's just an anecdote, it's solved now, uh, because after suing uh, each other, uh, the problem was uh, in the Ministry of France uh, solved. But there are many, many, many problems for people to move freely around Europe and to work where they want. Yesterday, in the board meeting of the National Order, we had this uh, guy having an, uh, being an architect in uh, Namur, and he is at the same time a contractor in France. In Belgium, it's not allowed to be a contractor in architecture at the same time. What about Europe? We don't know. So I'm just say, stating that there is really a lot of this kind of stuff to be uh, solved. Now, talking about internationalization, um, uh, just a few words about architecture as a mindset. Because one of the other points in the statement being published uh, today or discussed later on is um, to talk about the competences. It uh, fits a little bit with the previous uh, speaker. And you see there in red that developing attitudes, values and behaviors is one of the most important things, also related to the new European Bauhaus. Now, in that framework, uh, you've heard of it or you don't, because there's a large audience online here. Just want to say a few things about this uh, Erasmus Plus financed project called Architectures Afterlife, where six universities throughout Europe uh, did a nice survey and uh, published a lot of stuff. We are going to create a book now uh, with the question, what do people with an architectural degree in Europe do right now? What do they do? And um, this was uh, over 3,000 respondents in different countries. Uh, would you choose again to study architecture? 75% uh, says yes. Um, do you study a little bit after architecture? Yes, 22% you see what they do kind of studies. Um, but the main question was, what kind of uh, occupation do you have right now? Are you doing architecture in the classic sense? Are you combining architecture with something else? Are you working in a related sector, which means uh, related to a uh, creative discipline of architecture? Or are you doing totally something else? And then this is just this most important uh, come out, one of the most important come outs of this study, that is that overall in Europe, 40% of the people with an architectural degree are partly or totally working outside what we call the classic building architects. That is very important to know and it differs of course in the different countries where the universities were based working on this uh, project due to many reasons. But this is very important because we always keep on discussing architectural education as if it is needs to produce architects only, which is not the case anymore. 
The other thing that we used to look at uh, is the skills and competences, again in relation to the previous speaker. And we had in our survey a lot of questions on what kind of skills and knowledge uh, that they use right now, whether they're doing this classical architectural job or not. And then it comes out that the second part there, uh, no, sorry, the third uh, in the middle, personal competences are really important. Determination, work ethic, endurance, handling criticism, flexibility, uh, constant learning and self-improvement, dealing with uncertainty. These were kind of the things when you asked people, uh, how well did you acquire? Look, personal competences on the top. And how often do you use it right now? Again, personal competences on the top. So it means that uh, actually the mismatch between education and the world World, uh, the professional world after the education is not uh, at all out of sense when talking uh, about the skills mentioned above, but that of course uh, at the low bottom employability etc is still a gap. This is very important because it means that all these technical competences, all the skills we think that we should teach are actually less important than all these kind of emotional skills, the ones that sometimes are called soft skills, which means that in architectural education there should be much more concentration on how to go on with that, how to quote, for instance, uh, personal competences when a project is being discussed. Um, these are really uh, important uh, points. And um, uh, okay, another point we discussed about in Paris, in Madrid, is this uh, related to internationalization? Is this uh, Bologna thing? And uh, Olga will speak uh, after me, or yes, uh, in a few moments, uh, competent authorities. Because in the statement, again, for tonight, they will actively contribute to any future uh, discussion on its content. And this is about Article 46, the famous article Dubravko knows everything about. And I still don't understand. Uh, you know, we have to fill in these lists uh, so that uh, we accomplish a kind of uh, competence skill list in order for our architects to be free and move around Europe. It's a kind of really nice passport. Don't touch it, said the people here in Madrid to me, because we are the only discipline having such a passport. But then again, I don't want to listen uh, to this don't touch it thing, and the discussion point in the statement is a nice one, because there are these E and F uh, Article 46 points, understanding of the relationship between people and buildings and buildings and their environment, etc. And understanding of the profession of architecture and the role of the architect in society. I think, we think, and I think it's a really nice task in the future for ACE, EAE and other bodies to have debates on opening up, interpre interpreting these two points. Because they not only refer to what I said, that the discipline is larger than producing architects who build, but they also include this Bologna thing, which made us obliged to relate architectural education to research, to deliver research-based education. And research is not in these skills, but understanding can be opened up in that way. I think that is a nice work for the coming years to do. Inclusivity is one of the other points I think ACE and EAE should share, um, and especially because it's one of the three pillars of the new European Bauhaus. But if you know that this 40% of dropout architects that don't do the practical job of building are actually not uh, uh, are not being seen in whatever kind of boards or chambers or ACE. If you know that uh, there is so many new ways of teaching, if you know that there are so many uh, people uh, swimming around, moving around, 
throughout the world. Uh, I think there is still a lot of work in getting them back and do something which is inclusive, but from that uh, point of view. Showing the invisible values and communities is a task that we are recommending out of our architectures after life. Um, the in and output should be um, determined in a uh, f uh, nicer way. And uh, talking in London recently, even the RIBA uh, is uh, welcoming the idea to kind of create chamber for deviated architects. And then a few more points and I will finish. Uh, lifelong learning has been talked about already this morning, ensuring the upskilling of professionals. Now, you know that in some countries, traineeship is compulsory. In others, it's not. In some, it's two years, it's three years, it's one year. Nobody knows actually what a traineeship should do. Um, uh, but the whole uh, thing about this gap between education, 3 plus 2 on the left, bachelor, master, and then the practice on the right, and this internship thing in between, I think, uh, from the point of view of the ACE and the EAE, we should try to set out some uh, schemes that formalize and that uh, uniform a little bit more how you jump from education world into the real world. Uh, offering these different kinds of things. We have been talking about this with uh, uh, really important people. You see the names there, a lot of them are here today in Madrid, which was a really nice discussion. It was a long discussion, uh, all of us together uh, on these uh, topics. And um, actually that brought us also to uh, the thematic of uh, the afternoon session, especially today. Uh, going further on the skills and competences, and that's how this uh, upskilling title came about. But it also was the reason uh, to have uh, a thematic uh, totally following up this uh, kind of uh, atmospheres for the Dean's Summit, which will take place tomorrow uh, in Scharbeek here. Um, 60 people will come, uh, or like uh, almost 50 deans will join uh, this Dean's Summit tomorrow. A lot of you will continue here, but I'm just mentioning it because how can architects take up a role when things become difficult in times of uh, political uncertainty inhabiting a fragile earth? How do we train architecture students to cope with complex environments? So actually we asked the deans to um, give some examples of impactful communication tools, of persuasive propositions, of convincing presentations, of action-based studios, and necessary caring competences. And it was really nice that uh, we have tomorrow uh, like a lot of short presentations of seven minutes each, but of deans showing examples of how they see that they want or try to do that within their faculty wherever in Europe. Thanks a lot for this. Thank you, Doug. Um, you, you referred to Ashraf's uh, lecture several times. I, I, I thought it was a really good introduction for all the, 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 the topics that we will um, uh, discuss today. So um, the next speaker is me. I won't introduce myself, <laughs> but I, I just want to um, shortly present you what ACE does in terms of um, uh, uh, CPD upskilling um, um, and supporting professional education. Um, well, I, I suppose one third of the audience are ACE delegates, um, pretty much so. Um, they are very well uh, familiar with this, but uh, please uh, bear with me um, just uh, a little bit. For, for the rest of you, this um, I hope this will be um, 
kind of um, short and interesting overview. So it, it, we always cover the, the basis, probably we, all of you know, but I mean, we are growing in numbers, so we are uh, very proud. Um, uh, ACE has now about um, 49 uh, member organizations, includes obviously 27 member states and four observing and three special status members. It, uh, we um, 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 are an association of national re regulatory and professional representative bodies. And according to the uh, last sector study uh, for the, the 2022 that will be presented tomorrow at our General Assembly by the short preview, uh, it, so we are talking about uh, 620,000 architects from basically 34 European countries. Our work is organized in four areas, but the, and, and things do overlap and intersect, but um, uh, access to the profession, basically area one uh, in, for which I'm the coordinator in this term uh, and in several previous terms as well, uh, is uh, about PQD, PP, and CPD, uh, the acronym. So the Professional Qualifications Directive, the ones that uh, Doug was mentioning earlier, uh, Professional Practice Experience, again, what Doug was mentioning, and Continuous Professional uh, Development. Um, our missions, um, uh, of course, we advocate quality in architectural um, education. We uphold the highest um, um, standards uh, of education, and we are very proud of our continuous collaboration with Euro uh, European Association for Architectural Education. Um, what we do and promote different kinds of knowledge, uh, we um, uh, try always to, to publish in, in our policy papers. They are all uh, available at uh, ACE websites. Um, there are also other kinds of um, um, publications, as Doug was saying about EAAE. I think we are all working more uh, recent years, so we also have a, a, a quite a nice collection of um, uh, um, publications, they are all available at our website. Um, and um, I think one of the important ways of uh, promoting new uh, knowledge and new, um, uh, um, also coming together and discussing these, uh, these uh, uh, things are public conferences and we have done uh, several. Um, oh, oh yeah, maybe the Rome wasn't this, this important, I don't know, for me it was very, but the, the last uh, conference, that uh, big conference that ACE and EAA did together was actually in Rome in 2017 on architectural education, mm -hmm. the future architect. And, and so, you know, we thought when we were discussing this, we thought it's, it's, it's about time to revisit this um, uh, topic. And we were ahead of the commission, actually. Before, we knew that the uh, 2023 will be European Year of Skills. We already knew that we wanted to. Um, but there are all sorts of things. And as you can see, we are quite um, on, on the way. I mean, we seem to be um, dealing with the conferences, uh, the, the topics, uh, just in time, in a way. Uh, also, in another way of, uh, of um, acquiring new knowledge and, and, and disseminating this is through EU-funded projects. And the, at the moment, ACE is involved in 10 um, uh, ongoing uh, projects with uh, a whole um, um, spectrum of uh, uh, program partners. Some of them will be presented uh, uh, in the afternoon session. Uh, but also there were some earlier ones, and one of the, uh, um, uh, well, I don't know if it was the earliest one, but the one that we are also very proud of was, again, with the EAAE um, um, yeah, confronting wicked problems. Uh, I've seen Ivan somewhere, and, and I don't know, some other participants in the, on, on the EAAE side, so that, um, this was... Um, I won't bother you with this, but I mean, obviously, the education and uh, access, well, to the profession and requirements for for education have been uh, on 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 ACE's um, 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 agenda basically for you know for for a long time ago. Um, what, what are our positions? And I think, as, as Doug, Doug's diagram show, um, it's so uh, education. Uh, you know, five plus two standards. Um, although we acknowledge that there are other 
um, uh, models, uh, uh, professional practice experience that should be compulsory. As, as, as I said not ev earlier in the introduction, not everything can be learned in the school. And obviously, as Doug mentioned, we need to discuss how these things will um, work. We um, also support and advocate for continuous professional development. We have now CPD registered uh, and CPD policy and uh, um, at, at our uh, in, in set up at, in ACE and the automatic recognition and cross registration. So again, the the, the, the Article 46 uh, benefits that uh, we really um, uh, benefit from. Um, and um, Olga will come next with uh, NACA. Uh, so the, I, and this is the diagram that I did for, for that uh, Paris workshop of ours showing that we are a, basically a triangle that has to work together to, um, um, for the benefit of our uh, discipline and profession. Um, also in 2021 with uh, Boris, uh, under Boris coordina uh, coordination, Boris Czarkiciev from our, uh, our board member from Poland, uh, there was um, a survey, um, a joint ACE and ACA survey to the profession which showed, and these are all interesting um, findings, especially when you look at uh, the, the, um, our sector study results and the, the, the research results that came out from Architecture Afterlife that Doug presented. So what, what um, happens in most of your countries and in some countries, I won't comment, I just uh, leave it here. Maybe we can include it uh, later in the, in the uh, discussion and so the um, uh, again the numbers a, a little bit more maybe more precise than that was mentioning earlier so the, where, where the professional practice after so before the access full access to the profession is about two-thirds of the member state countries but then again it's not paid in in all of them um, 20 hours of continuous professional development is on average what the sector study shows that architects across Europe do. Um, we, we indeed are a young uh, profession, so one third of the architects are basically under 40. Um, and um, the last uh, data, so that 21, so the, the result of this mobility and the Bologna Accord that uh, 20 more than 20% of respondents studied in another country. A few years back, or maybe 10 years back, it was like 2 or 3%. Uh, so that's about me. Uh, about uh, <laughs> ACE. So. I, was, I was going to say that's for me. Okay, um, now... Our last speaker in this session is Olga Mihalikova. Olga is the Managing Director of the Slovak Chamber of Architects uh, and also co-chair of the ACE PQD PPD CP workgroup. So we have one workgroup dealing with all these uh, issues. As I said, PQD PP CPD stands for Professional Qualifications Directive, Professional Practice Experience and Continuous uh, Professional Development. Olga is also the founding member of the ENACA network. Uh, and chair, uh, so the European um, uh, Network of Architects Competent Authorities, and this is exactly uh, because of this last function that we asked um, Olga to speak today. Olga, here you go. Here is the here is the presenter. Now, is it better? <laughs> so once again, uh, hello everybody. It's my pleasure to be here today as I am representing the competent authorities that are not really that favorite. <laughs> I will have the shortest presentation. Um, after, I mean, I will start with touching up on the do not touch article 46. <laughs> Uh, that is always a, an important discussion, so just to probably slightly add something, it was not about do not touch, it was more about can we speak more about the interpretation, can we see more space within already uh, listed 11 items or 11 um, skills and knowledges that are in there, and can we see a bit more space already or liberty inside, but obviously this 
uh, as competent authorities, we do not try to add or change or, or anyhow. This is, I think, mainly the role of professional association, meaning Architects Council of Europe, and educators to achieve. Uh, so, yeah, this is the magic button. So, just briefly, I am representing a European network of architects competent authorities. Uh, I've been with this network since 2007, and the main goal has not changed. It's uh, to facilitate the free movement of architects, and that's uh, in uh, meaning the recognition of architects' qualifications. And the second is uh, to, and that uh, that's a new um, or another uh, role we have taken on over the years. It's uh, helping the notifications. Um, I'll tell something more about what the notifications mean in this context. So, um, uh, although I represent the co-regulators and competent authorities, and actually who is fond of, of any of regulation, I would like to leave you educators, students, and also colleagues, architects, just with the thought of something that I called a free passport or uh, giving a free access to the market across EU, EEA, and uh, Switzerland. Uh, it is also a starting point for any mutual recognition agreements. So what is this magic key? It is a so-called listed qualifications. This means that the curriculum has been notified to the European Commission and member states and accepted by all of these stakeholders. So this is what is mentioned as um, qualifications listed in Annex 5 or 6. As long as you get full access in one member state based on this kind of qualification, you are entitled to free movement in any other member states. So actually, the reason behind the notification is not to make life of the universities difficult, not to impose on them another process that is not just accreditation. The notifications are, although in many member states, they are not equal to accreditations, and I know it's an extra burden, but this burden is to save the migrating architects from the burden, which means that as long as you have full access in one country, you have the full access in all the countries. You, you don't need nostrification of your diploma. You don't need to be checked. And that's this one suits all. And that's the price to pay. So obviously, it's the mutual, mutual trust by the competent authorities and all the other stakeholders based on the evaluation and the scrutiny over the notification process. So, uh, yeah, the famous Article 46, which lists 11 items, skills and knowledges. Uh, architects are the only learning outcomes-based profession. All of the other professions have prescribed curricula, ECTS credits. So that's why we say architects are in a way special already. Uh, whether these should be changed and how this needs a strong consensus between the educators and the profession. And if this can be achieved, obviously, I can imagine that the European Commission might be hopefully willing to change it, but that's, that's I think, still a challenge. So, uh, and this is just saying a bit about who we are, um, that we are also trying to build some best practice guidances because European Commission lists really just the limits. So again, this is not what you need to fulfill, but in case if you have some questions, you are preparing the notification of curricula um, at your university so that we might be probably, hopefully, able to assist you in the process. And um, yeah, this is just saying that we have some people who have finished accredited education, but unfortunately, not notified, and therefore, when they come to us, um, they are sometimes not really happy with the result that they do not have this free access. So this is just about emphasizing that it's an important uh, tool for your graduates. 
And thank you very much for your attention. And if I may be helpful or my, some of my colleagues, please do not hesitate to get in touch. Thank you, Olga. OK, uh, so we are right in time. Um, it's, uh, it's now time for a coffee break. But uh, if there are any questions, uh, maybe to the, to the first group, we can also answer now or discuss over the coffee, or leave it all for the uh, discussion round table afterwards. OK, coffee then. See you. Exactly, punktlich at 11.15, please. Thank you.
Okay, uh, welcome back. Please take your seats. We are we are going on with the with the program. Um, we have students in the next session. Um, we really wanted to in, invite uh, some of young colleagues and to show some things that they do. Uh, the, the first speakers, the first pair, um, are two students from TU Munich, uh, Elena Spatz and Eduarda Pobey. Elena and Eduarda are two of um, several coordinators of the SOFT uh, School of Transformation, which is a student collective, very um, um, active at the Technical University in Munich. Um, and they will talk to us about things they do. So, Elena and Eduarda, please take the floor. Yes. Um, yeah, can we move to the slides, please? Is it here? Ah, so. Ah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, good morning. I'm Eduard and this is Elena. And um, we're both from SOFT, School of Transformation, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, but it's a collective founded in Munich last year at the Technical University. And we wanted to start with this very placative slide, Architecture Discriminates. Um, these images are some examples of buildings and personalities we come across in architecture school, and we hope that in the next minutes, we will be able to understand why architecture is a discriminatory system, and later on we'll show what are we doing in order to deal with such issues. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, so this building might not come up as news for most of the people in this room. It has been quoted countless times in architecture history classes, and it is usually used to illustrate the advantages of prefabrication and modular construction. However, the context in which the building is located, most specifically the first World Fair in 1851, is not given the same attention. The aim of the event was to cel celebrate Britain's colonialism and exhibit its colonies and stolen art as a national achievement and symbol of power. The East India Company used the exhibition to portray India as an exotic, subjugated, and uncivilized country. The Crystal Palace was meant to give Britain the feeling of national pride and support the violent colonial policy. In doing so, the World Fair makes use of the strategy of ordering in order to continue with its colonial policies. I bet every architecture student has come across these pictures over the course of their studies. We've all seen and learned about the Vinci's Vitruvian Man and the Corbusier's Modulo. The rationalization of man's proportions have long been a topic of study for scholars and architecture theorists. With the Modulo, Le Corbusier established a set of norms, which he could later transfer to his designs. But there's a catch. Modulo has the measurements of an English policeman and the height of 1 meter 85. That's not that average, right? Or maybe it is if your average is the white cis European man. As a result, a frontier between sameness and otherness is created, and the built environment becomes an unquestioned standard for what is normal and thus of confirmation to such normativity. But wait, there are some cases where other bodies were used in architectural representation. As for example, in Neufert's Bau and Wurfslehre, first published in 1936. In the very first page of the book, Neufert establishes the scale of all things, once again based on the archetypical white European. However, he chooses female figures when adapting situations in which women are supposed to feel homey, the kitchen. So for whom are you designing? These examples might be over 100 years old, 
but that is still the canon that is being taught and referenced upon in our architecture schools. Whom are we designing for? If architecture legislations are based on Neufeld, if colonial buildings are still being mentioned without any context, who is the user we have in mind when going into practice? This goes beyond proportions and matters of accessibility. Which culture is being represented in our cities, in our buildings? And who, perhaps even deliberately, is being left out? Over the past few years, we've seen an increase of political demonstrations all around the world. Movements such as Black Lives Matter and Me Too brought racial and sexist issues into the spotlight. The problem is systemic. If such discriminatory structures are the base of Western civilization, what makes us think that these are not present in architecture? If architecture is the built translation of society, racism, patriarchy and Eurocentrism are also reflected in the built environment. The previous pictures shows hope and optimism when it comes to our future. A future where we live in a society that cares for each individual and acknowledges our framework of discriminatory structures. These movements show us that people today feel excluded and not represented in our built environment. We came to university with the expectation of learning how to respond to these crises and grievances. But unfortunately, we found ourselves inside an institution that is only transforming slowly and is a bureaucratic structure. That is why we founded our own school, SOFT, SOFT School of Transformation, and we are a self-organized initiative of students and people working in the architecture field in Munich. We want to transform our university to towards a responsible, solidary, and caring education policies and practice. Step one, distract. Our active role relies on the fact that we are frustrated by the encrusted structures and ignorant education of our universities. That is why we have become feminist parasites on campus by distracting accustomed spaces with little leaflets. Maybe the Guerrilla Girls is a name for you. Inspired by the subversive and humorous style, we chose the university as our exhibition space. The leaflets illustrate facts and the results of our self conduct conducted survey and show our frustration is not only emotional but also proven. Coming together and communicating at eye level is one way of generating a comfortable and safe space to exchange ideas and discuss delicate topics such as architecture and discrimination. Step two, unlearn. We are convinced that we should not only learn but also unlearn. The idea of publishing a newsletter was one of the first things we did as a student collective. If the university fails to provide us with an up-to-date canon, why not take matters into our own hands? With three publications since its launch, Cute and Radical brings into the spotlight all diverse topics in the cosmos of architecture, which are usually invisible in our school. Part of SOFT is the Chair of Unlearning, which is the first student-run chair at the TU Munich. We call for an obligatory subject in architecture education that deals with discrimina discrimination through spaces, traffic, and education itself. We took action by crashing lectures in all ears so students could listen to 15-minute talks about why architecture discriminates. Step three, relearn. After disrupting biases by distraction and unlearning, we come to our final step to actively change architectural education, relearn. How many of us pulled an all-nighter during the years of architecture school? Or had to ask our parents for extra money to buy enough material for one of the many models during the semester? Of course, if you have a privileged background, stable family relations, and a perfect living condition, this might not be a problem. But, and this might come as a shock for some people, the vast majority of students, that is not the case. Architecture school is classist and discriminatory at its core, and the high expectations and workload make it impossible for people from low-income or immigrant backgrounds to successfully finish the program. Most will not even choose architecture in the first place, because they don't have the means to do so. After year-long complaints from students, we worked together with the Parity Front to write the Code of Studio, which you can see on the screen, an agreement between students and professors on how to achieve a healthier studio culture. This is a work in progress and we are now in contact with our home university in order to set this into motion. 
Last year, we also organized a symposium together with uh, the university's parity board. Over three days, we talked about gender norms and our affected biases, world cultures and well-being and equitable pedagogies. It was very inspiring to hear what has been done in other universities in order to achieve a healthier and new understanding of architecture curricula. And it also showed us that in every university, we find similar fights and struggles and a supporting network can bring us a lot further. Last year, we had the opportunity to hold a seminar as students and explore new ways of appropriating spaces in university. Our participants should map out one grievance at university or in our built environment and reveal the problem as an intervention. During class, we tried to break with our determined seminar rooms and appropriated spaces in the hallway or outside. Next week, we show our results in our exhibition um, and you can see the post on the left side and everyone is warmly welcomed if you're near Munich. And we built on the idea of Sarah Mafi and Ton Rajkoschke's seminar who, who um, held a seminar year before us. Um, by working as a tandem, they showed approaches to break with the monolithic view of the African countries. And in both cases, the students took on the role of the teachers. They discovered a new form of respect for learning from each other and among students. That is why we wish for official run chairs, student run chairs, embedded in architecture curricula and on eye level with all other chairs. To finalize our input, we want to present our nine demands for universities and architecture curricula. It is the university's responsibility to check the admission procedures, teaching content and spaces of knowledge production of its accessibility and freedom from discrimination. We demand continuous support for people who have experienced discrimination and open spaces where they can exchange their experiences. The university is the place where we can learn and establish violence-free communication, so we wish for a culture of admitting errors among students and teachers. We aim for self-critical architecture curricula. We need to acknowledge that architecture, history and practice are based on normative, Eurocentric and discriminatory systems and consolidate such structures in the built environment. Stay soft and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Okay, now we are raising the temperature a bit. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, our next speakers are again two students, this time from University of Zagreb, uh, Croatia, Ana Maria Dujmovic and Ivona Mravunac. Ana Maria is an architecture student and Ivona is a civil engineering uh, student and they will talk to us about um, Supeus Association, a student run NGO dedicated to promotion of energy efficiency, sustainability, and most importantly, interdisciplinary collaboration of students of different uh, study programs. Okay. Please. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for the introduction. And once again, on behalf of all of my colleagues uh, from the SUPOS, uh, I thank you for the invitation to participate on this conference. It's truly an honor to be in front of all of you to talk about a topic related to education in the construction sector because we are a student from Croatia, uh, my colleague Ivona Mravunac, a student at the Faculty of Civil Engineering and a member of the board of SUPOS, and myself, Ana Maria Dujmovic, a student at the Faculty of University, uh, at the Architecture Faculty, University of Zagreb. Um, in these 10 minutes, we will present to you uh, a SUPOS, an association which started 12 years ago with the same vision that new European Bauhaus has now. Uh, SUPOS is a short for on Croatian Student Association for Promoting Energy Efficiency and Consulting. And it's made up of an interdisciplinary team of students. Um, and the topic we deal with and promote our energy efficiency, sustainable architecture, and renewable energy sources. 
Uh, New European Bauhaus and uh, Supos share the same principles. Principles uh, that uh, have made association active for many years and which are implemented in our project continuously since its foundation. Uh, each of our projects and activity is based on this diagram. Um, so there is a constant uh, synergy of students, faculties, companies, professor, uh, professors and institutions. Uh, students together work together to initiate, to design and ultimately realize different various of, uh, projects. Um, but this teamwork, we don't look as a mosaic of specialized uh, individual segments of um, individual disciplines. There is always, um, um, there is a constant process of translation between different fields of activities and different di disciplines in a such a way that concepts and insights from one, one field can be meaningfully uh, implied in others, not just formally and descriptively. Um, at the moment, uh, association has 32 regular and 12 interns. Uh, on the right, you can see the list of faculty, faculties that our main members came from. And we all know how architecture from 21st century acquire each of them, and maybe more. Uh, now, Ivona will tell you more about our organization and projects. Thank you. Uh, our organization, uh, our students in our organ organizations are uh, divided into departments um, where they develop new knowledge and skills, uh, with, uh, which they will certainly use in their future, and which uh, they have not uh, the opportunity to learn at college. In particular, we all know how uh, useful it is to have some basics of economy, finance, uh, marketing, project management, and these are all just some of the benefits our members acquire. Uh, with our projects, we want to overcome a harmful separation of individual disciplines and put focus on interdisciplinarity. And for example, uh, our at our conference called BOOST, which is short from creation words translated as the future of com com comfortable living. Students can hear about current topics in various uh, fields of activity. And this year, the conference was successfully held a month ago, uh, where 120 students from different faculties were presented at college uh, that Saturday. Uh, a rarely seen picture of so many students present at uh, lectures, they don't, uh, not of which even concern their professions. And uh, a rarely seen uh, pictures and scenes like this motivates us and inspire us to continue our work. Supeus case study is a student competition which consists of three workshops. Uh, the first one is the collaboration and merge of architecture and civil engineering. The second one is electrical engineering workshop. And the third one, mechanical engineering work workshop. Um, this project is um, um, this project's um, this project is based on a principle that no prior knowledge is required because lectures are, at the first part, lectures uh, are, uh, the lectures from professors and experts from each field uh, put the, put the, uh, the, in, because in the first part of this uh, project, lectures are held by professors and experts, which uh, give the students um, everything they need to solve the task in the second part. And uh, to be clear, it's not important to, uh, to uh, learn exact calculations, but to, uh, to understand the principles and the way each uh, pro uh, professionals uh, from each uh, from each field thinks. Uh, 
In addition to these projects, we also have our own podcast, uh, which uh, has been launched in 2019, and you can watch them on our YouTube channel. So far, we have also published uh, four magazines called SUMA, and we continue to publish our work on, uh, on, in an uh, online version. There is also numerous collaborations with uh, our partner firms, which you can see on this slide. And uh, the activities of, us, of our association includes constant internal education, frequent visits to uh, firms, uh, interesting workshops, and passive or active participation on conferences, uh, and all with the aim to acquire new knowledge, uh, skills, and abilities. Uh, and finally, I would like to refer to the architects in the association. Uh, in the last couple of years, uh, there is an increasing interest of uh, my colleagues, of my faculty, to the topics we deal with. Uh, I consider the main benefit, and my colleagues agree, uh, that SUPOS teaches mutual collaboration in achieving a common goal. Uh, you learn how to listen first, and then you build your own attitude based on acquired knowledge and skills. Uh, your hor horizons of looking of, on some task or problem uh, expand significantly, and you learn how to communicate and talk to uh, colleagues that are not in your profession, how some engineer thinks, how to talk with a director of some company, and so on. And if you think more about it, if you achieve that in your student phase, um, we look that it's a great achievement. Um, and we consider all of these to be necessary skills and knowledge that every architect should acquire through uh, its professional life. And also, uh, the sooner you are, you are aware what uh, awaits you after the, the education, you will sooner look for opportunities um, and solutions. And that builds self-confidence and you became more active in your field of activity. And as an architecture student, um, I really, with each new interdisciplinary project, my passion for architecture grows stronger. Uh, I became more aware of the real task and importance of me as an architect. And uh, to short, um, New European Bauhaus uh, has a great opportunity to become a mediator in a create, creation of professionals who are able to put together the right information and solution at the right time and then critically, and think critically about it. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. You're our web and you can always follow us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, our last speaker in the student session is not really a student. Uh, I think a lot of you know Ivan Blasi from uh, um, uh, Barcelona-based Mies van der Rohe Foundation, who is uh, director of programs and creator of the EU Mies. Uh, Young Talent uh, Architecture Award. Um, but just shortly to remind before I uh, give word to Ian, um, after, in, um, some of you may know, but after initial editions of the Best Diploma Project Award co organized by ACE, EAE, and then at that point, Ion Minku University, I think they deserve to be mentioned at least in a, um, because they really helped a lot. Uh, from Bucharest, from 2015 to 2018, in 2020, we joined the forces with the Mies van der Rohe Foundation. Um, ACE and EAAE to give the prize a more permanent organizational platform and visibility. And so since 2020, the YTAA award competition is organized by the foundation uh, in partnership with us, so the European Association for Architectural Education and ACE. Um, and um, as you know, the, the Young Talent Architecture Award uh, aims to support the talent of recently graduated architects, urban planners, and landscape architects. So Ivan has promised us um, to exclusively announce today the projects shortlisted for the award this year, and we are all anxiously waiting to, to see so, Ivan. Thank you. Good 
Marco, and thank you uh, for the invitation to uh, EAAE and ACE uh, to present today uh, the EU MIS Awards and specifically the category of the young talent. Uh, and thank you for putting me in this panel with uh, students. So it's always kind of invigorating and interesting also to, to listen uh, to, to you, to them. Uh, so, um, we, uh, well, you already made the introduction, so it's perfect. I can avoid that part. And uh, the young talent or architecture, we understand it as a field of technological, cultural, uh, social, and ecological activities that are embedded in our daily lives. And, uh, and also the structures that, that build the societies and the ecosystems where we, where we live. It's a way of understanding realities or the dimension of uh, reality. And then, Together with that, there's the archi there's architecture as a as a discipline, uh, and that's where we become aware of and develop a critical discourse around some of these dimensions of reality. So that's why in 2016 we started thinking about the importance of adding to uh, the uh, EU MIS awards that were born back in 1988 uh, the category for final diploma projects, uh, master uh, projects uh, from all over uh, European uh, architecture schools so that we would be able to first of all see what many of you here are doing how education in architecture is evolving is changing which results we have from all these schools presented and then we also follow up the uh, evolution let's say or the careers of the winners or the finalists and the shortlisted over the years so as we began rather recently we still haven't seen them for example in the case of the architecture and emerging uh, categories building yet but they might get to also participate uh, as nominated works as their works being nominated to the built categories okay the 60 percent that we were hearing before of architects that end up uh, being uh, architects that that built. So, as we were saying, uh, it started in 1988. There's a series of uh, buildings that we uh, are aware of, that we know by architects with famous names, which were the winners around the middle uh, or the center of the image is when the emerging category started appearing as well. So, adding another kind of category to see the kind of newer, younger uh, thoughts and discussions taking place in architecture with offices that were recently, uh, that had been recently uh, kind of uh, put on, on the map. And then uh, in 2016, and also with EAA, with ACE, through the uh, Romanian uh, school, we started collaborating in seeing these first steps that we also start seeing uh, over here in this drawing. But this is not, this, these are only the winners, so this is a very small glimpse of all this big archive that's online and there's publications and so on that shows us a certain part, a small part obviously, of architecture evolution in Europe in the last 35 uh, years. Uh, so, it is a prize for recently graduated architects, urban planners, landscape architects who are responsible for this future in our uh, planet. And a way to celebrate or to also give visibility to these projects and to bring up discussions and debates, which is something that happens with the architecture and the emerging, the built works, but it also happens with the young talent, is to bring up the discussions through the discourses, the kind of conversations that the jury members have had through uh, their kind of uh, discussions or judging of the uh, works that they have in front of them which allows us to curate afterwards, together with the jury members and the winners uh, and the finalists, the exhibitions, the publications, and then also bring these conversations into different platforms. So here, uh, with the young talent, what we uh, take advantage of is the platform of the La Biennale di Venezia, where we uh, participate as a collateral event. Uh, and this is last time's exhibition, where we have some of the models, some people which do not work with models anymore. They work with other instruments, films or videos, and so on. Some of them make publications to present their work. Uh, and uh, that is what we show and we uh, present during La Biennale. 
But there's also a moment of celebration, also there in Venice, in Palazzo More, in Palazzo uh, Michiel, uh, where the winners are invited together with the jury members and members of ACE and EAAE, and together with celebrating, which is uh, always great, uh, it is amazing to listen, to hear how these young professionals participate in the conversations and the discussions that, as I was saying before, depending on the topics that the juries have uh, highlighted, have underlined, uh, are brought up, and that bring kind of these discussions um, to, uh, to everybody. And here we listen to they them. They can be speculative and, and creative, but they are situated and in relation with. My name is Monica. Um, I come from Bulgaria. New problematics that popping up. But they have to come up with their own questions. Mira, yo creo que hay un desafío de la universidad. What I learned in this five years course. Si el arquitecto hace falta, ¿por qué hace falta? Y no pueden competir cada día para ser mejor. Uh, emptied my mind. Go back to the nature. Eh, trabajar con lo local, la materialidad. It is just how oh, beautiful but nothing. But I think there is a real shift of recognizing. The minds are changing. Tienes que yo creo que lanzarte, atreverte. Yo creo que sí tenemos futuro como, como arquitectos. No, la clave yo creo que es eh, poder adaptarse al cambio. Pero lo hemos descubierto a través de surtir precisamente del món eh, más arcaico, podríamos decir, o más estereotipado de la arquitectura. So this is a short version of the longer video, which is uh, online, but some kind of key points that they considered important and that uh, also appeared uh, in those conversations. And how afterwards this exhibition is also done or prepared in a printed yourself uh, or by yourself uh, format so that many, maybe in some of your uh, schools of architecture has already been presented and so we can see not only what we do in our own schools, but also what's happening or how uh, final diploma projects uh, are being uh, tackled with uh, in other schools and addressing some of these uh, debates or some of these uh, conversations. And we also invite schools from other continents, that's what we have been doing in the last uh, editions, uh, to share and to uh, how your European uh, architecture is taught, uh, but also learn uh, from abroad. So we have had uh, different opportunities to collaborate and to invite guest schools from Asian countries, sometimes from Latin American countries. And this year, uh, separately, because the EU MIS Awards have been organized since, its, its, since their inception, uh, together with the European uh, Commission uh, through uh, the cultural program with Creative Europe, and that is something that is very uh, important, and that is uh, also the platform that is supporting today's uh, conference. But in this case, uh, to this time, we have invited uh, schools from the African continent to also participate independently or in parallel, although all the works were debated and discussed together so that we can also kind of see uh, how they are uh, tackling this issue uh, in African territories. So in Young Talent 2023, we had the jury members that you're seeing, they change each time, and we have people with different backgrounds, from some which are practitioners, practitioners and also teachers or professors, uh, some of them which are directors, of institutions or events, activities, such as the Triennial of Lisbon. Some are connecting architecture and art through curatorship. And they were just last week uh, in Barcelona uh, discussing before they had uh, been looking, reviewing the 300 uh, projects that participated this year. And this is something which is also very important that what we enhance all the schools to do is to create debates. Uh, when choosing which projects should be nominated, should participate in the prize. So not only a professor or director choosing, but to create discussions uh, with the student boards, with the professors, with the directorships, and so on, to choose how their schools are represented. We know that this happens in some of the schools. We know that in the uh, at some in Madrid, for example, that takes place, or in the Valles. In some schools it takes place, in others it's not possible to kind of follow that up. But finally, the jury was able to look at all these works, 
two days of amazing discussions. They chose 38 shortlisted works from where there will be 12 finalists, three winners, and in the open, eight shortlisted works, five finalists, and one winner. So the idea was now to present which are these 38 shortlisted projects, which will then be reduced to the finalists, the 12 finalists that will be announced during the opening of the exhibition in Venice, and then the winners, which will be celebrated uh, in this event that will take place at the end of June. So while we see some of the images, it's all on, well, it's gonna be online in 10 minutes, but uh, there's only like one image of each project with the name of the student and the name of uh, his or her project, I will read some of the statements or things that the jury members uh, said. So this was them over there. So they highlighted the importance of the discussion on architectural education, which can take place seeing the different approaches in these projects. Some are experimental or utopian. The freedom of designing still as a student without all the constraints that we have in the practice or the real world. Projects that are diverse and complementary among the list of these 38. And where we see that uh, architects also become facilitators, something that came up before, um, at least uh, with this uh, generation, and non-individual makers. We'll see that many of the projects are done also in teamwork. Projects just done after the pandemic, 2021, 2022, and they took that into consideration. Importance of research and analysis, but also designing and producing a, a proposal. Some of them are strong research works. Others also include precise detail and experimental works. And some are even built afterwards. Although this year we have seen less examples in this direction and many intellectual speculations. Interest in the vernacular and the countryside as well as the involvement involving the community, projects that address certain groups of people, others that address processes of healing and understanding conflicts that we have nowadays. Many projects deal with the topic of water from different perspectives, from its supply to the risks or the uh, challenges of the rising sea levels, flooding, flooding need and floating needs, Projects addressing the topic of generating energy with infrastructures connected to the human scale, integrated in the landscape and also in the program of the projects. Thinking on what already exists, what has already been built. Interest by the jury on technologies and how they are used or how they affect design. Tools of strong contemporaneity they spoke about. Projects that become unfinished systems with a lot of potentialities. The use of videos using uh, as tools that allow the authors to create atmospheres, and we've seen many because we asked them also to produce videos to explain their works, and many use these kind of uh, tools in which they give somehow some kind of video game uh, atmospheres, and we've seen that a lot. Projects that have strong narratives and backgrounds of research and which are inspiring and poetic, and some also make political statements. Projects that bring light and freshness to ecologic and political issues and optimism despite the current social, political and economic uh, situation. So here we have these uh, works uh, that we have been speaking about, how they are more or less distributed throughout uh, Europe, with some of them being implemented, let's say, in a city from a student from another city. Uh, because uh, he or she is studying somewhere else. So congratulations to all the shortlisted uh, people. In the next days, as we say, we will know which ones of these are the finalists. Uh, that will be on 19 May, opening of the exhibition there in Venice. Uh, during the, uh, the, the opening of the Venice Biennale. On 29 June, there will be the EU MIS Awards Day where you're all invited to participate, to discuss and speak with these uh, young professionals uh, with the award ceremony and a party uh, afterwards. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you for this very exclusive uh, breaking news, and I hope the, the, some of the shortlisted people uh, were uh, uh, watching your presentation. But as you said, it will be online in few in few minutes. Okay, so our last um, uh, session before lunch um, is dedicated to education from point of the educators at, the, at this point. So we are um, progressing a, a bit. Um, 
I, uh, you have all the biographies in, in, in the, uh, on the conference website, so I'll just stop introducing extensively the, the lecturers. I want to have, uh, for them to have as much time as possible. So, Johanna, uh, please take the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Johanna meyer Grobrügge. I'm from the TU Darmstadt, and um, I'm in the teaching section, but actually I don't consider myself as a very academic person. I, um, so I just started uh, this professorship in October 21, and I very much come from the practice. I um, was never really interested in teaching, but um, yeah, so maybe moving to the first image. I, I felt it's a really good time to go into academia uh, because it's relevant, more relevant than ever, also for me, because I became deeply unsecure about how to move on um, in architecture world, and I thought academia is a really good place also for myself to maybe find some answers. Um, can you go to the next? Ah, oh, no, I, I do that, right? This. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so I start with this image because this um, really represents very well a little bit the time that we are in where there are really no linear stories anymore, but everything is connected with everything. Um, so, okay, perfect time to go into academia, <clears throat> but then what do we teach? Um, it's really <laughs> the question I felt. I was lucky, I had a very good education, I would consider, with very good architects, um, but I had a feeling I cannot just tell them what I learned, because is this really relevant anymore? So it has to be a search um, together, as I said. And of course, it's about, yeah, the earth is speaking back very loudly. Um, it's the question about how can we build without doing more harm, but it's also the question what we heard before, for who do we really build, with what do we build? And um, all this is, at the moment, more questions and answers, which is good, but we, as I said, we have to um, become smart together. Um, but still, sometimes it's really a challenge as a teacher. I used to have very clear advices for my teachers, and we cannot do that anymore. This is just uh, two very quick examples uh, what I mean. For example, um, yeah, one big crisis, of course, the building becomes so, so much more expensive, which is a real problem, especially in Berlin, where I come from, and it's a social question, right, um, because it's just not fair. <laughs> it really segregates um, humanity. And so you might think, okay, the answer is to build more simple, so to go more into standardization, right? On the other hand, I think we really need to look at each situation more individual, especially about the ecologies, to build more sustainable, and so those are in conflict, for example. So what do we say, what's, what's right and what's wrong? Same thing about the old question about um, should the city be seen as an opposite to the countryside? Um, of course, it makes sense not to seal more ground, obviously, but then on the other hand, we need to implement um, everything that we outsource from the city to have the same qualities, to have more a coexistence. And again, those are in conflict. So what um, can we teach there is not very clear. Um, yeah, so I think those buzzwords we heard uh, often today, and maybe we will hear a little bit more. So we really have to foster, which I liked, I think those soft skills in the students and work on those together, that's how I see it. And But what does it really mean for teaching? For me, for me personally. Um, so what, what is important in my teaching? And I think what I for myself um, identified a little bit so far, I'm still um, continue to, to learn and to work on it. I think, I mean, at the end, all we can do is really motivate them. I think that's how it comes down <laughs> with everything. We can only motivate them um, to learn themselves, I would say but also to, to tell them, um, to give them the belief, to foster the belief in the power of creativity and to make them believe that it has a power, that they're with this uh, ability, they're able to stand um, against um, developers and the AI, AIs of the world, because this is, I think, the one skill as architects we really have and that we are able to change also uh, significantly the world with this and have the responsibility to do this. So I think this is important. And then still, I very much believe in design. 
in still in design, but more as a method, as a method to bring different issues and theme together and through design and the physical outcome, bring them further in some way. I, I think this is also a very important um, skill. And this, I think this way of thinking, I think this is the one thing I really try to teach and I think I can teach them <laughs> how to do it. And then of course at the end we just have to ask the right questions to them by posing certain themes. Um, so I just want to quickly show one example where I think it was it's quite nice, a project that I have on my chair. It's uh, called uh, ACA, so as academia, but also like as known as. And um, it's a project, it's initiated from the president of the TU Darmstadt, Mrs. Uh, Tanja Brühl. Um, this is a, a place in the middle of the campus um, of the TU Darmstadt, a very nice uh, old uh, machine hall under, under heritage and she decided that she wants to give that to the students as a learning center and very smartly she also decided that the students themselves should say what it should exactly be and how it should look like. So she asked me to do a little competition under my students to um, like an architectural competition but also forming the program. And um, yeah, so I don't really want to explain so much the architecture. So there was a competition. There were actually two winners. One had an architectural strategy, which very much like, you know, went very carefully with the identity and with the, what was there. That's what was convincing to us. But the second winner, she only worked on the process of the participation, how this hall should come into place, and also what happens afterwards. So this was very interesting. And so. <clears throat> Okay, there was a winner, and I from the beginning said, okay, it's only interesting if it's not only if it ends after the competition, but we continue this project together with the students. Easy said, but then how to do that? So as I said, so the students themselves said, okay, it should not be only a place for, you know, like learning how we know it, um, which we can also do in the library, but of course a place of exchange, of experimenting, of learning by doing, etc., which is actually missing at the TU Darmstadt, where they can learn and do however they think. Um, of course, the, the benefit of that is clear. You know, it's not only problem solution, but yeah, a lot of things can uh, happen on the way. The process is important. Um, by the way, all those slides are just steal from the students, so <laughs> I'm just your representative. Um, so we, or I thought a long time, like how, ca how, how can we do that? How, so it's easily said, okay, the students are doing that, but how do you really do that? Because it's a little bit longer uh, project, a bigger project. It's not just a normal design build that you can you know, pull off in one year and they just go to the construction site. Um, so there is like one core team, the ACA team, um, with uh, me and a uh, um, wissenschaftliche Mitarbeiter and students who are actually um, kind of employed as Hilfswissenschaftler because of course they um, shouldn't work for free. And so we are the core team, um, yeah, really doing the organization of everything and dealing with the everyday thing, having the exchange with the um, engineers, etc. and the Baudezernat. And then of course we want to open it up to the other students and make collaboration with other students. So the idea is that the, the, the red thing is all architecture-wise, the base stuff is dealt by the core team, and then the yellow stuff is uh, dealt with other students in seminars, in, in studios, etc. so that it opens up to the other people. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, we are fully into, into uh, planning, and of course it's also interesting to them to deal with all this. Very important part is also a rule book that the students are doing, a rule book to really define the rules themselves, like what, what are our compliances, so to say, of the hall in the process, but also later on, because the students are changing, right? So how can, you, can we give further um, defining what is important for us? This is a seminar, this is just starting now, we're building chairs for the hall, more to follow. Um, yeah, this is the, the time schedule, so it all should be finished um, next year if it goes well and yeah, integrated with the um, seminars, etc. So then the next really important question for us was, okay, but what, what if the, when the hall is finished? Because then the project is not finished because it's just starting, you know, so we cannot just give it back to the 
hands of the organization of the university it should continue to be in the hands of the students, but how do we do that? What kind of structures um, do we have to form, right? Because of course there's somebody who has to open the door, etc. but there are also some people who have to continue to manage, organize the events, and what is happening, who can do what, etc. and who is doing that, the students, okay, but in what way? Um, so they thought a lot about and looked into um, the different organizations that are already there at the TU Darmstadt, quite, quite interesting, so and what kind of organization we can, you know, maybe log on or be part of, and um, yeah, so actually, sorry, go back, uh, so actually what we are really trying now aiming for, we just had a meeting yesterday, is actually to form an own department, um, that will be the best to be really independent, <laughs> that, um, that then, this is the, the vision, um, can also um, yeah, just be really independent and continue and continue to have also um, teaching formats that deal with these questions of learning, of participation, about uh, students' activities and participation in the campus. And um, this, what we have in the middle, this visioner, um, what we also had before, this can be a professor, but can also be student-led, maybe. So this is all what we are figuring out um, right now. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Johanna, our next... Um, I hope you uh, you like the project. Our next um, um, speaker is um, Camilla Hedegaard Miller from the um, um, Royal Danish Academy for Architecture, Design and Conservation and head of the Strategic Design and Entrepreneurship Program. Uh, it works. It works. All right. Thank you. Um, yes, next 10 minutes it will be in Copenhagen. I will do it very brief. I know it's soon lunch and so on. So this is a picture from the Royal Academy, Royal Danish Academy. We'll see if it works. It's a little slow. i try again. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can help. Is it on? I, I see. Okay. Good. So my name is Camilla. I'm trained as an architect, and that is more than 20 years ago. I'm trained in a completely other manner that I'm training our architects now, I think. Um, after many years in practice and also part-time teaching, I was trained as a researcher, and now I'm an associate professor. I'm also head of strategic design and entrepreneurship, that's a master's program, and I will tell you a little bit more about that later. So, just everybody has said it, but just this is the point of departure. We know that this is the situation. There's an urgent need for the green transition, but also a blue transition. I think you mentioned that many students are looking into issues with water and oceans, right? That's a blue transition. Uh, we also have a shared vision, right, with the new European Bauhaus. Good, that's a point of departure. So, and what I thought was super interesting about your brief was that it's not only about educating architects, but also how we can all upskill and how we can influence and upskill in the building industry as such. Um, and therefore, I'd like to just give you a few examples and maybe also some arguments um, that has to do with collaboration and what I call problem-based teaching or problem-based learning. I think it might be some of the answers that is, that is at least what we are trying to do where I am. And it's, I, I'm only speaking on behalf of our program and not everybody at the Royal uh, Danish Academy, of course. So, uh, yeah, just to give you, just that you know how it looks a little bit like. It's an old art academy, very old. Now it has, um, just to see, yeah, yeah. Very studio based, of course. Every uh, student has their own uh, desk and so on. 
and now the institution has developed into a research and, and of course also a higher level educational institution. At some few years ago, we decided to try something quite different than what we are used to. We decided to make a new master's program together with Copenhagen Business School. I have been working with this for three years, so we have been working, the school has been working with this for five years. So we are, it's a young program, right? Uh, we call it strategic design and entrepreneurship, architecture, design, and business. So what we are actually doing is try to collaborate with the business school, and this means that it's students collaborating, staff collaborating, IT systems collaborating or not, <laughs> study administration collaborating, and so on. It's not super easy, but it's... I, I'm very excited about it. I find it very interesting. This is the best diagram I could come up with until now. Maybe it's a little strange, but this is the way I see what we're doing at the moment. We unify students with bachelor degrees in design and architecture and social science. The business students have very different backgrounds. Uh, economy, branding, communication, organizational development, it could be many, many different things. And this is, in a way, our roots and their roots. And when uh, we meet and they come to us, um, this is, of course, the, the masters. That's for two years. The first year, everything is together. It's all about the interdisciplinary collaboration on many different levels. And the last year, in inclusive the diploma project, is about their own specialization. And it's very directed towards the society and also towards partners, stakeholders outside academia, and of course also what is a meaningful future practice for each student. We're trying to develop, um, I can look down here, yeah. Uh, students with competences in collaboration and teamwork. It's difficult, but they, they after one semester, they, they, uh, they get good at it, I would say. Cross-disciplinary work in many different ways. And also business models, because there's always some kind of a business model in a project. But of course, we are looking into very different business models and entrepreneurship. And it's more like you have a, we, we are trying to foster an entrepreneurial mindset to get a little bit rid of the employee mindset, right? You must go out there and do something. And then data, research before design, always research data before design. And this is where the Business students, the students from social science, they really come in. It's very nice because they are, of course, very trained in this. So we believe that collaboration is the key for impact. And of course, the philosophy here behind this is that no one can solve all the complex problems on their own. So that's the mindset we are trying to work with. So how is it actually done? I'm constantly trying to develop different formats for fostering, facilitating this. Cross-disciplinary group work and field work. Field work is super, super important. Please get out there, look, talk to people, find out how it works. Design sprints, that's the shortest possible collaboration model, three hours, but it ha can have an enormous impact. Semester-long collaboration with design challenges, and also partnerships that can run for, for many years with external um, collaborators. And during the third semester and also the diploma project, we, we ask the students to find their own collaboration partners outside uh, the Royal Danish Academy. And this is very interesting, and we, of course, help them doing that but many of them are able to find the relevant partners in order to include and integrate different kinds of knowledge, as we also heard about earlier this morning. So, it's very important for me to stress 
that we are not only working together with architectural offices, contractors, and so on, but I would say nearly everybody who has a shared interest with us, because we would, of course, like to collaborate with all different kinds of actors in the society. So it can be public institutions, municipalities, NGOs, startup, whatever, you name it. And I'll show you just, uh, this is a project that I, I really love this project. Um, I'm actually out of it now, but I have been working with it for, for many years. We initiated a, a partnership First, it was for three years, but it's still going on with a municipality outside Copenhagen, a non-profit housing organization, and then uh, the Royal Danish Academy, all first-year students for a five-week-long class. Because we have a shared interest, all of us, in new housing typologies, housing areas, and of course, also urban development. So what we did was actually to decide on working with one of uh, and an social housing area outside of Copenhagen. We decided to work with that area as a case. And think about when we are teaching the activity is already financed. So you, in a way you can just move it out of, of your own context into another actor's context or into a shared context. And when you open up the doors, you can invite people into the discussion. In a way, it's not, of course, it takes time to administrate and organize, but it is a financed activity. It's only about moving it and opening it up. And here we moved it into the, the I think it's called a center hall, right? With the municipality. And I showed you the next one. We made, a, made up a studio there. We also discussed the students' findings and projects together with the uh, local politicians, the architects working there, people actually working with the urban development, the inhabitants and so on. It was great fun. We managed to get students into a, 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 a high number of private homes. I could never have done that myself. But the housing organization helped us with that. So we had more than 100 students getting into private homes, making interviews and doing drawings and stuff like that. Very, very interesting. Are we upskilling? I think so. I don't know to what extent, but something is happening. Exchange between different actors, right? And also that organizations and um, Companies, they interact with students, but they also interact with researchers because of a shared interest. Students get insight into real life problems. And I also think that they, of course, they, they are allowed to, in a way, start building a professional network. But it is a shared learning process. And in this case, it was also easier because all of us are non-profit organizations, right? So it, there, are, there are also complications and uh, problems, but this is a, I think it's a good... Uh, this is my last argument. We really need to say goodbye to this kind of assignments. Uh, uh, maybe not on BA, but master's level, we cannot teach nice site, nice program, unlimited resources anymore. Let's just stop. <laughs> I don't want to do that anymore. It's not interesting at all to me. Uh, so why? Why is this problem-based teaching interesting? I was trained like that. I did that for five years or six years. I really enjoyed that, but, but it's, we, it's, we must leave that completely for the master's students at least. I think that real life problems are often shared with others. It's easy to interact because we're interested in the same things. So it calls for collaboration. And students, they also understand how they can influence uh, society and the development. And I, and I have found out that students, they of course they can contribute while studying. And it's also really an empowerment process for them that they find out that they can actually contribute already, that it's not something they must do after studying. Of course, we do that already, and, and we do it together. And of course, it's supervised by us. We help them doing that. 
but something happens when, for students when they find out that, well, I can do something here already, and that is what we want them to do. The problem-based teaching, so where are our problems coming from, we could ask. We are using the, the term or the notion of design challenges uh, from the industry. I think what is important is that a design challenge is always coming with a question, right? There's always a, like a guiding question. The sustainability goals, UN goals, we're also working with that. And, but we can also ask students to identify the global challenges, right? And all of this has to do with focusing on what can architecture actually do, not so much how it looks like, but what can it actually do. So, I'm soon finished here. Another good example how we can, how we can work with real life problems. This is a case of a collaboration with the Danish Plastic Federation. Maybe it's not an obvious uh, sort of it's actor to work with, but we find it super interesting because there's plastic all over. We know that. The Plastic Federation, they have made a survey looking into their own industry, where th and they have documented, mapped out the need for innovation in their industry. And we have translated those needs into design challenges with a creative and critical approach, right? So we cannot just adapt them, we must also change them. And then we made a, 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 an extra question, can we live in a plastic-free world, right? Because of course we must ask that, but the Plastic Federation cannot ask that, right? But we can ask that. And then when students start working with those challenges, it's interesting for us because they're experts. It's interesting for them because they have students and they have critical creative uh, studies into this. Three slides more, then I'll stop. Uh, two very talented students, Matthew and, and Ido, working with the problem with overconsumption of square meters in Denmark, right? All of us, we just want to have bigger, bigger, bigger. We, we want to consume more square meters all the time. It's very nice to have students, non-Danes, to come and tell us, you guys have a problem here. M let's look into how we, can, uh, how we can transform an existing building. And they did that together with a student from the business school who did a wonderful research to back up their work and to challenge their work. Another uh, remarkable student is Nicolas Devine, looking into the question of sea level rise and all of this. But what has really strengthened his project is his capacity to build networks around what he's doing. Here he has mapped out all the actors he's been talking to during his, his studies. And you see, why are they interested in spending time meeting with him more times, discussing it? It's because it's relevant to them what he's studying, and therefore he's actually able to have this interaction with, uh, with different kind of actors out there and integ integrate different perspectives and so on and so on. The last one, um, also a wonderful student, this was for her for diploma, uh, Claire Johnson. She was looking, with, uh, looking into the renovation wave, also as a, like a big agenda, D discussed what could it mean in a Danish uh, context. And a part of what she, what she did was a public um, online seminar, webinar, where she discussed her studies together with different experts and so on. And I was surprised because there were so many from the industry participating in the debate, listening to it. So in a way, the communication, this format of knowledge exchange was a part of her master thesis project. Of course, Corona and all of that, but I still think it was a, it's a good example what happens if you work problem-based and focus on collaboration. This is what I have seen until now. The answer is very, very seldom a new building. None of our students are proposing new buildings. Yeah. 
that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Camilla. I, I see also um, a resonance between uh, your lecture and uh, the, the lecture from the, our super students as well. Uh, so I, I think it's very uh, interesting. Um, okay, the next one is uh, Václav Sareko from uh, the Wroclaw University of Science and Technology. And technology. Uh, Václav, this is the, your mic. Hello. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Václav Szarejko. Uh, I'm assistant professor of Wrocław University of uh, uh, Science and Technology. I'm uh, ISO vice chairman of the, the Professional Practice Conditions Committee of the National Chamber of Polish Architects. Uh, okay. Organiz uh, the organizers the organizers asked us for a brief statement about the impact of uh, implementation of new European Bauhaus uh, uh, initiative on the practice of uh, the architect's uh, profession. To answer this question, we must go back uh, about 100 years ago uh, to the founding of the first Bauhaus, an initiative that was the first in history to re-engineer uh, the design process and formulate design principles to, that were popular, popularis, popularized uh, worldwide. Uh, those principles laid the foundation for rebuilding Europe after the Second uh, uh, World War uh, in, the, in the mid of 20th century. Uh, and according to Frank Duffy, for, former president of ACE, uh, also former president of uh, Royal Institute of, of British Architects, uh, and uh, godfather of uh, mo modern office design, uh, uh, Frank Duffy uh, sa uh, uh, said uh, in this client-driven uh, market, where the architect played one of the most critical role uh, in, the, in the design process, in the, in the building process, uh, it was the uh, one of the. Um, it, it, uh, it was the best time of architect uh, of the position of the architect as a uh, <clears throat> as a classic professional creating the new post-war reality. Many believe that uh, this was the best period in the history of the architect architectural prof professions. So, but uh, nothing lasts forever, and starting from the 1970s, there, uh, there has been a significant change in the investment process, where the general contractor begins to have the most influence by optimizing construction for the lowest price. In such situation, uh, the architect had two options, become a brilliant designer of forms, which applies only to a few percent of architects, or become a cheap labor force, uh, uh, needed to an ambitious design of uh, repetitive objects uh, and carrying out the administrative process. Some argue uh, that uh, it is the worst moment in the history of the architecture, act architectural profession, which has been relegated to working on behalf of the gen general contractor and the only factor that matters in their uh, work is the uh, lowest price. Uh, this situation kills uh, creativity and innovation in the practice of uh, architects, uh, architectural profession, especially in understanding the needs of uh, users. This phenomenon negatively affects uh, the entire built environment, uh, making it non-functional, inflexible, and uneconomical in use. Okay. Uh, the answer to this challenge is the idea of the new European Bauhaus, uh, returning to the roots of the architect's profession, understood as translating the user needs into the language of architecture. The correctness of this approach is evidenced by uh, what has happened in the area of office building design, uh, where research on existing office buildings has led to entirely new office design methods, 
As a result, office buildings today are almost half the size, cheaper, and much better adapted to the user needs than ever before. What's more, uh, offices today are uh, much more beautiful than they were 20 years ago. Uh, this involves uh, a significant change in the practice of the profession. The architect must be, the new type of architect, must be equipped in, uh, with two types of knowledge. Uh, knowledge of how to analyze and incorporate uh, user needs into design. Remember that this, uh, uh, needs have changed uh, significantly due to the technological revolution in uh, recent years. The architect also needs knowledge about how buildings meet or fail to meet uh, user requirements. A database of case studies of buildings, both good and uh, bad, is required uh, for this. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the answer to this needs is the Nebinar Workshop program, uh, program designed to provide students and young architects knowledge about uh, new, European, new European Bauhaus design methodology uh, and uh, uh, building the database of case studies of projects implemented in various parts of Europe. Uh, the Nebinar is a um, New European Bauhaus AC initiative for students and young architects, and it's a joint venture of AC and Wrocław University of Technology, implemented with the participation of partners from all over the Europe. Uh, led by uh, the steering group of architects and academics, the program consists of a series of online lectures and workshops uh, uh, with the targeted uh, audiences from Poland, uh, Hungary, Slovakia, Romania, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Czech Republic, Hungary, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Romania and Ireland. <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, the invited speakers, uh, practicing, practicing architects, lecturers, researchers as well uh, other uh, cultural professionals, uh, we think we'll work on uh, the application of the new European Bauhaus principles underlined by the slogan beautiful, sustainable, together. Uh, the series of lectures of... Uh, uh, the series of uh, lectures uh, and workshops are designed as an interact in interactive process and builds up on the experiences of the co-creation process of the new European Bauhaus initiated in 2020. Uh, Nebinar is divided uh, into three semesters. The first two are lectures and discussions introducing the subjects of New European Bauhaus uh, and preparing to, for the workshops that will take place in the third semester. Uh, every month, uh, starting from uh, last, month, uh, last month, we plan to organize a remote meeting, uh, remote meeting cons consisting of two, uh, three parts. Uh, Nebinar pairs, uh, TEDx-style presentations prepared by organizers and partners. Uh, Nebinar shells, uh, lecture, uh, lectures of invited uh, professionals. And webinar bites uh, presentations of the students and young architects and the moderate uh, and last last but not least uh, moderated uh, uh, discussion. Uh, while the webinar pearl examine, examines the seeds of the new European Bauhaus initiative and the value tools like the new European Bauhaus uh, uh, quality system. Uh, new, European, new European Bauhaus Compass and, uh, and the Davos quality system. Uh, the webinar shell will uh, identify the good practice cases and uh, their theoretical and contextual grounding. And the webinar bite, bites uh, will chart the hotspots, location, problems, and future projects. Uh, so you can see uh, some some uh, uh, programs of the. the this, it's a program of first session. Uh, the poster of the first session. Uh, so, if, if you try to read uh, the program, uh, uh, you can see that that's kind of uh, co-learning and co-teaching uh, um, Bauhaus, uh, uh, New European Bauhaus Compass. It's not so easy as we thought in the first uh, at the first look. Uh, 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 at 
at the end of the day, uh, after, 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 after uh, all the program, uh, we'll have a library of uh, about uh, 15 uh, lectures, uh, uh, about uh, 15 moderated uh, discussions uh, will be after the meeting, uh, organ or or organizers meeting in Wrocław in, in, uh, in next month, I think. Uh, will be also uh, after the final meeting uh, combined with an exhibition of uh, discussions uh, on the uh, diverse perceptions of the ideas of uh, New European and Bauhaus in different countries of Eastern and Central uh, Europe. Uh, it will be in the next year. We also uh, will be a part of, of a commun community of, of, of a community, community of, uh, of participants. And uh, we are sure that we'll be will be present for will be will be ready for for the next next uh, challenges. Uh, uh, the program is ded uh, dedicated to young architects and architecture students. Uh, however, we assume that uh, open formula of of uh, webinar. Uh, uh, give the possibility f uh, to, to, to join for, 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 for every of us, I think. Uh, I would like to... Uh, uh, so, <laughs> uh, the, 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 the main aim of the, of the program is to dis disseminate knowledge about the European Bauhaus to a wide audience, especially about uh, young architects. The program is mainly dedicated to, uh, in particular to the V4 group uh, and for the Baltic and Balkan countries. But uh, uh, the open formula doesn't exclude the participation of organization from uh, other European countries. And to close the loop, uh, we hope that in the long run, this program uh, will enable the young architects to practice the profession in the formula architect, re architect researcher the, or, or in other uh, new formulas of uh, uh, architect uh, as, a, as a moderator, as a facilitator, as an as a advocate maybe, uh, rather than just uh, architect creator or worse, uh, chip architect, which is very popular today. Uh, uh, it's 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 a uh, small thank you for for our gang gangsta squad, which was uh, involved in organization of the of the of the of the webinar. I would like to take this opportunity to invite you to uh, collaborate on the further in implementation of our program, which is uh, open to all universities in the EU. So. Thank you very much, and uh, once again, thank you. I, I, I invite you to, to our webinar. Thank you, Václav. Uh, just a little bit more, and then we are done for the morning. Okay, our next... Um, uh, the last presenter for the morning session is uh, Professor Massimo Santanicchia from uh, Iceland University of the Arts. Where's the microphone? Where is it? This. Just spread the green. Yeah. Yep. Green. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you, and thank you to Marcelle Rabinovich for hosting us, to Ruf Shagman and to Ayatelai Frank to have organized this wonderful event. So I'm here to talk about cosmopolitanism and citizenship and architectural education. And I'm also using this occasion to invite you all to further continue thinking about these topics together, uh, um, in, so inviting you coming to Reykjavik in June uh, 2023. But Fundamentally, today we are here to discuss and celebrate the purpose of a new European Bauhaus that is to deliver for a beautiful, sustainable, and inclusive built environment. So we are here to share concerns, intentions, and ideas on how we can educate future architects achieving these ambitions. So I'm here uh, biased in, from my standpoint, the one from the Iceland University of the Arts, 
and I'm here also to, uh, in a way, share with you how we are using the concept and the theory of a cosmopolitan citizenship architectural education to further advance the meaning and scope of architectural education. I want to clarify the terms uh, used. So cosmopolitan is, is the concept of, from the Greek, cosmopolites, the citizen of the world, while citizenship is both a juridical status and a political agency which positions everyone in terms of rights and responsibilities into a larger societal context. So UNESCO uh, defines cosmopolitan citizenship education as the acquisition of knowledge, skills, attitude, values, and behaviors necessary to become active promoters of a more peaceful, tolerant, inclusive, secure, and sustainable societies. So we have talked this morning about skills, we have talked about knowledge, but there, are, there is also more, in, more to that, which is really the behavior and the attitude necessary. So this type of education is based on three domains of learning, the domain of the cognitive, which is very much about acquiring a knowledge, but it is also the domain of the social emotional, which is acquiring a sense of belonging to a common humanity, sharing values and responsibilities. And then there is the behavioral, that is very much about activating, acting effectively at a local and national and global level. So, um, now let's dive more into architectural education. And I want to e explain, first of all, the genesis of this concept and then talk about a language and a pedagogy that is um, necessary to activate it. Uh, since 2018, uh, I have been asking uh, three fundamental questions which were at the base of my PhD. Uh, and these questions were, uh, what skills should students have after studying architecture? How should these skills be taught? And how can architectural education be of special importance to our society? I explain skill, again, not only as an expertise, as the ability to do something, but again, as the combination of knowledge, attitude, values, and behaviors that are cons considered vital to becoming an architect. These questions were asked uh, within my university, the Iceland University of the Arts, but also they were asked uh, in, um, into a larger uh, network, the one of the Nordic Baltic Academy of Architecture. This is a network of 19 schools of architecture from the Nordic Baltic countries, where eight different languages are spoken. And we talk about Iceland, uh, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. So this, the theory of cosmopolitan citizenship education is born within the Nordic Baltic co context. And what emerged from the many, many conversation with the Nordic Baltic colleagues, students, and educator, is the shared conviction to use architectural education, first of all, as a collaborative project, a project that is aimed to develop critical thinking, that is the capacity to question everything. It is about social awareness. It is about using architectural education to understand our world, what we see. It is about self-reflection, which is very much about assessing the impact of our design choice on others. And then it's imagination, what we often call creativity, but it is also about the capacity to conceive and represent what is not there yet. And then the, the last one, and probably the most important, is the one of action, which is the ability to pursue your ideas beyond the school limits, but also the ability to continue learning, which is about learning to learn for the rest of your life. So these traits that came out from, this, um, from these interviews, I think they both match the one of the, uh, of the global citizenship education, the one indicated by UNESCO, which is again the cognitive about the knowing, the social emotional responsibilities, and the behavioral, which is the acting. But also in a more, uh, in a way, entrepreneurial world, I think this also resonates strongly with the 2025 top skills indicated by the World Economic Forum which are uh, um, skills of collaboration, which is working with people, critical thinking, very much about problem solving, design development, the use of technology, and how this can influence our design choices, and then self-management, which is both about acting, but also uh, continuous education. 
So to me, this Nordic Baltic voices explain architectural education as a complex, multidisciplinary, collaborative project to advance the knowledge, traits, attitudes, values, and behavior, behaviors necessary to respond on one side to global challenges, but also uh, we use the time of education uh, as, uh, um, to create the condition for students and their educators to locally engage as active citizens in their community. So our, um, it is this combination of, uh, of global awareness and a sense of belonging to the world, but also a, a sense of duty and responsibility towards our most immediate uh, community that the theory of cosmopolitan citizenship uh, is born from. As any other theory, uh, mm, this is not a neutral nor objective uh, theory. Uh, theories always reflect authors' in interest in their historical context. So this theory reflects, first of all, my own interest, which is obviously in architectural education, but also a larger historical context, the context of the ongoing uh, ecological destruction, of the rampant social inequalities, of the struggle of the asylum seekers, of the disrespect for human rights or for life, and also indifference towards the pain of the others. So to me, these are matters that should be at the core of education and architectural education in particular, but often they are not. So uh, I was very happy and inspired to hear a, a Camille from KDK uh, talking about uh, their program. With Niyang, uh, already in 1968, addressing a, a crowd of architects said, you are not a profession that has distinguished itself by your social and civil contributions to the cause of civil rights. You are most distinguished by your thunderous silence and your complete irrelevance. So I think it's very much time to change this uh, perception. Uh, and I believe, I'm really a firmly believer that change starts very much from education. So we all have a responsibility as educators because schools are always the place where the discourse of architecture is formed and divulged and is the, are the places where the ethos of a profession is born. And therefore, a theory uh, has an, an, a direction, has a purpose, an orientation, and the one of cosmopolitan citizenship is about helping students and educators cultivating a language and activating a pedagogy capable of advancing new political agencies to co-design healthier, safer, and a fairer world in a changing social, ecological, and political environment. A language capable of addressing and responding to the challenges of today's world, and a pedagogy capable of guiding the design studios, which at least in the Nordic Baltic uh, um, arena is really the backbone of architectural education into learning platforms more inclusive of different epistemologies and ontologies. So when it comes to a language, this language first re needs uh, to recognize that architecture is a practice that transcends the design of buildings to include the processes of thinking, theorizing, and writing that relate humans and their environment. But it is also about recognizing that architecture is a holistic practice receptive of the arts and humanity, science and technology, and new social, technological, and ecological challenges. And as such, architecture is really never a private matter between the architect and the client. There is always a societal investment. So rather than calling it with a singular name, architecture, in my school we tend to talk about architectures as plural, diverse, inclusive practices that can be used in multiple ways. We can use architecture as a critical process of inquiry, to, to, as a vehicle for raising social awareness, as a tool for imagining and advancing agendas of social justice, and also as a collaborative project for designing um, how we live together. So this language, again, helps students acquire a larger vocabulary of concepts and ideas that can be used to expand the architectural discourse beyond form, redefining what architectures are and disclosing the wondrous possibilities of what architectures can do. 
since we have mentioned this policy in Europe, <laughs> I think this language can further enrich also legislation. As you know, we are confronted with 11 professional qualification directives. Maybe we could add one more, directive number 12, that could read as such, maybe an understanding that architecture is about how we live harmoniously together, and as such, architects carry the ethical responsibility as cosmopolitan citizens to care for the others and for the present and future global community of human beings and earthlings. Why not? And when it comes to the pedagogy, uh, I want to conclude that uh, uh, each design studio that we start in, at the Iceland University of the Arts starts with fundamentally two questions. What are the politics of your design and what is the design of your politics? The first question is very much about uh, understanding the issue that we want to deal, what is the problem, it's about problem, pay, uh, problem posing, it, it is about stating why is it important and why design work is needed. As we say, not always the bridge is the solution to cross a river. There could be something, something else. So we are open also to live without architecture if architecture is considered only as an artifact. <clears throat> and then the second is what is the design of your politics? So how the design work deals with the issue and how does it affect the world? Politics and design are inextricably linked as they both necessitate Sub, uh, collaborative processes, inclusive of different voices, interests, and multiple standpoints, if they aim to support the uh, new European Bauhaus principles that is beautiful, sustainable, inclusive, but I think most importantly also a just built environment. So together, this language and pedagogy for cosmopolitan citizenship provides instrument to pursue the two fundamental purposes of architectural education, the one stated by the International Union of Architects, which I find them extraordinary, important, and yet not often discussed. And these, uh, the two purposes are the one to produce competent, creative, critically minded, and ethical professional designers, builders, builders and to produce good world citizens who are intellectually mature, ecologically sensitive, and socially responsible. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Massimo. Really very um, uh, inspiring and reflective uh, 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 lecture, right the kind we need to end uh, the morning session. Um, thank you all. Thank, thanks to our uh, online audience. Uh, we will be back um, a, uh, at half past two. Um, um, and for the for the uh, uh, people in the hall, um, do we have? Yeah. Okay. So we we've organized. There, there are two things happening at the same time: lunch and the preview of the of the school's exhibition, which opens uh, this evening. So um, we. Basically, the idea is to reduce the to see the exhibition and also to reduce the the, the stampedo to the to the lunch. It's, uh, the lunch will be served here in the foyer, very relatively small. So, if your last name is from A to L, please go to the lunch. And if your last name is from M to Z, so the second group, please go to the uh, exhibition. Uh, do, we, do we do we have the Philippe, with, with, here with us we have uh, Philippe de Clerc, who is professor at the school and curator of the exhibition. So the second group he will take through the exhibition. And then we swap in 45 minutes. Is it okay? Lunch is outside and the, and, and the, and the exhibition is just behind that. So please don't get lost on, on the way. Okay. Swap in 45 minutes and see you at half past two. Thank you.
Okay, so my my th I can I can yeah yeah you can you can start. Hello, good afternoon. Please take your seats. I'm sure our online audience is very impatient to see what we have prepared for them for this afternoon. Okay, um, thank you. So we start the afternoon part of our conference today with uh, Rachel Armstrong's keynote lecture, but before we uh, I introduce her, just two um, uh, small things. Um, Doug told me that some of you are asking about the transfer to Villa Ampin. So in, in case you are thinking of um, um, uh, taking a short break uh, in, during the, the afternoon part, the buses will start uh, from here, quarter to six. You have to be here quarter to six, maybe uh, so for the organization. There will be three buses taking us directly to there. It's not that close. And then the, the return is secure uh, for 9 uh, p.m. from Villa Empan to Place Chatelain, which is close to here. So, and we'll give, at the end, we'll give some more directions, but buses will be um, somewhere here. Um, and there was also a question about uh, the address of tomorrow's meeting, and we'll, we'll show it that uh, uh, later on for, for those of you who, who don't know how to get there, for the Dean Summit, right? The, the ACE General Assembly is here tomorrow as well. Okay, so uh, Rachel Armstrong, uh, our second uh, the, the afternoon keynote lecture. Rachel is Professor of Design Driven Construction for Regenerative Architecture in the Department and Faculty of Architecture at Catholic University in Leuven. She combines academic practice with commercial innovation skills to ambitiously bring together radically different disciplines, stakeholders, and uptake communities with the specific intention of designing and engineering living technologies. Her work examines how it's possible to harness the properties of living systems and scale them up to generate environmental solutions in the built environment. She calls the synthesis that occurs between these systems and their inhabitants living architecture. Collaboratively working across disciplines, she builds and develops design-led prototypes that couple the computational properties of the natural world. Often working with radically multidisciplinary and cross-sectoral teams, her award-winning work has been exhibited internationally. Please, uh, uh, well, let's welcome Rachel Armstrong to the stand. Rachel. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Fantastic. That was a lovely warm welcome. So um, uh, I hope you've had a lovely lunch as, as well. Um, I want to talk to you today about innovation in culture and creativity, because whether we like it or not, the world has changed, and there's no going back. The coronavirus pandemic has shown us in accelerated time what an environmentally toxic world looks like and feels like. And so now we must rethink how we have organized our world, including how our most basic needs are met, from water to food to energy, transport. 
and also how we can invest in the very foundations of change, our education and employment systems. So our changed world forces us to adapt. Digital tools under the duress of the pandemic enabled us to connect in ways that we previously struggled to adopt. And as people vacated public spaces, we experienced a first-hand sobering glimpse of a greener future where people and nature can peacefully coexist. And being agents of the polis, the remit of the architecture profession in this milieu, extends into realms where communities renegotiate their relationship with the natural world and with each other. And while the noise from industrial modernism has been turned right down, it becomes possible to think from first principles about the production of space and its many facets. So then, how can architects be equipped for this new era that is full of contradictions, good intentions, uncertainties, conflict, inequalities, cultural diversity, and displacement of populations? Contributing to 40% of total global carbon emissions, the endeavor to generate new forms of knowledge than those that produced industrial modernist paradigms is pressing and already underway, as we've seen in many of the presentations today. New approaches that build resilience into the very fabrics of our living spaces have required a concentrated effort from governments, businesses, civil society, and individuals. And one solution does not fit all. And spatial proposals may not even be a building. Certainly, by all, uh, by all impressions this morning, not a new one. So how do we then select, develop, and explore the most appropriate new forms of knowledge and practice paradigms? So the critical issues faced by the profession are more than those conventionally recognized as being part of an architectural training and possess an important ethical dimension that seeks to empower communities to effectively respond to rapid, rapid ongoing challenges under a range of different approaches that fulfill sustainable development goals. So how then do we teach a generation of leaders and practitioners that will need skill, skills that we don't yet fully practice or understand ourselves? Well, I think that the proceedings today have shown us that perhaps in the next generation is gonna teach us and our job is to hold the door wide open for their explorations and support them in becoming leaders as well as excellent professionals. And at the heart of this is research and innovation. And I think it is clear that the architectural profession of the 21st century is a very different creature than typified by the 20th century. Throughout the ages, new types of architecture have characterized different forms of human development, which are built on different value systems with a wide range of agendas, some more homogeneous than others. And a vision today is needed that the profession and society can unite behind, where we find unity and with that strength, creativity, companionship through diversity. These are no utopias. So to truly activate the full potential of architecture, the idea that innovation itself within architecture must itself be innovated, so that a new transdisciplinary synthesis is achieved that reaches all actors within spatial proposals, an ambitious proposal that is characteristic of a renaissance. Now, the nature of innovation, however, within broader society largely remains underexplored. Conventionally, it's the territory of science, engineering, and commerce, and it is constrained by those dominant paradigms and marketplaces, the benchmark of the neoliberal evaluation. And money and the market cannot and does not ethically assess its own practices or methods. So to activate the full potential of our creativity through innovation requires more than traditional architectural agendas and may also include different economic models, disruptive technology paradigms, novel forms of authorship, 
co-participation, human and non-human, new kinds of literacy, a range of different experiences, a varied cultural milieu, and theories of change. Collectively, these perspectives can enable new capabilities to rebalance the distribution of and access to resources within our living spaces. And there should be space for these parameters within in an architectural curriculum. So through spatial agendas, the choreography of matter, body, and time within a range of spatial proposals does not always result in built constructions. This allows architects to imagine, invent, evolve, and embrace a changing world. So whilst the Industrial Revolution brought railways and skyscrapers, and late modernity brought the airport and shopping mall, the emerging ecological era must also invent forms and types of architecture that address today's critical challenges, such as climate change and natural disasters. And of course, there are precedents. For example, in the San Francisco earthquake series by Lebius Woods, or in his Sarajevo series on war. And at the time, these proposals were dismissed as paper architecture, unbuildable. But today, in this uh, conference today, we've seen equally unconventional perspectives presented by our young architects, which are not uncommonplace in the studio. And they are also raising just as challenging agendas as Woods was and other architects before him, which are asking, for example, how our constructed spaces can be fundamentally regenerative, restorative, inclusive, and bioremediating. And the types of buildings that can accommodate all these programs do not yet exist. So an emerging range of innovations are looming and starting to change the idea of what buildings could be or what spatial programs could incorporate and also what comprises exemplary, exemplary architecture. Aesthetics, is that always the end goal or is that something that is embodied in a coherent and well-executed proposal? Are they separable? Um, and I think this is both happening in the studio and in emerging new practices today, where things like nature-based solutions are being adopted to align better with the natural world. So we're seeing things like the rise of new materials. Uh, we're seeing the emergence of new kinds of uh, microbial building services. Uh, along with different modes of production, precision robots, digital manufacturing, rapid prototyping, laser cutting, and many more. Even the media for the practice of architecture have changed with the engagement with new spaces, artificial intelligences, virtual and augmented domains, and data here is the primary construction material. So when judiciously applied and powered, digital technologies can also assist us with meeting the challenges of a changed world, including how we conduct research itself, which includes things like the emergence of digital twins. So whilst often described as virtual, the smartness associated with the digital realm is always coupled somewhere along the process with matter, where energy is coupled with information, resulting in material transformation, which includes all kinds of power sources, as well as real-world activities that are enabled by these approaches. So the critical reflection on our unfolding situation is re-articulating established architectural relationships, like Barnabas Calder's notion that form follows fuel. So with energy rather than function at the heart of a new architecture, the value of vernacular architecture and traditional buildings become an active part of contemporary practices, and not just histor historical artifacts that are facing erasure, to form an active basis for our cultural heritage. Importantly, the clear distinction between the building and landscape is blurred, where the indoors and outdoors are meeting in many kinds of encounters, where the living realm penetrates our habitats and even our bodies. We are also facing challenges of scale that simultaneously range from the very tiny to the cosmic. And at times of change, 
the psychological and experiential dimensions to space are also paramount to good design, where building is not a totality, but an expression of larger, coherent worlds or worlds. Beyond architecture, where there is no one kind of architectural solution, new kinds of shared spaces and commons are needed where preparations for resilient critical infrastructure are organized at a societal level, which must consider the complex interactions between social organizations, economics, and technology. Additionally, new forms of economy, like microeconomics, are emerging that decenter the cent centrality of capital to activate new kinds of transactions that are centered on the home and the commons, rather than the city and uh, the government. Such economies enable us to, for example, manage our energy production and consumption as a form of bartering, using a whole range of strategy from managing waste streams and compost to developing precision gardening and using blockchain to build transactional communities of trust. We will also need to make difficult choices about how we use our resources, shifting towards more sustainable forms of energy and production, and adopting new approaches to planning and decision-making, which will require well-articulated shared values, where the role of new technologies and research is actively engaged in this process to assist society in responding fast enough and judiciously enough to difficulties such as global supply chains and critical local events. This morning, we had a glimpse of what this innovation might be. And this afternoon, we will encounter some examples of how such values are being explored in practice by Raul Pantaleo, who I'm really happy he's here today, architect and co-founder of Tam Associati, and he had Syed uh, from Biome, who re represents some of the very best and creative examples of what these emerging new kinds of architecture can be. So how do we explore these forms of innovation? Well, I would now like to introduce you to the EIT, uh, Culture and Creativity, Knowledge and Innovation Community. And it's recently founded and positioned at the heart of change within the creative and cultural sectors. You may or may not have heard about this. It was um, uh, founded uh, formally at the beginning of April. Um, and so what I'd like to do is just really uh, make an introduction um, into the EITC and C, which is a, um, a characteristic uh, European uh, acronym, so EITC and C. Um, I'm going to introduce who we are, who, who is the uh, knowledge community that we're introducing you to, what do we do, and how might you get involved? So, who are we? Well, uh, we are a knowledge and innovation community, and essentially we are very big. Uh, we're the, the biggest one, I think, in um, Europe. It's supported by the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, which is a body of the European Union. Um, and we're one with the latest in one of the nine um, innovation communities covering different sectors and global challenges. Um, yeah, we're, we're part of this very big uh, uh, innovation community, and together there are over 3,000 3, partners from universities, research organizations, and businesses. So that's the knowledge uh, triangle that squares academia, uh, business, and research. And we're a game changer for unlocking the latent value of the cultural and creative sectors and industries uh, to drive specifically Europe's green digital and social transformations. Uh, I think very importantly, because we are placed in culture and uh, creativity, it's important that uh, we support diverse and inclusive types of organizations and subsectors from Europe and beyond. And that we're open to both individual artists and architects, professional students and entrepreneurs, as well as big corporations. Um, there is a, a very good structure in place, which is a real fit for purpose uh, structure. Uh, that's also value-driven, um, uh, and um, the kinds of work that we will be supporting uh, will be conducive with what we think are the, uh, uh, the, the knowledge innovation community's core principles. 
Um, because it's so big, uh, there is a presence across uh, Europe, and these are at the co-location centres, um, and there are different subsidiaries across Europe, so you'd be able to get in touch with your local subsidiary. Um, and um, essentially, the, a whole range of outputs from the cultural and creative sector uh, are supported from goods uh, to values and business models. So novel business models would actually be something that we'd be very interested in supporting. Um, this is also a way of really trying to think about uh, what innovation in culture and creativity might be. Um, uh, leading to forms of transformation, whether those are societal, whether that is product-based, whether it is a methodological one. Um, we're really looking to harness creativity and culture right at the heart of innovation. I think this is really a breakthrough in terms of how Europe sees uh, the innovation process uh, to be able to combine uh, creatives and uh, culture, you know, at the heart of you know what we would normally think of being science, engineering, and business orientated. The focus will be on some high impact areas, and you'll be very pleased to know that uh, one of those is fashion, but the next one is buildings. So we're, we're definitely very interested in. Um, uh, uh, how the built environment within Europe um, can be creatively transformed and innovated. Um, we're really also looking at other kinds of uh, forms of artistic and cultural practice, including the digital sectors, um, with rethinking value chains, uh, product and service design. And also, I think a very important one for us as well is cultural heritage that in the desire for change and adaptation, we do not erase our core values and the things that we hold dear. So that really is part of our, uh, of, of, of our um, uh, principles. So what do we do in order to achieve this? Um, well, we are supporting quite a broad range of activities, given that culture and creativity is that diverse. So this does include, relevant to this uh, uh, conference today, uh, novel higher education programs, including master's, PhDs, and long life learning courses. Yes. Um, but also other forms of innovation, so projects, businesses and ventures, um, initiatives strengthening cultural uh, identities and values, and also there will be some uh, flagship initiatives that we really want to drive forward to be able to uh, you know, uh, make our sustainable impacts. Typically, you know, we, we like to have um, uh, strategic objectives uh, so that we can meet our um, deliverables and benchmark our progress. So as you can see, education features very prominently within uh, the innovation process uh, as well as uh, creation. But really for society and systems, we really want the whole chain of transformation to be uh, included. Um, through these strategic ob objectives, we're going to uh, create a range of action programs. Um, and this will include, number one, education. Um, so we're really looking to support forms of interdisciplinary education for future-proofing uh, the skill sets of students and professionals. As I said a bit earlier, I really think this is about supporting them uh, to uh, become leaders in their respective uh, domains. Um, also, uh, really thinking about what innovation means within the cultural and uh, creative spaces, uh, whether that is uh, products and services, or whether that's experience-based, or whether you can think of something else that doesn't really fit into the categories <laughs> that, that, that we've proposed. Um, creation is really um, at, the, at the heart of this. How do we make together? How do we live together? How do we um, transfer the knowledge that we share together in order to create this kind of societal change? And also think about what are the economics involved with that? The marketplace being the, um, let's say, the uh, overarching principle to most uh, governments' uh, policies uh, is certainly featuring, but other forms of economics, I think, particularly within this uh, knowledge innovation community, are really up for grabs. So it would be really great to be able to experiment with what is possible. 
Um, also, um, creating value-based cultural um, entrepreneurships, so particularly because many of our community are uh, startups and uh, SMEs, small medium enterprises, um, so we'd like to give them uh, a lot of support. Uh, but also we are moving on to um, systems uh, for developing European-wide um, ecosystems uh, that leverage all this uh, innovation and uh, community formation. So uh, I'll just quickly go through the flagship initiatives. These are essentially fora through which uh, particular kinds of skill sets and resources uh, can be channeled and coordinated. So we have the Engagement Forum, the Investment Club and the Policy Club um, and the, the Next Renaissance Club, which is really about re thinking um, uh, about the future of, of innovation, culture and creativity within Europe. So the Engagement Forum is really about... Um, uh, building uh, skills for innovation, so things like access to resources, networks, um, and introductions to um, uh, recruiters and, and like-minded communities that can support each other. Um, oops. Uh, and then we have the investment club, um, which again is really open to investors at all levels, um, looking at investment opportunities across Europe and valuable insights into opportunities for investor training. So uh, really skills are at the heart of this because many people in the cultural creative sectors uh, do not have a background in economics. So being able to provide that critical support is, is key. And so that also uh, leads to the policy club, which you know, really helps support and in initiate innovation in these policies, frameworks, um, incentives and regulation regimes uh, for the sector um, by really kind of supporting that process. Um, and then the next renaissance really is um, an environment uh, which is really taking the ideas from the creative and cultural communities um, that supports uh, very specific kinds of calls, uh, really looking for creative solutions to some of our biggest challenges. Um, and it will also feature um, exhibitions and really become a showcase uh, for this uh, diverse sector uh, throughout Europe. And um, essentially, uh, we really want you to get involved. So you can get involved as individuals or organizations. Uh, we've currently got an open call for proposals. Uh, I think that was launched just over a week ago, maybe about 10 days ago. Um, there are calls for papers for the next renaissance, which is really about your you know, theoretical and kind of framework-based uh, approaches, which can be shared and published. Um, you can join the, uh, some of the policy and investment clubs. Um, and become a, a member of the organization. So these are the uh, local branches here. I can give you the um, uh, email addresses if you have missed it on the, on the slides, um, if you come and see me. Um, I would uh, very much invite you to uh, also go to the uh, Power of Creativity call for proposals. One of those at least is uh, calling out for architecture, and I think it's absolutely uh, within your remit to respond and help Europe uh, unleash its uh, true and rich potential. So um, that's the last slide. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you will join us and I hope you have as fabulous an afternoon as we did this morning. So uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to speak here and please join the EITCNC. Uh, thank you, Rachel, for the, uh, the, the keynote lecture of the afternoon, uh, and I hope the, um, the invitation will bring many. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so we are uh, starting with the, uh, the first uh, group session of the afternoon. Um, the topic of the the session will be basically to see some of the ongoing research projects um, that ACE is partner uh, in, and not just ACE, well, ACE is one of the partners in, in, um, in both of the projects, and EAA as well. Uh, the first one is um, uh, Leslie Petitjean, uh, who is Circular Economy Senior Officer at ICLEI. 
uh, Clay Europe, and she will present the Basgo Circular uh, Project. Leslie is an expert in public local policies for ecological transition and has worked on many projects dealing with circular economy in the construction sector. So, Leslie, uh, do you need the. Um... Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, you hear me? Yeah, okay. All right. So, yeah, first of all, this one? Yes. All right. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, actually, I have some slides, but I will uh, give a, a short introduction about myself because, yeah, I'm working uh, in ICLE uh, as a circular economy officer, and as I'm specialized in the construction sector, so that's why I'm here today. So I am not an architect. I don't, I don't have background. Uh, in architecture, but I work with architect and I worked with architect because uh, ICLE is actually a network of uh, local authorities. I am based uh, in the European Secretariat and before this I used to work as a circular economy officer in a French uh, local authority for several years and so that's where my experience uh, comes from. So when I joined ICLE as a circular economy officer in the specialized in the built environment, um, I joined also the project Bus Go Circular. So actually you can see also the board here from Bus Go Circular. Basically uh, what Bus Go Circular is and tries, is trying to do is to overcome the challenge that all the different actors of the value chain uh, are, faced, are facing. Um, to the circular transition in the built environment. So I, I know that today we are more talking about the sustainable transition of the built environment and how we can reskill and upskill the workforce. And circularity is just a small uh, aspect of it, but still it's quite an interesting one. And I think we can really uh, do the parallel with the, the bigger picture, I would say. Because actually, if I have to highlight what skills are necessary to do this transition, I think they will be mostly the same than with like the sustainable transition. Sorry. So, what I would highlight is actually first of all the soft skills that are necessary. I think, but it has been uh, highlighted uh, th this morning. Um, when a, an important point is actually the collaboration and to be able um, to collaborate along the project, first at the early stage of the project. I, I think this is actually really key um, because if I um, just if I, if I picture this with some project I used to work on when I was in, in my former local authority. So if we want to design some circular building, we actually need some architect that can propose this kind of reuse material in our building. And also when we were about to demolish one building, we really need also this expertise to let them know, okay, you can, for instance, reuse this material for this purpose. So maybe a door will be a window or I don't know, like you can imagine different purpose, but we really need to have this mindset and I can witness that we are not here yet, definitely. And this is not just about the architects, it's obviously for all the different steps of the value chain. So for instance, the demolition company, they also have to reskill and upskill uh, in this direction. So maybe to focus a bit more on Busgo Circular, we are actually developing different tools uh, to help actually the different uh, uh, yeah, blue colors and work uh, and white colors along the value chain to upskill and reskill. Um, so we are developing actually. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So this is basically all the value chain that you can see uh, in this picture with the blue color and um, the white color. Um, we are actually developing. Um, so yeah. I don't know if you know this app. This is an app that has been developed um, in the Build Up Skills uh, Initiative. And now we are developing um, 
a module uh, specialized in uh, circularity, and this module actually uh, aims at evaluating and assessing the skills gap uh, for the different um, the different people. So you can, I mean, this is still under development, but you can still uh, download the app, and so you can just assess your level of knowledge about circularity. I mean, you will you will be able. So you can download this. One of our role as well, as well as partner in Busgo Circular is also to highlight the levers to increase the demand in, um, in skills um, through public procurement. So as I said, I am part of um, a, no a local authorities network. And as you may know, we have like a powerful tool, which is the public procurement to increase this demand. So as public procurer, we can ask with it the tenders, like skilled worker, or we can ask, for instance, to design uh, like sustainable building or building embedding some, um, some circular product and materials. So actually, we have developed um, a guidance where you can see all the different levers that local authority can use to help this transition. We are also developing actually a train the trainer session. So there will be three all along uh, the project. One session has already been held uh, in Prague. There will be the second one uh, online in June, actually. And so the registration are still open. So if you are interested, you can scan the QR code here. And you have to register before uh, the 15th of May. So basically, what we will provide in here is some knowledge about circularity. And we will help you to tailor your, your training session that you will give to trainees once you will you will train like if you if you are a trainer so this is basically like all the knowledge you have to know to help um, either your students or your audience at least to know more about so for instance I, if i demolish a building how and can um, selectively selectively demolish this one to in order to reuse materials so yeah so please feel free to uh, to register to scan this uh, this QR code or also to uh, spread the word if you know some people that might be interested also we are developing a mentorship program because we think that what is really interesting is to have some um, exchange experience exchange sorry, experience between like more experienced people and like young people or students and so that's why we are developing this program so I will still looking for some mentees and mentor that can help to develop this program so if you are of interest also you can scan this and so you will have a, f a form uh, to fill in and I think I didn't tell this, but uh, I am also um, a teacher in uh, in urban metabolism. Um, I mean, you, like the master degree is actually the urban planning uh, master degree in France, and I'm always really surprised. And uh, I told this when we prepared this uh, this conference to to see that actually most of the students, they don't know that much about, about sustainability, and sustainability is not yet in the core of the, of the teaching. And again, I'm not an architect, so it's more about urban planning. I met some architect, uh, like student architect, uh, and I was also surprised because actually circularity is really not one of the topic, really. I, I mean, the one I met, they were just interested about this topic, and that's why they came to me just to ask some information and always I ask them, okay, so how do you, how did you learn uh, sustainability and sustainable buildings in your architecture school? And they always told me, so I don't know if it's just about friends or not, but they always told me, yeah, yeah, we have kind of teaching about this, but honestly, it's not the main, the main topic. And I'm always really surprised to hear this years I mean, I think we're talking about sustainability since, I don't know, 20 years or... And I'm always surprised that this is not in the core of, uh, of the teaching. 
And I think that's something which is really important, and I know that we develop this for students and also for, um, for workers in general. I think we need to go beyond theory and to practice, actually. Uh, and this is nice to see some different initiatives for students, so I know that there is a group of architects which is called Belastok, who is actually uh, developing this kind of, um, I, I don't know how I can really translate this, is either is it to do or to make, because it's actually, they develop this kind of module they call FER. And so what they want to do is to experiment the construction, but not just by the theoretical perspective, but also from the practical perspective. And I think this is really key for students, but also for workers, and especially for craftsmen and small companies. Because, as I mean, people know that when you are a craftsman and when you work in a really small company or your company by your own, you don't have time to train yourself. And there was kind of an experiment in a project that is called Bus League, which is kind of interesting. This is uh, how we can embed in the public tender some training clauses that force company to train on-site workers who are part of the construction site. And I think this is definitely important for to know actually um, how you have to make it really like uh, we need to manipulate and to see how we can do things. And also it's really important because this is some moment where you can also meet the different knowledge of the different um, people uh, on the working side. So yeah, I think those two initiatives were really um, in advance, I would say because like theory is super important, so we have to have the knowledge in mind, but we really have also to have the practice in hand. Yeah. I don't know if I write in time or not, or if I heard. yeah. I mean, if you have some question as well. No questions. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, our next um, speaker in the research session is Roberto Cavallo. Uh, Roberto is a professor at the Department of Architecture, Faculty of Architecture in the Built Environment of the Delft University of Technology. He is also currently a member of the EAAE Council and he will present us the GINEP project, a uh, project he's heading dedicated to co-design, implementation and sustainment of dynamic and collaborative Europe and digital ecosystem. Did I did I say it right? Okay. For the NEB, for the exactly for the NEP community. Okay. Thanks. Well, uh, working now? All oh, right. Well, maybe the battery is off after a long day. Well, um, thanks for the invitation, and thanks to ACE and EAE, but also to the faculty here to, to host us today. Um, I think the previous speaker also um, made very clear that some of these um, skills, but also things that we have to be aware of, are all around us, uh, but we have to put things together and make visible uh, within our um, networks. Well, DigiNEP, uh, is a project um, that we are partner of as EAE, and um, and I will explain you a few things about this project. Uh, this is a peculiar European project. We, those kind of projects are called coordination and support action projects. So that means that are projects that are tailor made to uh, support some of the actions of the European um, community. In, in fact, so um, and this project has a as a main objective to link the digital with uh, the European Bauhaus community. Um, and of course, doing that by raising awareness around um, digital solutions that are already out there, uh, but they are disconnected to one another, not known 
or uh, just isolated because um, hidden after uh, or behind a number of curtains uh, or uh, things that uh, just you must get to know. And the, the main purpose of the project is to, um, to bring all this to the New European Bauhaus stakeholders. Um, and of course, to create synergies, to try to create synergies among all these constant in, within this ocean, I will say, of uh, existing uh, materials, um, courses, tools that are already out there. Um, of course, we try to do that by um, tackling the main pillars of the New European Bauhaus. Uh, and the main actions that we do is about uh, innovation mapping, so map, mapping where these innovations are taking place, uh, synergizing, as I said, and also stakeholders engagement. Um, well, at this moment there are a lot of initiatives uh, out of the New European Bauhaus. What we try to do is also to connect with the projects that just started, like the New European Bauhaus Lighthouse project. Um, there are six of them uh, already up and running, but also to the other New European Bauhaus initiatives, uh, such as the labs, but also the academy that we've heard something about this morning. Uh, well, in the framework of this conference uh, today, um, which I just picked one of the questions that was already in the brief, what are the skills, methods and pedagogies uh, needed and ecologically beneficial for the architectural practices? Uh, they challenge this uh, turbulent 21st century. So, uh, out of this project, DigiNAP, we, we, we focus on, um, on how the digital can support architectural practices. I'm putting forward the architectural practices for also a very peculiar reason that connects also to the previous speakers. We know out of the latest report of ACE that the number of architects working alone or in pair it's just constant, about 70%, if I'm not mistaken, Dubravko. It's a very large number of our colleagues is working on themselves or in small offices. So it's extremely important that we uh, also, uh, let's say, run this kind of projects in order to convey all this available knowledge and solutions that are around. So out of that perspective, I think it's a very relevant project. Uh, well, those are the partners. Uh, there are two partners that are more specialized in the IT services. Uh, the first one, Trust IT and Compla. Um, then the TU Delft um, is there, um, also as official um, NAB partner. There is a, a foundation, the Industry Commons Foundation from Sweden, also being part of that. It's a network. Um, let's say, connecting to about 8,000 uh, small companies um, active in, in the sector. Um, and, uh, of course, the EAAE. Um, and Innovavut, which is the largest network of, um, of let's say, um, uh, advancing the knowledge, but also the, the practice and the education in uh, the wood construction industry. Uh, The main um, missions in four steps, um, very, very, uh, in, a, in a nutshell. As I said, first of all, the first objective is to, to map and showcase these existing solutions, um, but also the project and the tools that are going with it. The second is to create an active network. So out of all these materials that we have, we try also to, uh, by means of this project, to put together dots and people that are active uh, but also the ones that are interested to step in, actually. The third is to uh, produce capacity building material uh, that is, in a way, taking shape through um, the, um, particularly the observatory, but also, we hope, also in the e-learning catalog. And the fourth objective that will be a little bit later on is to come up with some recommendations to, to the Commission, what, how to, to go forward. Of course, such a project uh, will, uh, will, will, will take two years, and, but th those topics will, won't, won't be done. I mean, it will be just a, a number of stepping stones and these kind of uh, lines have to be brought forward. I will, uh, later in the presentation, I will explain you something more about the digital toolkit 
the observatory and the e-learning catalog. Those are interactive um, parts of this DigiNet project uh, that you can uh, look at on the website. And we are working also through um, a, cyclical, a, a cyclical way of um, operating through webinars, workshops, but also to uh, local um, encounters, basically, also with, with people that are doing some stuff in some parts of Europe. And uh, we do that by uh, taking advantage of uh, the thematic working groups. We have, two, uh, we have four thematic working groups. The first is design and architecture, production and construction. The second one, community and sustainability. The third, oh, I don't know what happened, but, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, after a long day, maybe it's, uh, it's this. DigiNeb is out of Digi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tell a joke. Yes. It's okay. Thanks. Many thanks. Yes. And um, did, uh, then I was just uh, explaining you the thematic working groups, and the fourth one is the verticals, which is a kind of mix working group, also uh, including artists, managers, or other business, business actors in the built environment, but also connecting to education. Actually, the, all four thematic working groups are also connecting to education. We also have a platform, we call it the early adopters, so we invite people around Europe to, um, to enroll and show what they do in, in, in the built environment in, in broad sense and to bring their own stories to, uh, to the DigiNEP and to show their own stories on the website. And we have an external advisory group and a number of people out of the built environment from the different disciplines um, that we invite uh, in the discussions but also uh, in the webinars and the workshops that we organize on the local level. Well, uh, I will go a little bit explaining you what is the platform about, um, explaining you the digital toolkit, the observatory, and the e-learning courses. That third part is just um, about to be launched at this moment. Um, but just explaining you what, what do we do and what do you see at this moment on the website, or what can you be... Uh, and, seeing, let's say, in a couple of weeks, because it's a very, it's a very dynamic thing. So I, 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 the last time I looked on the website was yesterday, but they already mailed me that, that the information that I've been putting in this presentation had to be updated already. But anyway, that's the way it goes. Uh, well, the, the Digital tool, Toolkit is actually is a platform in, in, through which we will map uh, the digital tools that support the implementation of the NEP values. Um, through the NEP community. So, uh, you, let's say also, if we talk about skills, skills are also somehow related to, to tools. Uh, our professionals in our fields are continuously using digital tools, whether, um, let's say, software platforms, applications, etc. So, you will see all um, kind of um, available tools uh, that, that have to s something to do with, uh, uh, with the built environment. And at this moment, we are trying also to categorize tools that, that will be a little bit more easy to, to, uh, to find uh, the type of tools. Of course, it's a type of project that develops on a fly. So we have to kind of understand how, in which way we can group together in the best possible way these tools that are available. Then uh, the observatory. The, the observatory, basically, the main purpose is to, um, to show and to uh, track all these, we call it the success stories, but actually are experiences uh, in, in a way. Those are the experiences and the way um, people is also, um, let's say, um, telling how do, in which way they operate and in which way they use digital solutions um, throughout Europe. Um, so it's, it's about involving, but also in a way promoting initiatives and projects. 
And as an example, you can, you can see the, the conference of today is also part of this uh, observatory, but there are also previous encounters like webinars, but also discussions with, uh, with the NEB Academy about co-design and other, uh, let's say, um, um, kind of activities that have been taking, um, taking place throughout the project. Uh, yes, and the e-learning. The e-learning is, is a quite a peculiar uh, part of this website. It's the part that is, um, is about to be, to be launched, and it's um, mainly the main purpose is to have an online catalog of digital solutions, um, let's say um, including uh, online courses uh, as, well as, as well as online training materials available there, and um, and hopefully, uh, out of that, we will also be able to, um, to map experiences. So we hope also to, to, uh, to put their experiences of people who have been using these materials. So now we are chasing and making an inventory of the material that is already there. But we hope in, in a few months also to, to bring some experiences of people using those materials. And uh, we are also trying to connect to these people providing the information. So we hope to incorporate uh, their way of operating also in webinars. So we are organizing webinars, thematic webinars. I will show a few uh, that are on the agenda later in, in the slide so that we can reach this constellation of small enterprises of people and colleagues that are out there and they have no possibility to, you know, to, to enter or to use all this available material. So the next one, we have a webinar on wood architecture um, organized by Novavood. That webinar will take place on May 23rd. It will be a webinar of, of about one and a half hour. It's open. So if you want to register, you just go through the website of DigiNEP. You register there and you will receive a Zoom link to participate to the webinar. Our project will be also represented at um, UIA 2023 World Congress of Architects in Copenhagen, uh, particularly in Novavut, will, will be part of some uh, thematic discussions there. We will uh, hold a workshop at uh, International uh, CAD Future Conferences at the TU Delft in the same week. Also, that workshop will be online, so it will be hybrid. So. Um, through the website of DigiNEP, you can enroll and you can participate to that. And we are organizing also another uh, webinar that will take place in, somewhere in July. The date is yet to be de decided on uh, local digital twins and smart communities. We have other ones in preparation about artificial intelligence as well. So quite, quite interesting topics, how to make use artific of artificial intelligence, what is already available out there and incorporate in our practices. And we have a couple of uh, initiatives that we do with partners of the EIE that we want to tie much more with education. Those will come up as well uh, after the summer. So um, subscribe to the newsletter and roll. And if you're there, you will get automatically all the information about the project. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Roberto. When we were coming up with the, with the title of the conference, it was supposed to be like um, uh, formula, um, and then in the end, the DigiNet is uh, the perfect solution to the, to the upskilling. I hope so. European Bauhaus upskilling so. times education plus practice. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Okay. Um, just before I introduce the, the, the next speaker, I wanted uh, I mentioned it uh, uh, several times this morning, and uh, Roberta did as well. So the the, the I just wanted to show the, our 2022 uh, sector study edition. Uh, our delegates will get it tomorrow, but also for the um, um, the deans of the European schools, it's uh, of course available on our website, and I hope you will find it useful and and uh, with fresh uh, fresh information. Okay, um, Paul McCormack. Uh, Paul McCormack is Innovation Manager at the Belfast Metropolitan College and also the RISE Program Manager. Uh, 
Uh, he's a well experienced uh, research project manager, founder, CEO of multi award win uh, winning startup SME, securing several international awards for innovation and leading highly successful international collaborative projects. And Arise exactly about the upskilling. So, Paul, please take the floor. Madam President, Dean Dubravko, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation here today. And there's another confession, I am not an architect. So anything I say, you can, t you can take with a, pin a pinch of salt. Our challenge, people are not sheep. If you go into the mountains and you see the sheep walking across the mountains, the lead sheep and everybody else follows in a straight line. That's the way we've approached education for years where you must go into the field, go into the compound, go into the structures and follow the straight lines. We were talking earlier on today, life is not linear. So why have we made education linear? And because of the changes in society, it was mentioned earlier on about the, the triple challenges, we haven't responded. We're still trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. And the gap between what you ladies and gentlemen design and what is built is getting wider because the skills are not there to implement or to translate the expertise and design into build. And what we're looking to challenge with Arise and our key partner in the Arise project is ACE with Larissa and Veronica. Is Larissa there? And they have helped drive this forward, built in other projects we've done. And it's using that technology so we can participate in learning throughout lives. Not continuous learning, because we don't do anything in life. If I've asked anybody in the audience here, what have you done continuously all the days of your life? There's nothing. So why should learning be something different? We switch on, we switch off, we engage, we disengage. Learning should be the same as that. It should be there when we need it. We should be able to access it when we need it. And we have the technologies in our mobile phones to be able to access that. In an environment that suits, at a time that suits, where you can build your life, work, learning balance. And that's how we're using technology in that built environment. And we've called this for an economy in transition. It's not just the building environment in transition, the whole economy. And our challenge is how we are able then to move that forward. We've called the title Skills Matter, and skills do matter, because when we develop anything, unless it's translated properly, you're not going to get the energy efficiencies you require. You're not going to get the green, clean environment that we need, and we need that in that skills transition and to address that change. We're looking to create that better skills system. My biggest challenge today is to get through 26 slides in 15 minutes, but the slides will be downloadable after the event, so all the information is there, so some of the slides I'll cover and not cover. But how do we stimulate the demand and meet what people need in today's changing society. We're closing that gap by addressing the systems. It's not people, it's the systems and the processes in place. Giving the people the skills and the access to the skills they need at a time and a place to be able to design that. We're working through what we call digital transformation, taking all of the different steps and putting the learner in charge. For those of you in the audience old enough to remember the old Pac-Man game, where you went through the different maze and you chose your own direction, why can education not be the same? You don't need all the modules to be able to do your job tomorrow. You need specific modules. We're breaking them down into 15-minute learning bites. You're able then to build those across to your ECTS points. We're using gamification so that we can engage the learner continuously. They build up their points, they transfer the points to cert coin, the cryptocurrency for learning, and then they can choose either CPD points or certification. Again, you're given the learner choice. Some people going through learning want certific certificates at the end to build up that portfolio or their digital portfolio, or others, the white collar workers, want to build this as part of their CPD. So it's the same process, but we're giving people choice throughout the process. And that's the essence of the Arise system, is it putting the learner in the center of what we're doing. We're able then to make sure that we can map across from the skills to the energy savings. 
mentioned earlier about the, the digital models and the, the digital twins, been able to measure and quantify the skills to the energy savings in construction, and then able to get to that across the different opportunities. It's built on the projects we've been working on and also through what we call BIM EPA. There's 24 countries represented and 100 partners all across that network. And it's capturing all of those skills, all of that learning. And it's transition. We're an economy in transition. We're building uh, construction in transition. And we need them to address that. There's a real opportunity for one of the greatest laggard industries, that of construction, to become one of the most innovative. And use the tools that we've discussed here today and the learning here today Implement that, then other sectors of the economy then can take that over and build a world-class system that's agile, flexible and responsive, meeting the needs of industry, meeting the needs of the worker, but also meeting the needs of society. That process is about simplifying the skills landscape, enabling flexible learning, upskilling and relearning, making learning accessible. In one of our trials we had last year, We've gone through an, a, online learning and we have an assessment at the end of each module, so we we're able then to measure that. If you go over the time, you're timed out. We had the, the people can want 24 7, so we, this, the student was timed out and he phoned in and he said, New child in the house, child started crying, he had to go and feed the child. So we reset the clock, he can go back in and did the assessment again. But if you took that environment into a classroom environment, it's not as flexible. And it's that flexibility is critical as we move forward. If we as a society are going to succeed in what they've called the fourth industrial revolution, it's about people. Other revolutions were about energy and coal and oil and everything else. The success of the industrial revolution we're in at the minute is people. You and I making sure we have the skills, the knowledge and the expertise to do our job better, quicker, smarter and leaner. So we end up with a green environment at the end. And I said, but that's stimulating engagement. We've all been in classrooms, we've all been in, in environments, and we're all going to be here now after coffee this afternoon, what we call the, the graveyard shift, where the eyes start getting heavy. And that's what it's about. How do we stimulate that and make it learning? So the vast group of people in the construction environment who are there with the skills but don't have the recognised qualifications to become mobile. If we even look at... It was mentioned earlier on about the migration and the people. How can we in Europe not recognize qualifications from other parts of Europe? We don't even have skills transferability. We have the tools to do it, but we don't do it. And the answer is there, how to make the system leaner and smarter and put the learner at the center of it so we can build that matrix of skills. People have the choice and choose the destination they want, not the destination they're told they want. And it's about getting that into what we call stimulation of investments, and we end up then with high energy performance buildings and construction that meet our needs. The array system is built on what, what I classify as the six Ws. There's three stages in digital transformation, awareness, transformation, and implementation. And the number of work packages in the, the system itself are the what, the why, the how, the who, the where, and the when. And it's built into that and the different partners that we have from IST in Portugal to TU Dublin to IBEMI in Italy to ACE here in Brussels, ourselves in Belfast, we all lead in these different work packages, but it's the integration of that. And that's the, the part that we're successful in, we're getting. The digital imperatives, energy efficiency is no, matter, no longer a matter of why, but how. We can't keep plundering the world's resources and hope that we can continue. In some ways in our lives, we haven't moved on from, on from cavemen, but we're still hunter-gatherers, using inexhaustible resources for our own luxury and then hoping that somebody's going to fill the gap. And that's what environment is about. I mean, it's not just about the worker, it's about public administration, industry and society all recognising that. We all know about the greenhouse gas emissions and the targets and whatever, and that's the why. We need to transi tra uh, transition to a world-class vocational system that's agile, flexible, and responsive. Let's people move between the different modules they need, the different skills they need, the different chapters they need, and where we can be celebrated as an engine of sustainable and equitable built environment. We then lead, so you, as we said earlier, where the construction is recognized for not being innovative, has a chance now to move ahead and become the leader in the pack. 
The how, is, how to close the gap, use digi digital technology to create that agile skill system. Achieve that by using the digital tools that we have and all the mechanisms that we have in our hands to create that vocational mobility to give the people the tools they need at a time they need them and in a format they can, they can work with. Energy transitions, as I said at the start, it's not about energy, it's not about tools, it's about people. People are at the center of everything we need to do and the solution of what we want to do. And if we equip them with a proper digital toolkit, we're able then to achieve that success. And it's that learning interface, it was mentioned earlier, three years of an undergrad and two years of a master, that's five years of learning. If you went to some of the brown collar workers in the workforce, I want you to go back to education for five years, they would laugh at you. Because that's one of the biggest barriers we keep building walls to stop people engaging. If we give them micro modules, segmented accreditation, digitalized learning accounts, and give them that mobility, you then give them the confidence by removing the barriers for engagement. And it gives the learners that mindset and understanding that upskilling is a normal cycle in employment. Not continuous, but normal cycle. Digital skills are the future of the construction sector. How we employ it, how we use them, how we remove the silos, how we take the data that the world's full of and turn it into informed information and decision making and give that visibility across the entire process. The Arise technology is using what I call beyond blended or blended learning. It's that choice. We're not looking here to replace something. We're looking at that hybrid. And that's the difference. Remove the silos and create a hybrid environment where traditional education and new digital processes work together. Again, you're giving people choice. You're not giving them one solution. You're letting them choose themselves, so what they need to do, and how that segmented course content, then they can use that themselves. Removing the obstacles and the disconnection in digitalization is making sure that the design and the process, as was mentioned earlier on, you're able then to get engaged with people. Even the words we used, haven't used it once, BIM. Even that acronym is enough to put people off. Demystify the process, remove the obstacles, and engage, engage with the worker. Remove that digital dissonance so we can demonstrate how technology helps and it's systematic to remove the skills barriers for learners at all levels so that people then can, can keep engaged. Connectivity, exactly as the previous speaker said, there are wonderful examples out there all across Europe. How we join that up? Take the best of what's out there and come up with the best recipe. In Ireland, the great saying is, every Irish mother has their own recipe for Irish stew, but you still end up with Irish stew. There are many recipes out there. Let's use them. We don't have time to learn from our mistakes. Let's learn from others' mistakes and create that environment and those work practices that become transformational. As exactly what was said earlier, how do we inform the EU for the next steps by taking the learnings from the previous steps? That skills innovation and nine step process that we use, it goes through all of the different processes there, but again, you're asking others to engage. We're a small project working in parts of Europe, engaged with the other 24 projects, over 100 different partners, but there are lessons there to be learned, and that's why today is an exact, a perfect example of this. How do we close that gap? Introducing information exchange, introducing best practice, and working in collaboration. The construction tra transition is there. We need to fast track it. There's an awareness there. There's not one person in this room, that's why you're here today, to realize that awareness. But that awareness has to cascade throughout the whole value chain. Right down to the man doing the plastering, or the spark, or the, the wood turner, or the flooring man. That information has to cast, because if you design it and it's built right, it will meet the optimum performance that you're aware of. But if we don't, there's going to be gaps in the system. And we have processes in place that you can measure that. And it's that skills exchange mechanism. How many of us have taken this, this, this shorter path in life? It's true, it's human nature. Nobody's any different. So how do we make the use of experience more rewarding? and remove the sharp corners, remove the barriers, and pioneer training schemes, as others mentioned there today, how we become that socioeconomic influencer. In the Arise, we have Dr. Anna Moreno in Italy, talks about 
T-I-B-L, task and impact-based learning. You have a job to do. You don't need to spend 20 hours learning how to do it. Is there a set of modules that let you know how to do it better? Measure it, and then upload the digital evidence that you've done it as well as you can. And that's the way to, to what we see as the way forward, is give the people the skills they need to do the job they're doing. Not all the waffle and the stuff that's bolted on either side. Then ultimately, through that exposure, you get further and further engagement with the worker, and the worker then becomes engaged for, for the, the job. It's an exchange. It's not a one-way process. All of the projects that we're doing that were mentioned here today and in other projects, we go out, we do trials, and we take back in, and you're telling industry, they're telling you what they want. You're not telling them, and you're working with them. We're then letting the learner through gamification stay engaged and stay stimulated. Same as playing online games, giving them the tools, suddenly they're able to build up the points. The points then are exchanged for cert coin and they have that, part, that path to choose either CPD and or certification. Same journey, but you're letting them take the destination that they need to do. The skills pathway, as I said, it's not unidirectional. It's a qualification, it's a quantum and algorithm, and we're looking through, it was mentioned this morning with the, the speaker from the European Union, how do we build this digital center of excellence to capture all of the learning that's ongoing and use that and magnify that and give that back to industry to use in a continuous fashion. Some of the things are there that were talked about. Our challenges in the rise, it's the same as this event. How can, can construction education be influenced to contribute? What does it really take to bring people on board and accomplish the Green Deal? And where do we learn from past projects and what do students and professionals need to thrive? We heard some fantastic discussions today from the younger students driving things forward. Capture that. So all of our audience, not just the workers, it's all the people involved throughout the whole of the value chain we've talked about. In conclusion, digital is the new normal. We need to capture it, use it in the best possible fashion we can do, package it in a way where it's not one size fits all, where people have the choice, people will be able then to choose their destination and the route that they do, Make it part of every interaction. Make it simple by giving people the tools they need in their mobile phone so they can engage, they can also then upload digital evidence that the job's done properly. You then have a digital portfolio. We've talked about digital twins of buildings. You have a digital twin in advance of it being built, but you have the tools now to measure the digital twin as it's been built and post the energy part of it. So therefore you have a digital envelope of the whole construction and the main part of that is the skills and the skills evidence you've taken. And then taking traditional skills exchange from what I call a maintenance mode to a proactive mode where we take the lead, where education takes the lead and construction then takes the lead. Any process, I mean, or any conference, I mean, I always like to leave a few takeaways. Number one, skills are the instrument of connection. Digitalization is only a tool. It's skills are the connectivity. Design, development, and delivery of a universal inter interconnected curriculum, traditional and the one we're talking about, to enable learners in a cycle of participation, not lifelong learning, a cycle of participation, which allows them to come in and out as and when life dictates, as and when you want. Again, the learners in, in charge. Clean energy transitions require innovative solutions and business models to be adapted throughout the diverse talent tool. Not just the workers, not the designers, not the architects, throughout the whole diverse talent tool or pool that is there. Arise and other projects are working to create a better system, address the challenge of the here and the now, stimulate the demand, and build the capacity to be able to adapt and be agile and deliver the skills. It's a journey, it's not a destination. And that is part of the journey here today. It's part of why ACE had invited us over to make sure that we stay on the journey. It's not participation. And make sure then that we're able then to deliver what we need. Thank you very much indeed. Coffee break, 15 minutes. <laughs>
Thank you.
Uh, okay, please take your, take up your seats. One more session, discussion table, a little bit more, and then we, you are free to go. <laughs> so not not just yet. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay. Um, so the, the, the last group session will be on practice. Um, as you have probably noticed, the entire structure was somehow uh, of the conference was organized around dif different stakeholders. And, and you know, this different stakeholders should be understand conditional because we all change our heads being at the same time uh, practitioners and teaching and uh, doing research and so on. Um, so, as Rachel announced for the for the our practice session, we invited um, Raúl and Ehab, and then we'll also have a short presentation from uh, Lara Molino um, about the Brussels Architecture Prize. So, um, the first speaker is uh, Raúl Pantaleo. He's co-founder of Tamas Achati, uh, architectural practice specialized in impact design. It's a team of architects, engineers, and researchers uh, whose building solutions improve lives and strengthen communities worldwide and provide creative responses to climate change by combining high quality with affordability. Since 2019, Raul is also a young professor of uh, architectural design at the University of Trieste. So Raul, welcome. The floor is yours. This one? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I am an architect. Um, green, yes. Um, I'm very glad to be here also because, uh, as was mentioned before, I've also started recently my teaching, so to start to to share uh, this long time experience in the most extreme condition in the world that uh, you can see from the map. Yes, we are a collective. Yes, I was saying I'm an architect, but I would consider myself more an activist uh, because uh, our decision to work in what is now called impact design has been a, a decision more as citizens, as activists to share our knowledge in terms of design with all that society that w was trying and is trying to, to, to change the, this world. That means the NGO, that means uh, the association, the cooperative, uh, fair trading, and so on. So as you can see, this is a partial map. There are still countries that are missing where we have been working. So in the last 30 years, myself have been traveling and designing all over uh, the war-torn area, crisis area, Afghanistan, Iraq, Sudan, Darfur, and so on. And so uh, we are living uh, in uh, what is called Anthropocene now. It's uh, so-called the new era, uh, or it's an old era. It depends on the starting point and already has been mentioned with the limited resources, um, uh, climate instability, uh, that the consequences are increasing migration and finally uh, war zone expansion. Unfortunately, on this map there is now a new country that is Sudan that I've been uh, working in for many years in 2004 in both in Sudan then in Darfur and South Sudan. So um, I just made this uh, general overview of uh, what has been my experience in this extreme condition. In Wharton area, you have really little alternative also as a designer, limited resources, you cannot travel, you cannot uh, uh, make any choices, so it's very, very limited. But what has been for a long time and a hmm, separate experience that very specific on that area 
And nowadays, because of Anthropocene, because we are living somehow or feeling this crisis time, it's becoming more and more uh, interesting in terms of mental approach. And then I will show you later on what I mean also in terms of uh, uh, teaching. Uh, working in war-torn area, what does it mean? It would take a long time to, 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 ex to, to talk about. But uh, um, these are two examples of, of hospital in Afghanistan, one in Kabul and one in a remote area in, uh, in Panjshir Valley, is to go to do what is necessary. So this is an attitude to minimize your design, your action, your need and to simplify the approach to design, to life, to, to minimize what you do. What you do, what we learn working in poverty, here we are in Iraq and in Sudan, it is to be parsimonious, to minimize, as here again, the, the, the action, uh, what you do in terms of uh, psychological, human, and design approach. Here there are two examples of, of uh, this is the vessel we just designed for. Uh, we have been working mainly for this Italian NGO that's called emergencies like uh, Medicine Sans Frontier. So uh, the, 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 the idea of uh, um, uh, using simplicity to, to reduce the, the, our design, our impact, our doing, and what does it mean to work in, in, in justice? As I was mentioning at the beginning, is to be involved as uh, activist. I think that we need, there is now a, a new generation, really, the, the, really about the, th uh, the people that are 30 years old now, right now that are really I, I, I met through the, the organization, also through the work, they are um, truly involved in, a, in a, a big change. So to share our knowledge, to, to try to, to be open, to, to be participatory in, uh, in, uh, in, in this change. So I always say to my students, or also with the people that work with us, we are first citizens, and then we are architect. And this is a big shift, because then you are you're bringing on yourself all the, 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 the need of the world, and you give an answer through the design. But it's uh, somebody in the morning also, I like a lot the, the, the presentation of the creation team, trying to, to work together with the people, to work together with different uh, skills. Climate, climate crisis, of course, I experience climate crisis in the most extreme way, because in the most vulnerable uh, country. So uh, to work again, uh, to minimize the use of, of resources, you can see it's always reduction, minimize, uh, uh, making simple and so on. But this is in case of, uh, of uh, uh, climate change is something that comes natural when you are there because uh, there is lack of electricity, lack of water. I mean, I have been dealing with water for all my life because when you go to Sudan, of course, the water is a resource. So these are two completely different examples. One on, on the left is a project we, we recently opened. It has been an extraordinary experience working with Renzo Piano for this hospital in Uganda. So it's high technology using, uh, it's made with rammed earth, with uh, solar energy, to totally almost autonomous in terms of, of energy. On the other side is the reuse of the container. So, um, we need new skills, okay. Today we have been talking about we need new skills. Which are the new skills? Uh, as my colleagues before uh, has already mentioned, we have to have a new methodological approach from linear thinking into systemic thinking that I would like to put on the table. My experience in terms of this, this sounds very abstract. But if you are in a, in a war-torn area, it becomes natural because you are there with the mechanical engineer, the structural engineer, with the builder, uh, with, with all these subjects that can 
make a decision on this. So it's natural to think in a systemic way, also in terms of resilience of a building. And I will show later a very small example on this, on this point. And to start to work with the dynamic design, if you are in that condition where every year can change the political, the, the resources capacity of a country, it's obvious to start with, you cannot design a static project. You have to work on a resilient project that has a different view that can change through the time. Reduce the ecological footprint from the use and consumption of resources, but to a metabolic system. And also again here, for me, is not a, um, an abstract word, this. It came also for uh, the, 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 all our project has very, are very much linked with the agricultural because it's part of the, the feeding of a hospital. I mainly work with, uh, with the hospital facilities in this year. So, uh, finally, but this, this is very much connected with the first point. We need to, to use a new measurement system from a linear measurement that is the typical system we have of based on costs and losses to more systemic measurement like energetic um, balance. So it's uh, somehow, it's a very, uh, it has been very interesting to work in this uh, context uh, where everything is uh, extreme needed because this helps us to uh, shape a way of uh, considering and, and designing in the reality that it's very actual in, in our context. So I just make a very small example just to make, um, to give a, a clue what I'm meaning. Here we are in Sudan, uh, there is, a, this is a sandstorm, it's called a bub, it's very typical of that area, but it's uh, becoming more and more frequent now, so it's becoming a big, ser a serious problem. This is dust, the dust of the desert. So when the bub come, after the Abub, you have dust everywhere. So you, you can imagine this is co completely incompatible with the, with the hospital. So I was in Darfur um, in 2010. It was just after the war. And I was there, the, I was ten, mentioning before, I was there with the mechanical engineer, structural engineer, the program coordinator, the, uh, the chief of the medical staff. And we were facing this process and discussing how to face this problem because the, there are technological uh, possibility that is uh, uh, Ciclone, I don't know what's in English, sorry, uh, that are, it was extremely expensive. So we start a cultural approach, studying the, the Bajir, uh, then the engineers start, well, yes, there are, there are the adiabatic cooling and so on, but finally, we, let's say, invent, it's not an invention, we reinvent this cooling system that is based on the traditional Badgir, but with a small technological uh, implementation with the adiabatic cooling, it's evaporation of water. It's very, very simple and cheap machine, it's on off. So, and if it breaks, you just open the door, and so you have natural flow. The result of this project is that we could cool 800 square meter with six kilowatt, that is the electricity you need for two, for two split. So, and now I come to the point uh, that I was mentioning before about resilience. With a program coordinator that, that, that has a long experience in, in Afghanistan, he said, well, the cooling, the, the cooling tunnel that you see on the left, it's a good, sh good place for refuge. Two days ago, for the first time, I hope the last time, it, will be, it has been used by the, 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 the patient during the attack of, of the clinic because it's in, in a very, very um, critical area. So you see what, I, what I'm mentioning about um, working together. This is something that came through the table of, of, of uh, designing work you came to that. Here is just another example how then this uh, ventilation tower became a symbolic element that this is the result of the clinic. And we were talking of using new uh, methodology of explaining. This is a graphic novel that we designed to explain all the strategy of the, of the, of the project. 
uh, going back to education, we need uh, a new idea of education that is based on a collective intelligence. Myself, I would abolish the University of Architecture, of engineering, of mechanical engineering, to have an a school where you learn design. And we have to work on three different levels. Uh, overcoming the idea of specialization, that's very typical of our education. You start an to be an architect, you end up to be, to be an architect to favor a humanistic vision, and this is very peculiar of Europe. We have to have a bigger vision about, about design. Introduce study of philosophies as fundamental subject, and I strongly believe that this is an asset we should introduce in our university, because this gives a vision, because the specialization, you are just there, looking your small garden, uh, philosophy, it's the, the, the tool you have to have a bigger vision. And then finally, facilitate participatory process and collective intelligence is what I was mentioning before. To work together, it's something that I, fi I found very difficult in my university to work together with our neighbor that are the engineers. So I like very much the creation ac activity to sit with the engineer, with the mechanical engineer, with the, with the anthropologist, with all the subjects that are affecting the, the project. Also, the, 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 the Royal Danish uh, University that were talking about uh, um, economy. So to have the program coordinator in your, in, sit around the table means that he's the, saying, hey guys, we cannot spend that money. So I think that the idea, and I'm finishing, is uh, that we have to have to, to rebuild the organization of our, the, the university in a way that is very much attached to the reality, because this is the reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raoul. Um, our next speaker is uh, Ehab Saed. He's a uh, founder and director of innovation at Biome and a PhD researcher at Northumbria University. Ehab is a sustainable designer, engineer, circular economy strategist, and built environment, environment in, in, innovator with a passion for creating a biomimetic circular future that meets our environmental, economic, and human needs. So let's see what, what he will present. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Ihab Syed. I'm founder and chief evolution officer at Biome. Here we go. And today I'd like to talk about how we can work towards a biomimetic future. Biomimetics or biomimicry is often described as the emulation of natural forms, structures, and systems to create human-made solutions that address challenges. However, as we dive deeper into studying and emulating nature, we begin to see how all systems in the universe appear to be interconnected through webs of relations and thereby impact and regulate one another through a series of feedback loops. This has us expanding the definition of nature beyond biological nature on Earth and to the whole universe, as it is the place, the source, and the result of material phenomena, which includes humans, human culture, human artifacts, and the result of human activity. 
Throughout cosmic evolution and in the direction of the arrow of time, from Big, Mag, from Big Bang to humankind, systems were observed to emerge and evolve in accordance with unifying laws and behaviors. As energy budgets change within the environment, systems evolve to make use of the newly available energy or to adapt to lower energy rates. Fundamentally, we begin to appreciate the age-old notion of nature being at the heart of all things. Through particular galactic and stellar evolution and towards biological and cultural evolution, the complexity of systems and the amount of relations between them appear to increase as they venture towards higher levels of order. And thanks to American astrophysicist Eric Chason, we can now empirically measure the, this ever-increasing complexity using energy rate density, which measures the amount of energy flowing through a system, or in other words, the energy metabolism of a system. I would like to bring the second law of thermodynamics to the forefront here, which states that when energy changes from one form to another, disorder or entropy always increases. Some of the earliest and least complex systems, which include galaxies and stars, exhibit energy rate densities as low as 0.1 or 2 ergs per second per gram. Our planet emerged, and its, a more com and its far more complex exterior reaches a higher order of magnitude at 75. Then biological evolution emerged and we began to observe energy rate densities as high as 20,000 in plants, 40,000 in mammals, and our more efficient human bodies sit at around 20,000 ergs per second per gram. Then the most complex known biological system emerged at 150,000 ergs per second per gram, the human brain. We combined our brains together and created agriculturalist societies, where each human consumed 100,000 ergs per second per gram. We then tripled our complexity uh, with the Industrial Revolution and began to create machines, which reached another order of magnitude. When it comes to energy rate density, this is unprecedented in nature. Each one of us sitting here today relies on a staggering 2 million ergs per second per gram. And when we created artificial intelligence, we reached yet another order of magnitude with an energy rate density of around 10 million ergs per second per gram. When, when Eric Chason demonstrated this on a graph, as you can see here, we can see how our arrival has resulted in an almost vertical incline in complexity. We were able to achieve this by being the first known system to practice reflexivity in a conscious manner. Whilst all systems before us examined their environment and themselves and reflected on the laws and behaviors um, and principles that govern them and reacted to them in an unconscious manner, that is driven by natural feedback loops, we have developed the ability to reflect on the past and the present to inform the future consciously. Whilst we once lived as part of the natural world and the natural order of systems, and were very much in tune with the natural laws of the cosmos, today our reflexivity caters to the stories and human constructs that drive our economies and we stumbled upon the most concentrated known source of energy in the universe, fossil fuels. Now, with the second law of thermodynamics in mind, it is barely surprising that such intensive transformation of energy would result in extreme regimes in our external environment or within our Earth system. Therefore, it's time to redefine biomimetics or biomimicry as the holistic and systemic emulation of the multitudinous hierarchical systems in nature, which is the whole universe, to create intelligent solutions that are locally situated, socially connected, and sensitive to the cybernetics and energetics of their environment. This would enable us to master the reflexivity of life. And that's exactly what we do at BIO. 
Biome is a multi-award winning research and development led company that places natural systems at the heart of its inspiration and aims to realign natural and cultural systems whilst revolutionizing the built environment. We're driven by a very simple philosophy to allow nature to lead innovation and only have a positive or regenerative impact on everything that we touch. This philosophy is manifested throughout all of our offerings, from our bio-based materials to our construction systems, as well as our general research. Now, starting with our bio-based materials, we work with one of nature's most wondrous organisms, fungi, and more particularly mycelium, which is the root structure of fungi. We evolve our mycelium strains on a genetic level, and then we're able to collaborate with them as they grow to guide them towards providing us with the material properties desired by industry. We feed our mycelium agricultural waste streams and create high performance construction materials like our mycelium thermal and acoustic insulation, which is currently being licensed by one of the largest global manufacturers and providers of building insulation. And they're planning to scale this technology worldwide across over 200 factories um, by 2027. And we oblige our licensees to reinvest a significant profit share into local communities within 100 kilometers of every single factory. And this is to ensure that the facilities are not just environmentally regenerative, but they are also socially regenerative. When testing our mycelium materials against construction industry standards, we were blown away by the results achieved by simply using nature's genius. We outperform established synthetic alternatives and began to change the common narrative around natural materials. As we were evolving our mycelium strains, we also realized that one of them developed an appetite for plastic. And with funding from supermarket chain, uh, British supermarket chain Waitrose and Partners, we were able to develop four strains that can consume a variety of plastic, from polystyrene and polyester to polyurethane and polyethylene. We've also developed ORP, or organic refuse biocompound, a biotechnology that allows you to go anywhere on the face of the planet take food and agricultural waste streams and turn them into high performance materials that can be pressed into sheets, 3D printed or cast. You can find our carbon negative obscure lampshades which are passively formed using just gravity um, in cafes, restaurants and offices in London. We most recently developed a completely binderless version of this uh, material as well. Um, and this tile here is 100% made out of just orange peel. So we use the intrinsic properties of the waste streams, much like nature does, to transform them into high value resources for a new life. Our construction systems mimic nature's building blocks. Combining our bio-based materials, we develop triagamy. Taking inspiration from nature's strongest structures, the system mimics the mathematical geometry of carbon molecules, enabling buildings to be constructed with no permanent fasteners or binders. This enables agile infrastructure as it allows buildings to be deconstructed and reconstructed at any stage of their life. And when compared to brick and block construction, reduces build costs by 70%, build times by 95%, and the environmental impact by a staggering 120%. Our transdisciplinary biomimetic research has enabled us to transform waste topsoil from a construction site into materials and products that were installed back into the same development. And this same approach was also uh, used at the Glyndebourne Opera Pavilion, where we were able to take waste streams from the grounds, such as grass trimmings and champagne corks, uh, when we transformed them into interior facades. One of the most interesting waste streams we've worked with was human hair, uh, where we made a rubbery soft version of our old material. It's quite an interesting uh, waste stream to have in the lab. 
We also worked with um, a FTSE 100 company, a property developer in the UK, to transform the most problematic waste streams found on construction sites and in the operational phase of buildings as well. And we transformed them into materials and products. We created a cardboard-based org material that outperformed plywood, and we're able to render polystyrene unrecognizable as a plastic within only 28 days when chemically analyzed. We worked with Bupa to micro-remediate PPE and face masks and are currently about to embark on a journey with the Biomimicry Institute to create bacterial and fungal consortia that can remediate a variety of toxic chemicals and plastics that plague the fashion industry. We're working towards a biomimetic future, one that is not just present in the architectural forms of our built environment, nor in the legs of a robotic dog that has an ever increasing capacity for mass destruction, but deeply ingrained in our cultural and economic systems, as this is what is needed to change the narrative for humanity in the story of cosmic evolution. From the species that lost touch with nature and the cosmos, leading to a momentous loss of unprecedented advancement in biodiversity and complexity, to the species that managed to accelerate the story of evolution without impeding the evolutionary journeys of other organisms, enabling the universe to holistically practice conscious reflexivity through humanity and their machines, as well as through other organisms on a planetary and perhaps a cosmic scale. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you, Ab. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to do with freehand drawing now in the schools, but. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, the last speaker today uh, in the uh, uh, practice session is uh, Lara Molino, who is program coordinator um, at the architecture in Bel uh, A plus architecture in Belgium. And she will present us the first edition of the Brussels Architecture Prize 2021. So it's not pro her proper practice, let's say, but uh, we thought that we would end up the, the, um, uh, the presentations with uh, the winning projects of the four categories in order to highlight the architectural quality uh, you can find in Brussels. And also for those of you who will be staying over the weekend, maybe uh, um, almost as a, a short tour uh, preview or, of the buildings you could, uh, projects you could um, visit. So, Lara is where? Oh, you are there. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to start with uh, thanking the Architect Councils of Europe and the European Association for Architectural Education for the invitation. Uh, I am pleased to be here today to introduce the Brussels Architecture Prize, which was first organized in 2021. The Brussels Architecture Prize is an initiative of the Brussels Capital Region, implemented by Urban in co-production with A+. The initial goal is to present the event every two years, to reward outstanding architectural projects that contribute to the spatial quality of Brussels. The Brussels Architecture Prize highlights Brussels firstly as a laboratory for contemporary architecture and urban planning, and secondly as a source of inspiration for an urban policy that reaches far beyond the region's borders. The focus is put on innovative on uh, innovative projects. The prize rewards recent realization divided in four different categories. Small interventions of less than a thousand square meters, major intervention that redesigned the city, public interventions which constitute an added value for the citizens and promote green mobility, and the extramuros category 
for a high quality project designed by a Brussels based office built outside the Brussels territory. We invited a scientific committee made up of cultural, educational, and regional actors to define the professional international jury. The aim was to invite renowned architects and key figures from the international world of architecture to offer a fresh perspective on Brussels architectural production. Let me now show you a short video of each of the winners of the 2021 edition, starting with the public space winner. Here we go. There is no sound on the, the grote uitdaging voor ons in dit project was uh, hoe kunnen we op een vrij harde ruimte, een plek met heel veel verkeer en lawaai, hoe kunnen we een soort van geborgen omgeving maken waar jongere kinderen en, en adolescenten een fijn plekje kunnen vinden om, om te gaan spelen. Verder, ja, de tijdelijkheid uh, was ook een belangrijk constructief vraagstuk. De constructie moet verplaatsbaar zijn. We hebben gebruik gemaakt van gerecupereerde materialen. We hebben ook geprobeerd van het gevoel op te wekken dat, dat iedereen bij wijze van spreken die structuur zou kunnen monteren. Het is ook bewust niet helemaal afgewerkt om eigenlijk ook als een open uitnodiging om zelf aan de slag te gaan. Ze willen ook vooral dat de jongeren die die plek gebruiken, dat ze zich die plek gaan toe-eigenen. En in die zin ja, is het perfect mogelijk dat men op de beton gaat schilderen, op de wanden van de containers gaat schilderen enzovoort. This project provides added value for the users by intensifying the activity offered on site. The next video will show you the major intervention winner. Het Bouwmaterialendorp is een logistiek platform om de stad te bevoorraden van bouwmateriaal via de waterweg. In het Bouwmaterialendorp hebben wij ervoor gekozen om de afwikkeling van logistieke stromen te laten zien. We geloven dat in het zichtbaar maken van het stedelijk metabolisme enerzijds een waarheid zit, een stad kan niet zonder stadsbevoorrading en anderzijds ook een schoonheid kan huizen. Bedrijven verdwijnen, fuseren, gaan failliet, worden overgenomen of veranderen hun strategie. Om de architectuur daar zoveel mogelijk op te laten inspelen is flexibel en aanpasbaar gemaakt. De opeenvolging van een warme loods die als winkel fungeert, twee koude loodsen waar de stok gestapeld wordt en de luifel waarin en uitgeladen wordt, laten zien dat deze verschillende vormen in het bouwmateriaal dorp aanwezig zijn. Deze aanpasbaarheid geeft ook aan dat andere configuraties mogelijk blijven. The category major intervention is not just about scale, it's about impact, circular economy, and in this case also about including the industry in the city. Attention was paid here to the materials used and the resources employed, as well as the modularity of the project. The next video presents the small intervention winner. Stamaropa is a third space, a public interior in the European quarter of Brussels where inhabitants, professionals and others can interact and dialogue about the future of Europe. One of the main challenges was to define strategic spatial interventions in a building that hasn't been used for over 10 years and is nowadays nothing more than a rough concrete structure. So we focused our time, energy and budget on designing a stage curtain that accentuates the double high space and allows flexible use and three dialogue settings. First, a series of hexagonal tables that can be configured in one long or multiple small tables. Second, a kitchen. And third, a carpet. They are designed in such a way to disarm users, to provoke various emotions and feelings and simulate open dialogue. Despite being classified as a minor operation, this architecture possesses a transformative power. The project completely transforms a cold office building street into something so much more friendly, social and inclusive. And last but not least, the extramuros winner is the project shown in the next video. 
Het stadsgebouw Melopé is een complex van scholen, crèches, kinderopvang, lager onderwijs. Dat ook nog een keer door de nieuwe buurt die er in de toekomst langs zal komen, optimaal gebruikt gaat worden. De sportzaal die erin zit en de speelveldjes buiten worden publiek toegankelijk. Er komt een onderdoorgang die altijd publiek is. En uh, dat binnen- en buitenprogramma, dat moet op een heel precieze manier uh, met elkaar in uh, verband uh, gebracht worden. En uh, daarom uh, hebben we hier de kans gekregen om een ruimtelijk uh, samenspel van buitenruimtes uh, te maken, die je in een normale school nooit zou kunnen maken, maar omdat er hier een uh, gebrek aan plaats was, uh, was dat wel mogelijk en is er een soort van uh, ja, majestueus uh, speelplein uh, ontstaan. This school is a radical innovation in school building typology. The nominated interventions were grouped together in an exhibition called A Capital Makeover and Five Debates. All this was done with the idea of mobilizing the whole community and allow a wider public to be involved and to vote for their favorite intervention. The People's Choice Award was given to the project with the most votes, shown in the next video. In is een schoolproject met een actief en innovatief leerlandschap. En in dit project hadden we eigenlijk drie grote uitdagingen. Het uh, eerste was de, de stedelijke condities van de site. Langs een, een van de grote invalswegen uh, naar Brussel, uh, namelijk de Nieuwse Steenweg. Een tweede element, we zitten met een kerkgebouw, uh, maar wat doe je daar nu in godsnaam mee? Hoe gaan we om met het voormalig kerkgebouw? Eh, er, er moet een schoolinvulling in komen. En hoe ga je die, die, die functie daar insteken? En welke elementen ga je behouden? Welke ruimtelijkheid ga je terug inzetten? Een totaal nieuw ruimtelijk antwoord op, op, op een schoolgebouw. Het boeiende aan de opdracht was dat de pedagogische visie nog niet uitgeschreven was bij aanvang van onze opdracht. Waarbij het vooral eigenlijk een zoektocht was naar, naar een landschap dat toelaat dat de, de leerlingen of de kinderen effectief actor kunnen worden van hun eigen leerproces. By thinking about new educational concepts, this project works for a more responsible society. Two honorary prizes were also assigned. The Lifetime Achievement Award was given to Atelier d'Architecture Simone and Lucien Kroll. The jury has chosen them for the influence of their work, which has brought about significant positive changes in Brussels. And the Promising Young Architect Award went to BC Architect and Studies, a talented young office based in Brussels. This edition of the prize was an opportunity to define what makes a public space accessible, to discuss the practice of reuse adapted to the project context, and to integrate the structure on the one hand and craftsmanship on the other as an integral part of the architectural quality of some achievements in Brussels. The second edition of the prize will take place this year. By the way, today is the final deadline for application. Don't hesitate to visit the Brussels Architecture Prize website for updates. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lara. OK, uh, you must be sick and tired of me, so I'm almost done. Um, the last, uh, well, the penultimate uh, um, ha happening today is our roundtable discussion, which will be moderated by Rolf Hughes. Um, and uh, the, the, our keynote speakers will take part, and um, Massimo and I, I have you as well, I think. Yeah. OK, so please have a, a take your places. Uh, in the meantime, let me just. Um, uh, say two or three technical things um, to repeat. Um, well, first of all, I, I wanted to, to thank Philippe de Klerk, uh, uh, the professor of the school who actually uh, cu uh, curated the, the exhibition and took us around. Um, I, I'm 
he's probably not here anymore, and I, I, I'm, I should have done it earlier, but it, he really um, uh, took some time to show us the exhibition. And also, the other thing to remind, um, uh, to remind everyone, so ACE delegates, tomorrow's General Assembly is here, and deans and um, uh, um, uh, EAAE delegates, uh, your place of meeting is um, in the um, uh, what, Rue de Palais Street. Yeah? It's, so it's close to the Garden Nord, Doug, if you want to explain. Exactly. It's number 70, it's indeed close to Garden Nord. Uh, if you take other kind of public transport, it's a 12 minutes walk from um, Botanique, that you can remind. Botanique or Garden du Nord with the train. Okay, thanks. Oh, yeah. yeah. <sighs> I'm, I'm, uh, uh, two, two more. Good afternoon and um, welcome to the final, almost the final session, the penultimate session, uh, which is the panel discussion. I'm very happy, my name is Rolf Hughes, and I'm very happy to invite to the stage uh, Ashraf, uh, Rachel, Massimo, Camilla, and um, Elena and Eduarda. So uh, we've had such a feast of ideas that I thought, why restrict the, um, there were plenty more that of course could be invited, but one <laughs> has to draw a line somewhere. Um, I would also invite the students present to be active and uh, very present because, after all, it is your future that we're discussing. So I'm planning to make some introductory remarks um, based upon the presentation so far, and then I'll invite the panel to respond in any way that they see fit. Um, we'll then open up for questions and answers from the audience both here in Brussels and online if uh, there is somebody to moderate online comments. My remarks are divided over three linked themes and with these I would like to connect what we've heard so far to the final session which is the presentation of the joint statement and um, concluding remarks from the three presidents. So the three themes that I would uh, propose are the following values, vision, and action. Values, vision, and action. And since we learned today that an architect's average attention span is only eight minutes, um, I propose that we spend about eight minutes on each of these topics. <laughs> and then we open up for questions from the audience. So first of all, values. Um, <clears throat> The conference program asks, as Roberto Cavallo cited, what are the skills, methods, and pedagogies needed for a flourishing and ecologically beneficial architectural practice that addresses the challenges of our turbulent 21st century? And to this, we might ask, and what values? Well, the joint statement from the ACE and EAAE does mention values. It states that architecture is a complex discipline that requires a combination of technical skills, creative thinking, and problem-solving abilities. Beyond the acquisition of these skills and competences, architectural education should be a project that develops the attitudes, values, and behaviors necessary to respond to the global challenges of our times while creating conditions for students to engage locally as active citizens in their communities. So far, so good. But how might one set about incorporating an exploration of value into architectural education and training? Not by plugging into a ready-made course on ethics from the neighboring philosophy department, although that might sometimes be a, valuable consideration, a viable consideration, but rather by allowing students to prototype, enact, and embody encounters with values. The presentation of the uh, UMI's fantastic shortlisted projects reminds us that this generation of young architects um, is already strengthening and extending the reach of architecture, and with it the question of what we value, which arguably is the question that underpins 
the assignment of research funding and resources. What is it that we value? Questions of value were also addressed in Massimo's presentation with its theory of cosmopolitan citizenship, architectural education, based on critical thinking, social awareness, self-reflection, imagination and action, and with the observation that schools are places where the discourse and the ethos of a, of a profession are born, that architecture is never a private matter, and so we might speak of architectures, plural, rather than architecture, beyond form. Or perhaps transformed by the digital transformation that's arising from the economy, from the economy in transition that Paul McCormack outlined when he spoke of simplifying the skills landscape, enabling flexible learning, upskilling and relearning, making learning accessible ensuring that everyone has the digital skills they need, optimizing digital delivery and stimulating engagement. Finally, in making a distinction from linear measurement to systemic measurement, Raul Pantaleo reminds us that how we measure what we value needs to be appropriately adapted to the values we wish to espouse and support. So to um, a question for the panel. <laughs> It's a very large one, and you can take it any way you like, but how might we educate students for futures that we currently lack the imagination to foresee? Um, and perhaps related to that is uh, uh, the question, what nascent hybrid forms or entrepreneurial or even revolutionary forms of learning and value exchange might architecture help to create? So this is a, this is a sort of future-oriented question to, to say, uh, how might architecture, the, the skills of the designer, be used to deploy forms of pedagogical exchange or value exchange in ways that uh, currently we are not um, we are not imagining? Any offers? Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, I think these are constant questions. I think we, we, we each generation uh, is in charge to ask these questions. I think it was Albert Camus' um, discourse when he received the, the Nobel Prize in Literature was that each generation is in charge to, in a way, think of the future. Mine, uh, mine has the task to to, to keep it from, from being destroyed. So I, I think education is always a future project. Education is not just about the present, but it is about the future. So I think, uh, um, I, maybe I don't completely agree with you. I think students have a lot of imagination. When, uh, so it's, it's about encouraging the, this imagination, but it, it is also transform it not into an individual project, but, but into, into a societal project. And so I, I think um, no one owns a problem, you know, because of the way comp uh, problems uh, work, they are always systemic, systemically connected to something bigger. Uh, so I think the, we need to allow the, the realities outside to enter our universities and we also need to, to have the courage to really face it. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to quote another, um, another person that we discuss a lot in my school, which is uh, Theodore Adorno, who wrote an essay called uh, Education After Auschwitz. And basically was stating that knowledge alone is not enough to avoid another uh, Auschwitz to, to take place. So there are many Auschwitz today. I think there are wars, there are uh, uh, ecological disasters, and, and we know that knowledge al alone is not enough. We also need to develop empathy and systems thinking, uh, but truly also the courage to, to act. So uh, I think each school is in a position uh, of power to, 
to create the, the learning platforms, not only for the students, but for the educators as well, to, uh, to see itself as, a, as an agent, as a citizen, uh, as an, to use the learning uh, uh, time not just as a rehearsal for future practice, but to also really invent what is this future practice of architecture. Many big words, but uh, <laughs> there is work to be done. Can, can I pass this to you guys? Because I think you'll have something to say about values. Um, yeah, I was thinking when you said power, I also think about it's the responsibility, which is a similar term to power, but it's also the responsibility of the university to listen and to step like from the educators who are in their job for 30 years or something, maybe to just take one step back and just listen to the voice of the student. So it's very simple, as you said. So um, I think it's about empathy, like um, thinking from the other perspective and also yeah, trying to enter into dialogue because I think in dialogue you can really explore new ways of learning so when we started with our initiative, what we really was very helpful was the um, like alleys inside university that keep pushing our project forward and not ears that were just um, yeah, closing down when we were talking. <laughs> Yeah, um, just building upon that, we had a very interesting talk last year um, about student activism and activism in general inside of the university. And I think it's important to um, support initiatives that are coming for students and also to understand there is only so much that a student can do and the rest has to come from people that are working inside of the university. And then we're talking then um, on more sensitive themes such as discrimination and things like that to understand that um, because we talk a lot about like hierarchy and that professor students uh, relationships should not be hierarchical but in the end of the day they are and there's nothing to change that we are in different positions and there's so much we can do and talking about people from different backgrounds, also between students, there are some students that are in a more privileged position and they can act a lot more upon certain topics in comparison to others. So I would say that in general, we need to have more understanding that although we all want to reach the same thing, we have to help each other, but understand that every person has a different uh, role inside of this whole institution and that is okay. I just want to add. <coughs> uh, just want to add a couple of points, uh, which actually amalgamate some of these ideas. One is about the hidden curriculum. Uh, we always talk about the curriculum, okay, the explicit curriculum, uh, which is basically the syllabus, the contents of the course, and all of this. The hidden curriculum, which is a concept that was uh, introduced by Henry Giroux and used in architecture by Tom Dutton, who passed away a few years ago, trying to look at the um, routine relationships that stem tacitly from the social relations of the studio, of the learning setting. So the idea of the hidden curriculum, we really need to uh, interrogate it a bit more and look at it in terms of the dynamics of the relationships between professors and students, um, uh, the level of engagement and all of this. This is one. Two, um, just want to uh, remind the audience, I don't know if they are following uh, the conferences of the European Association of Architectural Education. There was a conference in 2003, and I keep referring to John Habrocken in my work. He gave a talk um, and about teaching, teaching architecture with a focus on the everyday built environment. So because you cannot ask a designer to design buildings without knowing how the uh, everyday environment works, which is exactly as the example I was trying to give in the morning, uh, as if you are teaching medical doctors the art of healing 
without knowing how the human body functions, how the human body works. So it's really very critical to start to go down to reality, and as you emphasize, and start to look at the everyday built environment, how we understand it, how we interrogate it, how we analyze it. And so. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on to the second theme, because time is running against us. And um, here I'll be citing Camilla, so <laughs> advance warning. Vision. We've heard a lot over the last seven years, a lot of very nice words and one or two slogans. And these are, of course, important because they help us to identify our values and to form a community. But where is the vision? And should we even expect a vision? Um, I'm struck by a remark in Camilla's presentation, which was the answer is seldom a new building. And also the manifesto that was presented by the soft group from Munich, which uh, had uh, in response to an architecture curricula based on normative, Eurocentric, and discriminatory structures, they offered nine manifesto principles. Um, from Raoul Pantaleo, we heard the following vision, that we should overcome the idea of specialization in favor of a humanistic vision, uh, introduce the study of philosophy as a fundamental subject, and facilitate participatory processes in collective intelligence. Um, knowledge and intelligence has come up several times during the day, less so emotion, uh, or maybe that's part of intelligence, emotional intelligence, and with emotion the idea of the, the senses and the body and so on. But um, so the risk, of course, of a vision is that it becomes yet another aspect of a colonizing force. Should we expect to have a common vision of it, such as a, disparate group. Um, what might a polyvocal, multiple, inclusive vision be that nonetheless unites educational managers and practitioners behind a common set of goals? What might be the key aims of such initiative? Shall I repeat the question? <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like a quiz master here, you know, there's a, there's a nice washing machine going at stake for the correct answer. <laughs> what, what, is a, what might a polyvocal, multiple, or inclusive vision be that nonetheless unites ourselves, managers and practitioners, behind a common set of goals? What might be the key aims of such an initiative? Hello. Yeah, I, I feel like quoting a, a, um, an old professor of mine who's actually was quoting a, a German a counselor or, or who said that those who have a vision should consult a doctor. Uh, uh, because visions can also be misleading if they are not grounded in, in the everyday, in, in, the, in real life conditions. Uh, um, and this leads me to, to quote another person, which is uh, Kevin Lynch, who has written this beautiful definition of uh, the everyday utopia, uh, that, that utopia is not the unattainable or the impossible, but is really the remaking of, of the everyday, or the, is, is about using the underused, it's about giving a voice to the one who are silenced. So for me, uh, this is my interpretation of, of vision, that is always, uh, it's always about empowering someone that that is not empowered. And of course, this leads to the question of who is in charge of empowering someone, you know? Yeah. It's probably removing the, the unfreedoms or the limitations, both in our educational system and, um, and in, uh, in, in our professional system. Might we connect that to the idea of innovation as well, which is this term that's used um, often. And Rachel, you raised it in relationship to EIT and um, culture and creativity um, with the idea that innovation itself must be in, or should be innovated um, of uh, initiatives such as the new renaissance or the new European Bauhaus. So this question about how might we reclaim innovation, um, how might we, re we reclaim the concept from its association of sort of profit making and turn it into perhaps a notion of Managed change is that is that also a way of uh, negotiating this sort of future 
uh, momentum that, Im that is implied by a sort of common vision statement? And if so, would you like to say a few words about the EIT in that respect? Yes, and I'll make sure that I hand it over to you guys as well. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of vision. Uh, I think that vision is difficult, um, but I think it's a starting point uh, for something that's shared. And the example that I would give is Europe. Um, that it doesn't mean that we have to agree on everything, but a vision is a kind of um, conceptual coherence that we seek and strive towards. And when we start working towards it, um, you know, we lose the diplomacy of staying together and things fall apart. So for me, the vision is the beginning of a diplomacy. It is not the uh, seeking of a single solution. And so that, by, in that nature, it is inherently polyvocal and difficult and negotiated and misunderstood and all the other things. But when we have something that is shared that is valuable, like peace, um, it's worth fighting for and having the difficult conversations over. And then that is the heart of your innovation, your action, um, you know, kind of rethinking the values and the trajectories that you may, you know, propose. Um, yeah, but I think a vision is hard. Okay, I'll move on to the, the last. I realise we're racing through this, but I want to open it up to the audience as soon as possible. So... The last uh, topic I identified was action. And again, I'm going to cite Camilla, <laughs> which is um, the observation that the answer is seldom a new building. Um, and let's say goodbye to nice site, nice program, unlimited resources assignments, which I thought was a very nicely put as a call to action. Um, so I guess the question is, what is an architectural education of finite resources. To put it another way, um, can we think of an architecture of action as opposed to an architecture of artifacts? <laughs> Better? That was a nice question. <laughs> a very good question. Also the others. Um, yes, we, are, we must get rid of the idea that architecture has, is an artifact that we are designing, of course. And I think one of the tricks is to look at uh, architecture as networks, right? And also understand that we are borrowing materials and resources and then we will pass them on, right? As a, and we must uh, help our students to, to understand that in a way. So where does it come from? Where is it going after you have used it? it? Maybe it's not that difficult in a way, but, but ways of, of trying to establish that understanding is important, I would say. Is that an answer? That's a very good answer. Yeah. And, and maybe that logic of uh, control, ownership, and mastery is also very culturally specific, and we can look at other paradigms for interacting with the environment that is, uh, you know, that could actually change the underlying assumptions of our own. Yeah, I would say that I'm here I'm drawing on the thinking of uh, Albina Janeva and uh, Bruno Latour, uh, but the understanding that architecture is a dynamic phenomenon, mm. right? Mm. And that the materials are also dynamic and so on. So, so we are borrowing in it while it is dynamic, changing all the time. I think that line of thinking uh, allow us to, to, to stop designing objects, right? Right. Yeah. Anyone else want to come in on this before we open up? And, yeah, and the name is New European Bauhaus, so I think the Bauhaus was also kind of had an innovative idea and also produced artifacts, and now we have to come to shift away from that to build artifacts while having an innovative idea. So we just have to have this architecture of action to really um, transform it to something that is caring for the environment and the people and, yeah, the environment. <laughs> Maybe this is the point where I confess I'm not an architect either, and <laughs> so I'm always pushing for the performing arts and uh, storytelling and theatre and so on. 
in these discussions, bringing the body into the discussion as well. Uh, and then we could talk about which types of bodies with uh, Rachel's work and amongst others. Um, but now perhaps it's a good moment to open up to questions from the audience here. And um, if there are any f online, I'm not sure, but uh, if there are, please let me know. But meanwhile, here in the room, are there any questions for the panel? Yes, please. Thank you. First of all, thank you to the organizers for this very interesting and exciting <laughs> conference, which gives many insights. But I think that we all know that we are in a complex world, but do we need to make it complexer? That's my first question. And uh, <laughs> in this relation, uh, I didn't like the last comments about the artifacts, uh, not because we should not focus on, I mean, the question is, what is the specificity of our profession as architects? What can we contribute in the whole discussion about environment and everything? And certainly one of the uh, undisputable specificities that we have is to be able to transform all kinds of needs under all kinds of conditions into some built object. So, sorry. <laughs> I mean, uh, the two questions and the other is all, uh, a third question in relation to this big effort of digitalization. Have we ever made the real calculation of what that will mean in CO2? Thank you. Anyone from the panel wishing to? Yes, please. I just want to say a quick word about um, digital and CO2, which is I'm really keen on the biodigital, where we use different forms of energy in order to uh, maintain the knowledge that we have from digital solutions. But I couldn't agree with you more. It's no point putting your servers on coal plants. Um, we have to rethink the power. I just want to uh, refer to your first point, which is really very important. I think it's not either or. We, we cannot say it's either an end product or a process. It's both, and it will continue to be both. Architecture has been a process throughout the history and has been a product throughout the history. We need to treat it as such. But we need to externalize the process so that the public understand what we do, so that people place higher value on what we do. So. Sorry, but there is not more higher value than what we do. There is no other activity that has to be present everywhere. Oxygen will breathe in. But exact breathing is the most important activity in the world. Imagine that there is an activity that everybody has to use it. Everybody has to live on it. Everybody cannot do any kind of human activity if you don't have it. And that's the product we do. And we are here, the people who teach how to do it and the people who know how to make it. And we are thinking that we are poor architects. And we are sad, and we are not understood. My goodness, we have to be proud. I am gay. I am very proud of being gay. I am an architect. I am very proud of being an architect. And I am not seeing this mood. Now we have new Bauhaus. And they put the ball in our place. And we are more or less looking what we are going to get from there instead of being leader in it. But if we are the natural leaders for the new Bauhaus, Bauhaus was always leader by an architect. Uh, sorry, I had a bad day. <laughs> I, I think that I think the the day, from my reading, has been a celebration of the relevance of architecture and the importance of architectural education. 
So I, I wouldn't like to you know, Im imply or the suggestion to be arising from this discussion that that is in, in any way diminished. I think we're actually here not only to strengthen the contribution of architecture, but also to try to anticipate other expressions, other, uh, it, other uh, applications of architectural thinking that might be not only within architecture, but also beyond architecture. So I, I would phrase it in terms of strengthening and extending rather than either or. And that's, of course, to acknowledge the importance of the artifact, not to, to diminish that at all. But thank you. Um. I would, as always, I would like to point to, to research because it's, it's an activity that I think is influencing increasingly also the professional practice of architects looking for, for novelties no, to face the challenges. And I would like to ask Camilla, no, you, you mentioned that in your, in your great program, research comes in through the social sciences. Isn't also design research? Let us, let's see if it works. Um, there's a, we can, one discussion is about the, how we define research, right? At the Royal Danish Academy, we, we are working with a foundation of three kinds of knowledge, experience from practice, artistic development work, and scientific research. And we are trying to combine and uh, work with all of these three all the time. So when working together with the, with the business school, the university, they're very, they, of course, the foundation for their teaching and education is scientific uh, knowledge. So when working together with us, that is what they bring in, right? So, of course, we are very strong on that lake, so to say, or knowledge pillar. But we, of course, artistic development world is, work is also very important and also experience from practice. So my job is to make sure that we are having all of these three present in, in the teaching and that we help students work with it and address it and, and, and uh, yeah. Is that an answer? Yeah. yeah. I sometimes, I'm wondering you now if we shouldn't claim much more that we are doing research actually, you know? Because research is not only natural sciences, but also other methods, no? Yeah, I agree. And I think that we also contribute with scientific knowledge in that collaboration. Researching, for instance, uh, design process and many other things. So at the Royal Academy, different institutes tend to focus a little bit on different kinds of research. So I completely agree with you. A little comment to the nice discussion about the network or the, 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 um, the object. My intention is really not to define architecture, but I'm interested in the way we are teaching, right? So it's more a mode of thinking, a mode of teaching that, that I can see that in a way facilitate that, that the student care for certain things or that they, are, that they notice certain things. Right? So it's, it's more ways of teaching than an attempt to define architecture. Yeah. Yes, you get it back. Um, we're nearly out of time, but uh, I would like to open up the possibility for a student uh, to take perhaps the last question, if there is one. Otherwise, any offers? Yes, please. Thank you, um, and thank you to the um, speakers uh, for an incred incredible day, very inspiring. I mean, it seemed, um, I'm sitting here and by the end of the day, I feel like um, it's been a, a kind of declaration uh, of a crisis, you know, an extended moment within which we are experiencing some sort of crisis. And of course, the history of architecture is marked by uh, crises which are uh, self-declared. And within that declaration, there's a kind of confidence that one can meet those challenges, which in itself is quite heroic. Um, so today has felt quite heroic. Um, so that's a comment. The question really is uh, to do with the scale and the complexity of the challenge, um, which seems quite bewildering 
uh, very difficult to quantify. Um, but it's also about the extent to which those challenges are driven by market forces. So there's um, a fine balance here, which I am um, concerned that we won't address and we won't understand uh, because of the incredible pressures we are under to meet the challenges. Um, so that's something to be t disentangled, I guess. But one starting point for me, and here's the question, um, and a number of panelists mentioned it, and I think underlined most by, uh, I think through the incredible talk that the students gave um, from SOFT, uh, was the pedagogic tactic of unlearning. Um, uh, the way in which I guess academics will feel this pressure that we've described is on the ground through trying to deliver curricula. Uh, and if we're gonna meet the challenges, that curricula will become extremely crowded extremely congested. So when one's thinking about unlearning, um, I guess the question is, what do you think is most at risk of being forgotten, of being left out uh, to, the, to the point at which it does us a disservice? So the question is about risk. What are we gonna lose that we don't really want to? Thank you very much. You. That's, that's a very nice question to end with, I think. So perhaps we go straight down the, <laughs> the panel and uh, have a response. Who would like to start? Okay, thank you. okay, very short. I think it's very important that we are not doing the same, all of us, that we are not answering the, or adapting or answering the challenge in the same way. Yeah. <laughs> I think I will pass it. Okay. <laughs> I, th I think for me, I would always embrace change and the challenge and um, losing, not so much, I, I wouldn't think I was losing something. I think I would be uh, challenging myself to try and think differently. So maybe it would be my sense of expertise is the thing that I might lose, but I would gain something else somewhere. So I, I, I don't feel that there's just a loss. Um, I think that change always makes us feel like this. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that differentiates um, education from wisdom, because that's a big, big difference. Because with education, you keep adding every day. With wisdom, you keep taking out things, so it's like pushing out things. So uh, that's one thing. And I think the idea of unlearning is not necessarily related to the content could be related to the process, the way we engage, the way we interact, the way we perceive society, the way we you know, work with the students. So I don't think we're gonna say, for example, at some point, no, we don't want history of architecture, or we don't want theories, or we don't want building construction the way it was. We're not gonna say that, but we're gonna take uh, or get rid of some of the habits that don't work today. I very much agree with Camilla. I think it's really important that we remain a diverse group of people at school and really that university or schools really represent the diversity, the societal diversity that it seeks to serve. So uh, there has to be a real dialogue between educators and their community. Uh, I think we uh, needs may Challenges may be different uh, with different generations, but the, the, the needs are still there. We still need to feel protected and secure. We still need to feel that we are really part of a society and not as excluded. But then the ways to do it, uh, I, 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 what I have learned through my experience is that each design studio exposes students to different uh, challenges. So uh, I think that's the beauty of a school of architecture, that there are really many, many different voices. So that's what we shouldn't learn, the, the many voices that are part of our education. Um, yeah. um, when we're talking about unlearning, I wouldn't say that we, are, we want from now on not to learn about some, some things at all. I just feel like it would be important that 
things in architecture theory, history classes, and in general, are always with the context together. And I feel like nowadays we just accept um, mostly from modernism and things that we are learning in architecture school without any side note. We just become the knowledge, we learn the references, but there is no context about the references we are learning. So we finish four years of architecture school on bachelor, and okay, we know architecture history, we know architecture theory, but we don't understand why things were done 100 years ago the way they were. So I wouldn't say that we have to forget uh, the things we learned, but we just have to understand why they were done the way they were and why they don't work today anymore. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, last uh, bit of business today. Um, uh, I would like to invite now our two presidents, Oya and Ruth, uh, to come to the stage for the. Oops. For the final comments and. Um, uh, no, no, you can. It depends how long you want to <laughs> speak are there. Um, I don't know if we'll put the statement up or just... Um... Oh, and Philip, sorry. Okay, first about the statement. So it's... Uh, and the conference all together. Um, the two presidents. Well, I think for the joint statement, um, that we leave to the end, huh? and maybe Ruth can say something. It has been a very dense day, um, thinking about what stays with us, what stay with me as individual. As I said at the beginning, we learn a lot. There are different ways of uh, learning things. We know about the importance of different um, opinions and of having positions. Um, for me, uh, the question of value is a very um, sensitive question. When we talk about values, um, usually we are very individual, actually. And we sometimes think that we are talking for the community. I think it's a very, very important uh, question which cannot be answered very easily. I'll come back to the question of vision. No matter how visions are usually uh, quite labels or too generally um, formulated, they are driving forces. We shouldn't underestimate them and give value to visions to discuss about what can be done because we are all in action. We live. As long as we live, we act. And the question is how we act. The very last question about uh, the um, declaration of crisis, I think we are at a moment of crisis. We should acknowledge this, but that's no reason uh, to say that we don't have any optimism and that we lose the serenity, which would block us to act in any way. So I really hope whatever we said, however it has been said, that we heard things that we take along, we reflect and we connect, we reconnect and act alone, but more likely together. And that's where we are getting to our joint action. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, thank you, Oya. For
for um, giving your reflections um, on the topic. And you just mentioned that we are uh, going to be jointly um, active. And one action that we have. Yeah. Uh, and well, thank you, Oya. <laughs> <laughs> for your thoughts. And um, you mentioned the, the point of um, action. Which action are we going to take next? And um, for this reason, uh, in beforehand, as we knew what is going to be not discussed in depth, but uh, we had an insight from all the speakers. And out of that, uh, we developed together a uh, joint statement, uh, which really will be, let's say, the framework under which we will be uh, working uh, in the next step and um, the I don't know if maybe we can put the uh, joint statement um, up or Oh, okay, no, we don't. Okay, it's it's, it, it's a it's a mystery. <laughs> no, you will find it on our homepage. Um, but let's say what are what are the tackling points um, in our um, uh, statement that uh, the EAAE and the ACE um, are signing together? It's really about advancing um, the highest standards in architectural education. I think um, on this we can really agree together, and also a point that has been discussed today. It's about the architecture curriculum from a linear approach to a systematic thinking. So uh, we also try to um, pick up the ideas that this openness um, also in the curricula is needed. And... Um, also really uh, to ensure a new systematic um, condition of uh, teaching throughout training courses which favor the teamwork, for example, and the, um, the simult uh, collective uh, intelligence. These were elements that we have been discussing today. Um, we want to ensure the upskilling of um, the professionals, uh, driving innovation in the sector um, through research. This was also one important topic in our discussion today. And also um, developing the awareness and the appreciation of high quality architecture. And um, I think this uh, could be a, or is going to be our framework to um, work together. And if I reflect our discussion that we had, let's say in the view of climate change and scarcity of resources and the energy crisis uh, we have, we really have to act now. And it's not only about the architecture that we create, it's also about the uh, teaching, um, how we uh, teach the future um, professionals. And um, it has has been very, very clear today that there are demands, there is a need to rethink our activities, and um, I would underline that it is in the nature of the task and the cor it corresponds to the nature of the architect's profession um, to understand weight and the parameters as design forces, even to seek them um, outright. And at the same time, um, I believe that a new contemporary design, a language will emerge from the examination of what is existing. And uh, this, if we are lucky, can create the Baukultur of tomorrow. So every little thing that happens today will make the change uh, in the future. And for that, we have to be acknowledged, we have to have knowledge, we have to have skills, we have to have competences, as at the end, we are also reliable. It is the responsibility of all of us for our future and for our next generation. And therefore, I find, found the discussion today uh, really interesting. And um, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you for all the contribution. And I have to say thank you to Bravko. You are a natural. You really managed the whole day perfectly today. Um, thank you for that. Um, thank you also to the whole team um, supporting us um, from the ACE office, also from the EAAE. And especially thanks to the great technicians back there uh, in behind. A great applause for them who managed the web streaming today and also um, uh, kept all the technical uh, equipment up. And I also want, and you are now here with us, um, dear president, thank you um, for your support. <laughs> now the important thing is coming. <laughs> 
<laughs> Dear Philip, thank you that you are today now also with us because you facilitated the connection also to the university, um, supported us, and I'm sure you will give a few uh, insights to what is coming after um, this great conference. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I, uh, I will speak in French. Uh, it's for a few minutes only, but uh, I think it was apparently uh, very difficult to give now the headphones. Uh, so uh, we have a direct conversation with Miss Marie. Marie. Thank you, Marie. Madame la Présidente, Mesdames, Messieurs, la journée qui s'achève aura été riche en échanges témoignages, réflexions autour de l'enseignement de l'architecture en Europe et de la recherche qui lui est associée. Mrs. President, ladies and gentlemen, today was very rich in exchanges, testimonies and reflections about teaching architecture in Europe and about related research. La pratique de l'architecture peut parfois différer considérablement d'un pays à un autre. Il est donc inévitable que euh, cela varie également au niveau des pays dans l'enseignement, car c'est le reflet de ces disparités. L'architecture est parfois très différente d'un pays à un autre. C'est bien sûr que l'enseignement est aussi très différent d'un pays à un autre. C'est seulement la réflexion de ces différences. Néanmoins, la finalité de l'acte de l'architecture est la même partout. Créer des lieux où des êtres humains vont vivre, travailler, se détendre, se cultiver, échanger, s'amuser, se reposer. However, the end game of architecture is the same everywhere, to create places where human beings will live, work, relax, have access to culture, exchange and have fun. L'ensemble des activités humaines prend place dans des lieux construits spécifiquement pour celles-ci et qui sont donc le reflet de leur époque, de la culture et de la société de ceux qui les bâtissent. All human activities happen in very specific places that were built for it and that are, they are the reflection of their time, of their culture and the society of those who built it. Il est bien évidemment impossible de réduire l'architecture à une simple somme de connaissances. L'art de bâtir est un art complexe qui mêle à la fois des aspects techniques, fonctionnels et esthétiques. Of course, it is impossible to limit the architecture to a simple addition of knowledge. The art of building is a complex one, mixing technical, functional or aesthetical aspects. Mais la composante humaine, humaine, sociologique ou culturelle est primordiale et c'est l'ensemble de ces démarches qui vont finalement aboutir à un lieu de vie. But the human aspect and also the social, cultural aspect are very important and all these different approaches will eventually create a place of life. La valeur culturelle de l'architecture est indéniable. Mais ce n'est que depuis la signature des actes de Davos en 2018 que cette notion a été reconnue par l'Europe comme étant fondamentale. The, va the cultural value of architecture is very important, but it is only since the signature of the act of Davos in 2018 that this notion was recognized by the European Union as being crucial. Les choses auraient pu en rester sur cette reconnaissance politique, mais la marche du monde en a décidé autrement. En effet, depuis quelques années, la planète se trouve prise dans un espèce d'emballement climatique, sanitaire et énergétique dans le, auquel nous devons faire face. Things could have been limited to this political, political recognition. However, the world decided otherwise. The planet has reached a critical point in terms of climate or health or energy aspect we have to face now. Ne nous étendons pas sur les causes et contentons-nous d'un constat, le monde change et il va falloir s'adapter. Cette adaptation sera progressive, mais à peu près tous les domaines de la vie humaine seront impactés et pour beaucoup d'entre eux, cela concernera le travail des architectes. 
We won't insist on the causes. We just know one thing. The world is changing and we have to adapt. We will adapt progressively, but almost all the human aspects of the aspect of human life will be impacted, and for a lot of them, it will concern the work of the architects. Aujourd'hui, il nous est déjà demandé d'adapter nos missions sur des plans techniques ou énergétiques. Nous sommes également sollicités pour répondre à d'autres défis plus sociétaux, à repenser les modes d'habitat ou de production, à les vers davantage de durabilité ou de résilience. Today, we already have to adapt our missions on a more technical or energy aspect. We have to answer all the uh, challenges that are more focused on social aspects. We have to rethink the way of living or we produce. We have to be more sustainable and resilient. New Bo, so Green Deal, so tonton de projets européens visant à matérialiser des idées créatives autour de la culture, des technologies, et dont la finalité d'aller vers la neutralité climatique à l'horizon 2050. New Bauhaus or Green Deal are projects that, that are aiming to implement creative ideas around culture, technology, whose end game is to go toward a climate neutrality in, within 2050. Dans ce cadre, il sera indispensable aux architectes d'acquérir ou de maintenir un haut niveau de compétence. Notre pratique professionnelle devra s'exercer de manière dynamique et nous devrons être capables d'intégrer ces nouvelles données, voire même d'en proposer de nouvelles. In this context, the architect will have to acquire new um, or to maintain a high level of skills. Our way of working, will, we will have to be more dynamic and we will have to be able to integrate this new data or even to propose new ones. Quant à l'enseignement de l'architecture, au travers des nombreux exemples évoqués tout au long de cette journée, il devra nécessairement évoluer. La transition énergétique, le basculement vers de nouveaux matériaux ou de nouveaux modes de conception ou de construction nécessiteront à la fois de nouvelles approches et des moyens accrus. About teaching architecture, with all the different testimonies and examples that were given today, we will have to evolve to adapt a new a transition in terms of energy to have a shift toward ma new materials or new way of designing or building that will be necessary and also to adopt new approaches to, to answer or increase needs. L'ordre lui-même sera certainement appelé à repenser ses actions puisque parmi ses missions figure le contrôle du stage. Pour rappel, en Belgique, la formation des architectes se fait en deux temps. D'abord, une formation universitaire de 5 ans, ensuite un stage pratique au sein d'une agence d'architecture pour une durée minimale de 2 ans. The order itself will probably have to rethink its actions. Among its mission is monitoring the trainees. As a reminder, in Belgium, the training of the architect is in two times. First, a, a training in the university of 5 years, then a practical training within a studio of architecture for at least two years. Depuis l'an dernier, une expérience pilote a été mise sur pied avec la collaboration de l'Ordre, de quatre facultés d'architecture et du monde associatif, ce qui a débouché sur un masterclass interuniversitaire à destination des stagiaires, totalement orienté vers la pratique professionnelle. Since last year, a pilot experience was implemented with the collaboration of the order and of four universities of architecture and associations. It led to the creation of a masterclass with universities totally focused on a professional practice for the trainees. Cette démarche, reconduite cette année encore, rentre dans le cadre de la mission que le législateur a confiée à l'ordre, c'est-à-dire s'assurer de la qualité des prestations et services offerts par l'architecte afin de préserver l'intérêt général et la protection du consommateur. This approach, repeated this year, also fits within the mission of the order, which is to guarantee the quality of services proposed by the architect and to protect the common good and the consumer. Ce qui me permet de conclure que l'évolution du métier d'architecte reposera sur les forces combinées de tous les acteurs, le monde de l'enseignement, les professionnels de terrain et les chambres et ordres professionnels, sans compter le monde politique dont on aura finalement peu parlé, 
mais qui devra soutenir notre action. To conclude, the profession rests on combined forces of all the actors, the teachers, the professionals on the field, the chambers, orders and professionals, and also the political world, which finally we mentioned very little today, but that will have to support us. Et ceci afin de pouvoir atteindre les objectifs ambitieux que l'Europe nous impose. The objective is to support the ambitious objectives established by the EU. Pour terminer, je voudrais remercier la présidente du Conseil d'architecte d'Europe, Madame Sajman, Ruth. Thank you very much. Ainsi que la faculté d'architecture de l'ULB, en la personne de sa doyenne, Madame Ravidonjic. Merci, Marcel. Pour l'organisation de cette journée ô combien enrichissante. To conclude, I would like to thank the President of the Council of the Architects of Europe, Mrs. Schagerman, and also the Dean of the, Arch the Architecture University of ULB, Ms. Rabonik, for, the organiz for organizing, the organizing this day, which was very fruitful. Et pour terminer, je vous rappelle que vous êtes attendu à 18h30 au cocktail que nous organisons à la Villa en Pain, toute proche. Des bus vous attendent devant. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, let, take, take your uh, staff a uh, few minutes if you need to go to the toilet and the buses are outside. Okay, thank you. Uh, and also thanks to our online audience who has been very patient with us, I hope.